Good morning, everyone. This is the clerk with a courtesy announcement that this meeting is now being streamed live on the internet. Good morning, Annie. Good morning. Have a great meeting. Thanks. Supervisor Chavez, if you were speaking to us, we were unable to hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure everything is working okay. Appreciate you. Thanks, Rhonda. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Cody. Good morning, Greta. Good morning, Rhonda. Good morning, Rhonda. This is uh, Otto. We do a quick mic check. I'm sorry about that. It would help to mic check if um, I turn my mic on. So, hello, Supervisor Lee, and <laughs> good morning, President Wasserman. Good morning, Rhonda. Both of you are coming in loud and clear. Thank you. Who's staffing us today? Um, Dave Leon. Wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. Vice President Ellenberg, I'm going to call on you for the pledge this morning. Thank you for the notice. You betcha. I know sometimes soups want to do, you know, vocal cord exercises and things prior. I'm kidding you. Good to <laughs> One day you're going to get a supervisor that can sing and they're just going to belt out the <laughs> Star Spangled Banner or something. Rhonda, how do you know we don't already have a supervisor that can sing? All right. Well, see, now I've set up some expectations there. I cannot <laughs> sing, so I make the assumption that no one else can either. So. That's awesome. Recording in progress. Good morning, Jeff. Hello, Rhonda. Can you hear me? I sure can. Have a great meeting. And good morning, Supervisor Simidian. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. All right. Looks like we have a full team. Roll call, please. Good morning, Supervisor Lee. Good morning, Lee Present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. 
Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank you very much. Thank Next you. Let's move on to item two, our Pledge of Allegiance. And Vice President Ellenberg is going to lead us in our pledge today. And I ask everyone who can stand to please do so. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. We're now going to turn on to item number three brought to us today. Need to hush those dogs by Supervisor Lee for our invocation. Supervisor Lee. Good morning. Thank you, uh, President Wasserman. Um, today, I'm uh, honored to invite Gabriel Antolovich, who is the board president and executive director of the Billy DeFrank LGBTQ plus community center, which provides community leadership, advocacy, services, and support to Silicon Valley's LGBTQ plus people and their allies. The DeFrank Center has been a pillar of the LGBTQ plus community in Santa Clara County since its opening in 1981, just 12 years after the Stonewall riots in New York City, which helped to start the modern gay right movement within America. And we'll be celebrating the 40th anniversary later this month. And with that, I would like to introduce Gabriel Antolovich to deliver today's invocation in honor of the National LGBTQ Plus History Month. Thank you so much for inviting me. You know, history happens in many different ways. There's personal history. You know, when I was six years old in 1956, if anyone's old enough to remember, I told my mother, I am not a girl and I'm not a boy. And I did not make history, by the way. I was just very uh, disturbing to the family. Um, but I want to say that the young generation that has brought about all the pronouns that we now use, they are the ones that made history and have made my life better because now I know I am a genderqueer, non-binary, lesbianic, and I am so happy that history has been made by the younger generation. And then there's Billy DeFrank. I want to say I am so honored to be the board president of our local community center for the LGBTQ plus community and our allies. What happened is when Stonewall exploded in 1969, all over the country, different LGBT groups popped up, including in Santa Clara County. And William Price, who is an African, was an African American uh, gay man, he was a drag queen known as Billy DeFrank. And he was unusual. He loved everybody. Nobody loved everybody in the 70s. We were all divided and hated each other, um, including through all the movements, but not him. And he was known as Mr. Love, who also did his drag shows and helped all the different LGBT peer groups in the 1970s by doing uh, fundraising for his drag show. So he died of a heart attack in 1980. And the Billy DeFrank Center opened up because all of those groups wanted to meet under one roof. And they decided to call it the Billy DeFrank um, Lesbian and Gay Center, now known as the LGBT Plus Center. So what happened is the AIDS crisis happened. And so his legacy got buried under the AIDS crisis until, you know, which went into the 1990s. So new generations and a lot of the people who died, you know, um, he got lost in history. So what we have done, <laughs> and I have to say, thank you to Vice President Susan Ellenberg for giving us funding to do a mural on our wall that uh, faces the parking lot. And then um, <laughs> council member Deb Davis matched your funding. So I thought, oh, we can have a little mural like a typical nonprofit. You create a mural within the funding, you know, the budget. But you know, when 
it took me a year to find a queer African American muralist, and he was such a is such a magnificent artist. I went, that's it. We're going big, and uh, the the mural is ginormous. I really want people to come and see it. It is beyond the funding that we had. So now we have to say, Vice President Susan gave us seed money for this mural. And thank you so much for being part of that inspiration. Because when <laughs> you look at it, even the people who walk by stop and watch every detail that this um, Serge Gay Jr. artist did. He fell in love with the project, just like I fell in love with Billy DeFrank when I found out about him, and that we wanted to fill our center with his love, his ability to be inclusive, and his generosity. And so his spirit, lives in our center and emulates out. And the artists even captured not only William Price's spirit, but also Billy DeFrank's spirit is sneaking through his wig. And it has become a huge inspiration for so many of us in this day and age when there is such a backlash toward transgender folks, toward um, women's rights. Uh, there is a backlash all over the country and all over the world. But we want to be like Billy DeFrank, despite the world and be that safe place for everyone. And I have to say, we, uh, we had our first refugee, our first queer refugee from the Ukraine show up at the Billy the Frank Center. And we were so excited that he was actually blown away, <laughs> that we were so excited to welcome him in. And um, he has really enjoyed not just the resources we gave him so that he would be able to stay in America, but also have a place where his bisexuality is accepted and embraced. And so, you know, Billy DeFrank was such an icon in the 1970s, and we want him to be an icon forever now. And we joined with the NAACP to elevate a lost icon who is African American, a gay man, a man who loved everybody. And that's who we want to be. So thank you for the opportunity to talk about him and about our center. Thank you, Gabrielle, I appreciate that. And I think what we'll do is I'm just gonna go straight to Vice President Ellenberg on item D as in David. Sorry to catch you off guard, Vice President, but I hope that's okay. Not a problem, let me just open up that. Thank you. Older. Got it. Okay, then uh, what I am delighted to do right now is to present a commendation uh, in honor of the Billy DeFrank uh, Center's 40th anniversary. So let me first start by offering my heartfelt congratulations to the community center itself and the community members served by the community, uh, served by the center on this recognition of your 40th anniversary. And Gabrielle, thank you for uh, your lovely words this morning. Beginning in 1981, the Billy DeFrank Center has served the LGBTQ plus community and the evolving needs of each new generation. They continued the thread of their work, recalibrating with Zoom and other remote connections during the pandemic and are now back in person with the option of hybrid meetings, programs, and activities. During the 1980s, the AIDS crisis devastated the LGBTQ plus community. In the flurry of families rejecting them, lesbians were taking care of and supporting gay and bisexual men, as well as transgender individuals who were getting sick from AIDS. Community members were angry and joined ACT UP. 
They were depressed from going to too many funerals and they were fed up with the stigma and misinformation about HIV transmission. The LGBTQ plus community supported dozens of new organizations providing services for those living with HIV and AIDS and the Billy DeFrank Center collaborated with many of them to keep the community informed on a host of matters. Throughout the 1990s and 2000s and continuing today, the Billy DeFrank Center has participated in HIV outreach and education, provides HIV testing for, um, via Aki's HOPE program, and participates in the Santa Clara County HIV Commission. In 1993, the Billy DeFrank Center created an addiction outreach program with United Way, whose funding generated many workshops serving a variety of members. The center today, refers community members to the Community Health Partnership for Substance Use Issues, LGBTQ Welcoming Medical Care, Health Coverage, and Resources. The center also collaborates with the Recovery Cafe, Many Paths, One Destination Annual Recovery uh, Event, and has a tobacco use cessation contract with Breathe California. These examples show how the Billy DeFrank Center, decade after decade, has remained relevant to the LGBTQ plus community and continues to provide whatever resources are needed in every generation to keep this community safe, healthy, connected, and thriving. I'm, of course, very proud that the center is located in District 4 and serves as a beacon for the entire Santa Clara County um, Gabrielle, since we already had the opportunity to hear your beautiful words this morning, I'll just conclude by saying that we will get this commendation to you. And as always, we are grateful for your leadership and partnership. Thanks again, Gabrielle, and thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Before I move back to our regular order, Supervisor Lee, your hand was raised. Yes, I just want to uh, uh, show that clearly uh, we're, first of all, thank you, um, Supervisor Ellenberg, for bringing this item forward. I mean, clearly did not coordinate the invocation. So thank you, uh, President Wasserman, for catching that, uh, moving it together. Uh, and as we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Frank Center and the positive impact they have had on our community here in Santa Clara County, I'm also reminded all the more of how important advocacy is within our community when I look at the current climate across the United States. We are undergoing a new wave of discrimination and persecution against our non-binary and transgender community, and especially school children with many targeted measures to restrict their ability to fully participate in their everyday life, from restricting access to public facilities, education, sports, and healthcare, just to name a few. State laws are passed to prohibit teaching of these important issues to our children, equating this to pornography. This demonstrates the ignorance of these so-called leaders on the LGBTQ plus history and issues in perpetuating the myths that persecute our LGBTQ plus kids. This ignorance is completely unacceptable, shameful, and history will not judge these bigoted and hurtful efforts kindly. On the other hand, right here in Santa Clara County, we have been very lucky that the DeFrank Center has been around for the past four decades demanding and making sure that these injustices are not happening here and are not tolerated in our county. For these reasons, we're very happy to celebrate the 40th anniversary and many decades to come as the importance of the work to help educate continues. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee and Gabrielle. Thank you for your words and always nice seeing you. Likewise, thank you. Thank you, take care. Uh, item four that I skipped over was announcements and adjournments in memoriam, but we don't have any today. So that item was actually taken care of. We now go back to item 5A, which is to present a commendation, excuse me, to present a proclamation declaring the month of October 2022 as Substance Abuse Prevention Month. And towards that end, I'm looking for Sherry to appear. And there she is. Hi, hi Sherry. Good morning. Nice hi, to see you. I'm welcoming Sherry Terrar, our Director for Behavioral Health Services Departments. Whereas millions of Americans have substance use disorders, which includes underage drinking, alcohol dependency, non-medical use of prescription drugs, abuse of over-the-counter medications, and illicit drug use. Substance use and mental health problems affect all communities in Santa Clara County. Whereas according to the 2020 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, an estimated 59.3 million Americans ages 12 and older used illicit drugs in the past year. Six million young people 
defined as age 12 to 20, reported drinking alcohol in the past month. 20% of Americans, that's 57.3 million people, use tobacco products or used an e-cigarette or other vaping device to vape nicotine in the past month. Adi additionally, in 2020, 9.3 million Americans misused prescription pain relievers. Staggering and sobering facts, uh, that's for sure, Sherry. Whereas in, in addition to deaths that are directly attributed to substance use, there are many more deaths that are indirectly related. Therefore, substance abuse prevention is not just a matter of preventing illegal activity, but rather is a movement to shed light on a public health crisis that is tearing through communities. With commitment and support, these and other substance use and mental health issues can be prevented. Through Substance Abuse Prevention Month, people become more aware and able to recognize the signs of mental health and substance use disorders. Whereas the County of Santa Clara recognizes the seriousness of substance use and mental health issues in our communities, the power of prevention and the tireless efforts of all individuals and organizations working to make a difference. Efforts by county and community providers combined with the actions of families, communities, and coalitions come together to make up a larger prevention movement. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Clara does hereby proclaim October 2022 as Substance Abuse Awareness Month passed and adopted by the Board of Supervisors, County of Santa Clara, State of California, on this fourth day of October, 2022, by unanimous vote. Sherry, please share whatever thoughts you wish to do with us. Sure, thank you so much, uh, President Wasserman and members of the Board of Supervisors. Um, studies show that the earlier an individual starts smoking, drinking, or using other drugs, the greater the likelihood of developing addiction. Nine out of 10 people who abuse or are addicted to nicotine, alcohol, or other drugs began using these substances before they were age 18. And people who began using addictive substances before age 15 are nearly seven times likelier to develop a substance abuse problem than those who, de who delay first use until age 21 or older. And every year that substance use is delayed during the period of adolescent brain development, the risk of addiction and substance abuse decrease. The month of October is an opportunity to highlight the vital role of substance use prevention and to remember those that have lost their lives to substance abuse and to acknowledge those in recovery as well as friends and loved ones that support them. So thank you very much, President Wasserman and members of the Board of Supervisors for presenting this proclamation. Thank you and thank you, Director. I see a hand from Vice President Ellenberg. Is that on this item? It is. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you so much. I, I just wanted to add a piece. I'm, I am in full enthusiastic support of this recognition of Substance Use Prevention Month. And thank you so much, Sherry. Uh, in particular, the efforts to combat the stigma that so often accompanies addiction issues with a focus on criminalization rather than treatment and recovery. Uh, and I think we can't emphasize often enough that alcoholism and drug addiction are are diseases, not a reflection of an individual's moral failing. And I was particularly struck by, by one passage um, in the resolution, the, the one that says, uh, whereas in addition to deaths that are directly attributed to substance use, there are many more deaths that are indirectly related. Therefore, substance use prevention is not just a matter of preventing uh, illegal activity, but rather is a movement to shed light on a public health crisis that is tearing through communities. Um, I found that to be particularly moving. And in the past 12 months, um, according to the medical examiner's dashboard, there have been 316 drug deaths in Santa Clara County, the majority due to uh, methamphetamine, in addition to an increasing number of opioid overdoses. And I, I want to take this opportunity to remember each of those individuals, their families, and the many others who are impacted by substance use disorders in our community and charge our entire county organization, not just the behavioral health department, but all of us that serve the public to commit to addressing this issue as the public health crisis that it is. Thanks. Thank you. With that, we're gonna move on to item 5B, which I also have the honor of presenting. 
And I want to welcome our Santa Clara County Fire District Chief, Chief Suwana Gurgal. Good morning, Chief. Nice to see you. Good morning, President Wasserman. Glad to be here. Thank you. I'm going to read this in regards to the 100th anniversary of Fire Prevention Week. Whereas on October 9th, 2022, fire agencies throughout Santa Clara County. <laughs> okay, the dogs just love Tuesday mornings. My apologies. Whereas on October 9th, 2022, fire agencies throughout Santa Clara County are teaming up with the National Fire Protection Association, the NFPA, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Fire Prevention Week, occurring October 9th to 15th. This year, FPW campaign, Fire Won't Wait, Plan Your Escape, and that's trademarked by the way, Chief, works to educate everyone about simple but important actions they can take to keep themselves and those around them safe from home fires. The National Fire Protection Association indicates that today's homes burn faster than ever, and residents may have less than two minutes to safely escape a home fire from the time the smoke alarm sounds. An individual's ability to escape a home during a fire depends on an early warning system from smoke alarms and advanced planning. Whereas the Santa Clara County Central Fire Protection District, along with all Santa Clara County fire agencies, encourages community members to embrace the 2022 Fire Prevention Week theme and stress that it is important for everyone to plan and practice a home fire escape. Whereas every home is different and therefore every home fire escape plan will also be different. It is critical that an escape plan ensures everyone knows what to do when a smoke alarm sounds and addresses all those in the household, including children, older adults, and people with disabilities who may need additional assistance. Whereas Santa Clara County Fire Agencies are hosting a series of events in support of this year's Fire Prevention Week campaign, Fire Won't Wait, Plan Your Escape. Activities include fire drills, life and fire safety assemblies, and community engagement activities. Whereas all residents can learn more about Fire Prevention Week programs and activities in Santa Clara County by contacting their local fire department or simply visiting fpw.org. That's FPW as in Fire Prevention Week .org. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Santa Clara County Central Fire Protection District does hereby proclaim October 9th through 15th, 2022, as the 100th anniversary of Fire Prevention Week, passed and adopted by the Board of Supervisors, County of Santa Clara, State of California, on this fourth day of October, 2022, by unanimous vote. And now I'd like to ask you, Chief, to say whatever words you wish. Um, I have Deputy Chief Hector Estrada um, on the Zoom call. Um, he's nice. just here again, the efforts that he, uh, with his division, um, in keeping the community safe cannot be underscored. Again, as mentioned, we are celebrating and recognizing a significant milestone. Fire prevention efforts and fire prevention staff are really the unsung hero in this whole thing because it's really hard to quantify something you prevented. So the, all the efforts that they do really at the end of the day is trying to prevent a potential negative outcome or consequence. And um, with regard to, you know, home fire fatalities, the, the issue, oh, hey chief, you're, you're, you're sideways there. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of the issues that we have, we're seeing is because of just the, if you will, the materials that things are made in the home, the, the furnitures that were, was made you know, 50 years ago is very different than the materials that make up furniture today. They just burn hotter, faster. And, um, and that's why it's so critical to have smoke detectors in your home, working smoke detectors. So with that said, um, again, the place that we are wanna really highlight is this 100th year anniversary, uh, the department, along with all the other fire agencies in the county, team up with the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, and um, push out these important messages um, to help keep the community safe. Um, so thank you again, President Wasserman and to the entire Board of Supervisors for the unanimous um, approval of this proclamation and presenting it uh, to honor the, uh, the um, efforts of the Fire Prevention Division.
Thank you. And thank you, Chief Estrada, for your leadership in this area. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you. All right. With that, we're going to move on to 5C as in Charlie. And this proclamation is being brought forth to us by Supervisor Lee. <clears throat> thank you again, President Wasserman. American veterans, our nation's bravest citizens that have sacrificed so much for our country <clears throat> and volunteered to leave their families and loved ones to serve and even willing to risk giving up their lives to protect our freedom and democratic values. It is absolutely vital that we show them the appreciation they deserve when they come home and provide the support to help them transition back to civilian lives. Greenlight a Vet is a campaign to establish visible national support for our veterans and spark a national conversation about recognizing veterans and green light them forward as valued members of our communities. Let's honor our veterans in Santa Clara County, not only on November 11th, but year round by changing one light to green in the visible location on your porch, your home, or at your office and keep it glowing every day as a symbol of appreciation and support for our veterans. On October 11th, here at the county building, we'll change one green light. I encourage you to share your support, take a picture of a green light and post it on your social media using hashtag, hashtag green light event. At this time, we have the Steve von der Carl, director of the Santa Clara County Veterans Services Office. And I believe also co Cameron, our chair of the Veterans Commission is also here to share a few words about this campaign. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Supervisor Otto. I really appreciate you as a fellow vet and joining us in a couple of our meetings. Uh, this is really a great program where we as a county now are recognizing our vets joining counties across the country, over 3,000. And uh, with all the previous speakers, I just wanna say, you know, first of all, I've got just, I, I spoke early before we started. Uh, the clerk team is just amazing that supports all of us and uh, Radhika that supports the commission with I'm sure all the other things she does. I just wanna send out a special thanks to her. <clears throat> and all the previous speakers, I mean, think about how vets are. Are they a part of the LBGTQ community? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, are they, Fire people, yes. Just a wide spectrum. And we just put on another uh, workshop on suicide where we can educate the population so we can observe vets that might need additional support. Um, the tip I always throw out is ask someone if they have served that mm -hmm. phrase, as opposed to, are you a vet? I'm part of the 75% that supports those that are in combat. So most vets, when they hear the question, are you a vet, think of, oh, those that are combat. So that doesn't apply to me. Well, we want to make sure we support the whole spectrum of vets. And we really appreciate this is yet another way of getting the word out as uh, we just had a nice ceremony in Las Gatas recognizing 911 where I got to sit with the fire chief and, and supervisor Sumidian. So anyway, every way, you know, I, I'll ask again in, in writing to each of you that we might have a little corner in your newsletters uh, supporting vets. So I wanna turn this over to Steve, who's been stepping in to run our VSO team uh, that are just amazing individuals that cover such a broad spectrum of support that uh, they have to handle. So uh, let them have it, Steve. Thank you, Paul. Hope everyone can hear me. Thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Lee, for this Steve. We're having a Steve. We're having a tough time hearing you. Could you get closer to your mic, perhaps, or face it more directly? Let me get down here. How's that? Is that working better? It's it's a little better. Uh, let me try this. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So, uh, what I'll say here is first, thank you for the opportunity to the board on this very important uh, uh, recommendation and action by Supervisor Lee. Um, the transition of our veterans from active duty to retired status has always been a complex and difficult process, a process that our VSO staff team... We're losing you again. I'm sorry. There. Is that better? 
Yes. That a uh, process that our staff at the DSAC deals with every single day. Um, I will say that the VSO uh, staff wholeheartedly supports this proclamation to uh, sponsor Operation Greenlight. And in this very small way, uh, provide an opportunity for our county government and our residents uh, to see our veterans returning from active duty, to appreciate their contribution, and to support them in this very difficult transition. Thank you again, uh, Supervisor Lee, for uh, initiating this. Steve, we're just not catching what you're saying at the end. Cole, do you want to finish for him? Uh, what Steve and I have talked many times, and he's a part of uh, my regular commission meeting, <clears throat> where we really collaborate with a variety of supporters. Like my hat here, Noah Vet has a national database that people can get. You know, one vet knows his old teammates in his old unit somewhere in the country, and by zip code, you can get access to that local information. We just really uh, appreciate the support that you as the supervisors have offered us and look forward to that continued uh, partnership. I, I think that's good enough for right now. I thank you. I want to take up no more of your time because you've got a, a large agenda. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Cole. Appreciate that. And thank you, Supervisor, <clears throat> Supervisor Lee for bringing that to us. With that, we now move on to 5E to be brought forth by Supervisor Simidian. This will be accommodation for environmental volunteers and their 50th anniversary. There we, I think we have the supervisor now. Yes, we do. Yes. Forgive me, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm having uh, those minor technical difficulties we have. There we go. No worries. All right. Well, uh, colleagues, this is my opportunity to say thank you and job well done. And uh, I so appreciate the board joining uh, me in this effort uh, because thank you and, uh, for a job well done uh, really doesn't begin to do it for the folks at Environmental Volunteers who have been on the job for 50 years now, which is what we're celebrating today. Uh, our area, the Bay Area and Santa Clara County in particular, are known as um, places with a deep uh, commitment to environmental issues and concerns, social justice, environmental justice, uh, a connection to uh, our natural surroundings. And it is no exaggeration to say that a major part of the credit for that uh, goes to the folks at Environmental Volunteers, because now after 50 years of doing the work they've been doing, educating young people, both in the classroom and out in the field, um, literally more than half a million students have been served by EVs uh, over the, the course of the last uh, half century, uh, which means when we look around the Bay Area that uh, the folks who are now uh, adults, young adults, uh, are oftentimes folks who had that first connection uh, with the land, the first experience by virtue of the uh, good work of environmental volunteers. Uh, I have been so pleased that they have been able to step up the effort in recent years uh, and uh, expand their offerings, uh, to serve even more students uh, from even more schools. One of the things that I have uh, really uh, been pleased to see is uh, our county finding ways to connect nonprofits, wherever they may be in our county, with larger and larger swaths of our county so that the good work can uh, be a benefit to uh, folks throughout the county, particularly in parts of the community that are underserved by virtue of the lack of resources. Uh, so EV has been out there, particularly pushing their work in uh, schools of late that uh, don't always have the resources, wouldn't have these opportunities otherwise. Uh, and as I say, whether it's in the classroom, out in the field, at the EV Center uh, in Palo Alto, which is uh, currently in the midst of a refurbishment, thanks to our historic uh, resources grant program, um, 
uh, you know, it's just it's just a marvelous uh, thing to see. But as I say, more importantly, uh, after 50 years, we have the ability to look back over our shoulder and say, thank you, EVs, for creating the environmental consciousness that is the hallmark of our area. With that, uh, let me just say congratulations again. Thank you once again. And turn it over to uh, Elliot Wright, who is the uh, director of the program and who has really pushed uh, the organization to new heights over these last five years. Thank you. Elliot? Dave, do you see Elliot on? I'm looking. I don't see Elliot in the room. I do not see him in the attendees list either. I looked for both Elliot and Wright. I'm assuming W-R-I-G-H-T. Indeed. Supervisor, yeah. is there anything else you'd like to add? Only uh, to say that it is very unlike Elliot to be uh, MIA, so I'm not sure what the source of confusion is, but we will get uh, the board's commendation to uh, him and to EVs, and uh, I know he'll be disappointed because I saw him just within the last week and he was excited about all this. So whatever the impediment is, um, uh, please know how much the EVs appreciate the recognition. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Supervisor, if you would like, we're going to go to public comment now, and this is a notice to everybody out there who would like to speak about anything not on today's agenda. Now is the time to register electronically to do so. And Supervisor, we can check back after public comment uh, with you to see if Mr. Wright has connected and he's on. Supervisor Chavez, did you have a, something you wanted to say? Yes, thank you. We have um, two additional uh, proclamations. One is for by National yeah. Health Week and the other Hindu, the Hindu proclamation. If I can thank do those you. and then maybe. Yeah, maybe. let's do that. 58 G and H is what Supervisor Chavez is referring to. And Supervisor Simidian, if you can get uh, Elliot to get on. We'll uh, look for him after Supervisor Chavez does 58 G and H. And for those viewing, it'll be explained in just a minute, but those are currently in our con uh, consent section of our agenda. Supervisor Chavez, go ahead. Great, thank you so much. Um, today, I have the privilege of presenting a proclamation to recognize the um, a series of health activities that, um, a series of health activities coordinated during this month of October as Binational Health Week. And I want to um, extend a welcome to Dr. Cody, our health officer and public uh, health director, and the Consul General of Mexico, Alejandra Bologna Zubikarai, who will receive the proclamation and share a few words. But first, I just wanted to give my colleagues a little bit of background on Binational Health Week. My National Health Week was created in 2001 with the objective of raising awareness and responding to the unique health care challenges of Latinos living in the United States and in Canada. It's evolved into one of the largest mobilization efforts in the Americas to improve the health and well-being of the underserved Latino population. This occurs every year in October where community, government agencies, and thousands of volunteers come together to host a series of health education and promotion events this year, the 2022 by National Health Week focuses, focus areas are mental health and managing uh, stress, recovery and resources, healthcare access, screening and preventative care and nutrition. And Santa Clara County will be entering its 18th annual by National Health Week in 2022. This effort has been made possible by an ongoing partnership with the Consul General of Mexico in San Jose and partners from a variety of agencies, including hospitals, clinics, community-based organizations, and volunteers who come together each year to host a series of activities and events. I wanna say a very special thank you to our staff and community organizers who make all of this happen. And I'm gonna start by turning this over to Dr. Cody and then to our Consul General. Thank you so much, Supervisor uh, Chavez and all. It's a pleasure to be here. This is actually one of my most um, favorite celebrations and things that I get to participate in as, as health officer. And it's hard to believe uh, that it's been 18 years of this um, partnership to lift up and improve uh, health in our Latino community. So I'm um, delighted to uh, help receive the proclamation uh, alongside Alexandra uh, Bologna from the Consul uh, um, General. And um, 
and to, to do what we can to serve the whole community and in, in particular the Latino community through this series of um, health events. And so it's not just by National Health Week, really it's, it's by National Health Month. Um, that we're celebrating. So we've had so many strong and ongoing um, partnerships and collaborations that make this possible. And I just, um, so in addition to the uh, Consulado General of Mexico in San Jose, um, Santa Clara Family Health Plan, Bay Area Community Health Center, American Heart Association, Onlock, Telemundo, um, uh, many other community-based organizations, and of course, um, the, the public health staff. So thank you uh, so much. It's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Cindy Chavez and the whole Board of Supervisors. It has been amazing these 18 years working together with the county as a partner, the county of Santa Clara, and a lot of nonprofit organizations to improve the health of our community, the importance of taking care of our health in a community that has been the most impact during COVID. So these efforts together helps a lot. And thank you so much for this proclamation. Thank you both very much. This is a wonderful, and you're right, Dr. Cody, I forgot it is a whole month. So thank you all for very much for being here and for kicking it off. Thank you. Thank you. And Supervisor Chavez, please continue. Dr. Cody, nice seeing you. And she's fluent in Spanish for anyone that doesn't know. I also have the privilege of presenting a proclamation to recognize October 2022 as the Hindu American Appreciation and Awareness Month. And I am hoping that my guest um, of honor is here. Um, to receive this proclamation. There are more than 200,000 Hindu Americans in the Bay Area contributing to the culture cultural, ethnic, linguistic, and religious diversity in Santa Clara County. Hindu Americans in Santa Clara County represent diverse ethnic backgrounds, including individuals from Ind of Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Malaysian, Indonesian, Afghani, Nepali, Bhutanese, uh, Sri Lankan, Fijian, uh, Caribbean, and European descent. Most Hindu immigrants have come to the United States as students in search of a better economic opportunity or to unite with family members while others have arrived in this country after facing religious persecution in the countries of their origin. Hindu Americans have contributed to many economic sectors in Santa Clara County and have particularly excelled in the areas of business, law, politics, information technology, medicine, and science. On behalf of the Board of Supervisors of Santa Clara County, I do hereby, we do hereby proclaim October 2022 as Hindu American Appreciation Month and to acknowledge the rich history contributions and traditions of Hindu Americans for the lasting positive impact they've made on the betterment of our country and our county. I welcome Eason Katir, the California Advocacy Director of the Hindu American Foundation to say a few words. Oh, great, there you are. Well, thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Chavez and good morning, uh, President Wasserman and uh, Supervisors Lee and uh, Ellenberg and Simidian. Yes, on behalf of the Hindu community of Santa Clara County, I want to give thanks and commend you for recognizing this month as Hindu Awareness and Appreciation Month. You know, as the Hindu community, we're, we're proud to serve as productive members of Silicon Valley. And uh, of course, we overlap with the other folks here today, the uh, veterans and the LBGTQ plus community, uh, all part of the Hindu community. Um, however, we've noticed in parts of the world, there is a rising presence of Hindu phobia that deliberately misinterprets Hinduism. So certainly we want to um, be inclusive and uh, aware of that trend. Uh, but overall, there's simply a lack of education about our worldwide living faith of more than a billion people. And your recognition of October as Hindu Awareness and Appreciation Month, it's really an important milestone for our self-esteem and the self-esteem of the many Hindu citizens here. So we gratefully accept your appreciation. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. And that concludes your two items, I believe. I'm gonna turn back to Supervisor Smidian to see if we have an Elliot sighting. Dave or Rhonda? We do not. All righty. Well, that's about all we can do at this time. Supervisor Chavez, did you have an additional comment to make? I see your hand. 
Nope. All right, Dave, I'm going to turn now to public comment. And let's go with two minutes each. All right, one moment, please, while we get the timer up. And again, for those who registered to speak at this time, it's about anything not on today's agenda. The first speaker is Ian. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, and thank you for picking me first again. <laughs> um, I'm uh, PSO at VMC, and I'm talking to you again about the uh, proposed takeover by the SO. Um, we've been meeting with them again, and um, they continue to uh, show a lack of respect for the PSO and for the union. Um, We've been poorly managed by the SO since they took over so many years ago, and that doesn't seem to be changing. And uh, the county and the ESA refused to, to waive any of the uh, new requ requirements they're putting on for the SPSO rule, and um, ignoring the, uh, the experience and uh, the previous testing that we took and saying that, we're, that if you want to transition into the new rule, you've got to do all these new tests and things like that. It's basically to do the same job. Uh, we try to reason with them, but um, uh, we, especially the labor relation guys, they show such a lack of respect and they actually laugh when the, somebody expressed a concern in our last meeting. And we're asking the board to uh, ask them to, uh, to to take these talks seriously and to care about the community like, like we do. We don't want, um, we've had these issues about uniform as well, they're just not listening to us. Because we don't want to scare anybody away from the hospital or the, the resources that are provided. Uh, in, and police presence does that to people. Uh, if you change the uniform, you change the image, and it, it could it could produce that. And we have very sensitive and very uh, vulnerable people who come to our, our facilities. So we're asking the board to uh, to put some pressure on these guys to uh, to take things seriously and to respect the union, to respect the the people that have served the county, some of them for over thirty years, and to uh, and to waive all these these restrictions they're putting on us they're not they're not rules or or they're not uh, legal things they're just a, a, a policy of the, the current S so so please put some pressure on these people next speaker is kirk bartan you have two minutes to speak please go ahead yeah hi uh supervisors thank you so much for uh letting me speak today i wanted to I uh, announced that, and I, I sent a message, but I know you guys get a lot of information, but uh, SB 1407, the California Employee Ownership Act was signed into law on Thursday by Governor, New uh, Governor Newsom. And uh, I just wanted to say, this is really a momentous thing for uh, California and for this county and, and for everybody here in California, uh, because it creates a hub inside of the governor's economic development, GoBiz uh, department uh, in, in California and allows for a focused resource to permanently uh, look at uh, employee ownership for the public, for uh, other government agencies, and uh, anybody's interested in finding out how to get resources. And I'd like to personally thank uh, Supervisor Chavez for uh, her continuing support and letters of advocacy that she uh, tirelessly sent in when I asked uh, for, uh, you know, every time it goes through, it was unanimous support from the Senate and the Assembly. Every time it goes into committee, um, I asked for uh, the supervisors to send in a letter and Supervisor Chavez did that. And I, I just wanted to say uh, with, with great appreciation that that happened. And, you know, it, it wouldn't have happened, you know, this wouldn't have happened if there wasn't continuing efforts uh, to, to do this. The Work Coalition, the Worker-Owned Recovery California Coalition uh, here in California was a co-sponsor on this with uh, Senator Becker and uh, Ash Kalra. And so we're really proud that this happened. This is the first of its kind. It's a landmark uh, bill and law, and you're gonna see some incredible outcomes from this uh, next year when they uh, hire the person to, to start doing the work that needs to be done around worker ownership. In thank you. Country, around the state. So thanks very much for letting me speak. Next speaker is Jason Dorsey. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, Jason Dorsey, SCIU Chapter Vice President. As a former Vice President of SCIU, I know the importance of the PSO's facilities. 
and for many of these facilities like the reentry. Jason, center. we can barely hear you. If you can direct yourself closer, maybe to your microphone. Better. Try again. Better. Yes. All right. As one of our chapter vice presidents, I've toured many of these facilities with uh, Miguel, our CEO, Rico Mendez, and ESA. These are in, uh, facilities like the Valley Health and Homeless, the Reentry Center. And I've seen how important it is to have not have the law enforcement presence that deters the clients, but a, a welcoming experience for the clients with the essence of safety at the same time. We can settle this new SPSO classification with ESA if they really mean to respect our PSOs. This can be achieved by making the 1.6% increase to the proposal, acknowledging the experience of the existing PSOs, and, and making a, a little bit of difference between existing and the incoming PSOs. These people have done a lot of work over the years. Some of them, some of them have been here for 25 years. Uh, this would only be for them. This would not be for the incoming. They are asking for stuff to be redone, like the polygraph and other examinations that these people have done before in their process of training throughout their career here in Santa Clara County. Let's stop trying to push out the existing PSOs and continue to build up this workforce and get on with the safety in our facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Jose Naharo. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you. Jose, I'm going to ask you to unmute one more time. And Jose is not responding. We'll uh, come back to him. Oh, yes, Jose. hi, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, apologize. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Jose Naharo, and I'm a PSO with the county. I've been here for about, uh, let's say, nine years. Um, as you can, as you know, the PSOs have been understaffed and under-resourced and ignored well under this uh, this current management. We have been a responsibility and obligation to ensure that everyone who walks through our doors have access to care, while also ensuring safety of my coworkers and the public. It's unfortunate that we have not been provided adequate resources to be able to meet that need. It is now that ESA is proposing to change our classification and completely ignore our experience and expertise in working with the community <laughs> in some critical facilities, uh, ignoring our existing certifications and agility exams for doing the same work with the revised class, if not a reason for trying to push us out. You know, this creation of this uh, new PSO is critical to keep our facilities, clients, and workers safe. So, you know, we, we, we want we want security as well, but we also want to be respected. We want to be given that extra 1.6% bump. We don't want to be laughed or scoffed at. So we ask you to intercede and acknowledge our experiences in the certificates. And I thank the board for the time. So we ask the board just to do that. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Next speaker is Christina Lopez. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Christina, I'm going to ask you to unmute one more time. It looks like Christina is not responding. We'll come back. Next speaker is Bren Perez. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Bren, are you there? Bren is also not responding. We'll come back. Next speaker is Delilah Polito. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Delilah, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, I had a question regarding the um, memo that was sent out uh, by the chief uh, chief operating officer regarding the updated county vac uh, vaccination policy. So um, in the memo, it states um, COVID-19 vaccine means a vaccine authorized or approved to prevent COVID-19 um, by the federal Food and Drug Administration, including by way of an emergency use authorization. Um, the COVID-19 vaccine never prevented COVID-19. So if this was the basis of putting people on leave and you know, enforcing these mandates, um, that's, false, that's a false statement. So how can you still continue with um, these, the, the original vaccine mandate if it doesn't prevent COVID-19 and it doesn't even do anything with the new variants. So, um, you know, I would like that question answered. I also have a question regarding the mask. So with, with um, Smith stating that 
the mask only per, uh, protects the user, then how can you still enforce the mask mandate under good conscience? And my other question is um, also the COVID-19 vaccine statement that it prevents COVID-19, it says um, by way of an emergency. So what emergency do we still have here? Um, do we, are we still under a local state emergency? I'm not talking about the California state emergency. Um, what, I, what I'm talking about is Santa Clara County. Do you guys still have us under a local state of emergency? And if so, why? Why are we still in a local state of emergency? What emergency do we still have? Thank you. Thank you. And Dave, before you go to our next speaker, for anybody else wishing to speak about the subject of COVID, we have that at a time certain, no sooner than one o'clock this afternoon under item number 11, which will be our report from our public health officer and administration relating to COVID. Uh, we do not go back and forth and answer questions during public comment. Um, she just spoke regarding COVID, so is not able to speak again on number 11. But anybody else, please, if you wish to speak about COVID, please wait till item number 11. Go ahead, Dave. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're going to go back to Christina Lopez. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead, Christina. Hi, I'll call back after one. Okay. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much, Dave. That was item number six, public comment. We now move on to item number seven, approval of the consent calendar and changes to the Board of Supervisors. And before I turn to supervisors, I'm gonna ask Mr. Leone, who lucked out on today's assignment, <laughs> drawing the shortest consent calendar in my 12 year history. David, please read it. We have a request from President Wasserman to add item number 17 to the consent calendar. Item number 17 is to consider recommendations relating to strategic media relations services for the Office of the County Council. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to present item numbers 58G and 58H during item number five. Item number 58G is to adopt a proclamation declaring a series of health activities coordinated during the month of October 22 as by National Health Week in Santa Clara County. We have, uh, sorry, uh, item number 58H is to adopt a proclamation declaring October as 2022 Hindu American Appreciation and Awareness Month in Santa Clara County. And that concludes my list. Thank you. And of course, Supervisor Chavez brought us 58G and H earlier under item number five. Anybody wishing to speak, probably anybody from the public wishing to speak about items on today's consent calendar, please register electronically at this time. Now I'm going to turn to board members for any additions, subtractions, comments they wish to make. Seeing one, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, President Wasserman. I, I'm fine with leaving item 45 on the consent calendar, but I wanted to just make a quick comment. And that is that I would like the administration to um, have a policy of informing labor organizations when an item is coming forward without concurrence. And, um, and I'd like that to be a 30 day um, notification to the union, to whatever union in a formal way, um, if we could do that as part of the consent calendar. And then item 47, um, this is when the item to continue direction for all county entities to only meet remotely uh, per the provisions of AB 361. What I'd like to um, recommend is that while we leave that on consent so that we have the option of um, continuing to meet, re meet remotely, that as part of Dr. Smith's um, uh, report, that we talk just a little bit about the timing for coming back uh, to the board uh, to meetings in, um, uh, you know, in person. That would be part, of, and I would move the consent calendar with those additions. Thank you, Supervisor Sumitian. Uh, thank you. Uh, if if there was an attempt to uh, provide board direction rather than a request by uh, Supervisor Chavez on that first item, I wonder if we could ask that it be repeated and that um, Dr. Smith lean in and let us know whether or not he thinks this is um, easily accommodated. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, I would like the administration to inform labor organizations when the item will be on the agenda without concurrence from the union, 
and to ask that it be done with 30 days, but you know, beforehand before the item comes to the to the board. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I'm having a little bit of trouble. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <clears throat> um, we already do notify all labor uh, unions if we're coming to the board with a um, unresolved issue. Um, so we do that part of it. Uh, the 30 days poses a problem, I think, in terms of individual issues. Some issues require more expeditious effort than 30 days. I would hate to delay everything uh, by 30 days, but uh, obviously we'll do what the board requests. Um, I'm not I'm not asking for um, a change. I'm only asking that the notification happen. And my understanding is that to put something on the board agenda, it often takes a month. And so all I'm asking is that at the same time an item be put on the agenda that the unions be notified. And if they if there is a policy that we're doing that, it's very, very inconsistent. And so I would ask then that that policy be be consistent and that at the same time, something is agendized that the unions are notified. Uh, that part we can do. Uh, we'll make sure that we notify the unions once we start to put something on the agenda. Um, if that's the board, board's wish. Gotcha. Does that work, Supervisor Chavez? It does. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Smitty. Thank you for the clarification, uh, Supervisor, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for uh, accommodating the um, feedback from staff. And um, I've, I've mentioned earlier that I think it's helpful and important that we are crystal clear about when it's a request from an individual board member and when it is direction from our full board. And so in this case, um, it, it, the motion, uh, uh, which is to um, incorporate this uh, as formal direction from our full board, I think now that we've got it clarified, staff will be crystal clear about what the expectation is and that it has the support of the full board. So thank you. I know that's a little bit of a kerfuffle, but uh, it, I think it's helpful uh, to make sure that uh, direction is clear and realized. Um, my only two comments on uh, other matters are on item 39 uh, on the consent calendar, which is the status report from staff on uh, referrals that uh, have been made by our board. Uh, there's an indication there that the report back on certain matters related to uh, Lehigh Cement Plant Quarry uh, and non-compliance issues there uh, would come at the indication is that it would come back at the first meeting in December. I'd like staff, I, this is an individual request, uh, but I'd like staff to look at uh, whether or not that matter might come to us uh, sooner. Uh, I'm thinking maybe the first meeting in November, if that's possible. And I have mentioned that to Dr. Smith, but I wanted to sunshine it publicly and I'll pursue that from my office. And other than that, I'm good to go. I will be an abstention on item 31. Again, that's an abstention on item 31. Thank you. Thank you for your public sunshining. Always appreciated. David, do you agree we have no members of the public wishing to speak? I agree, Mr. President. All right, good enough. We have a motion, Supervisor Smithian. You seconded Supervisor Chavez's motion. Direction? Uh, I did not, but I'm happy to do so if that's what you need. Thank you. Roll call vote, please, David. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to item number eight, which was held from September 13th, when it was item number 20, to receive a special study of county debt from the Board of Soups Management Audit Division. I turn to item eight, and I'm looking, I assume, for Cheryl. There is Cheryl, our management audit manager. Welcome, Ms. Salav. Take it away. Hello. Um, thank you, President Wasserman and members of the board. Um, this item um, is, um, I, as I understood the direction, we were to bring back four, four recommendations that were related to the Board of Supervisors um, from this study. 
So the other items were already heard by FJC. And um, I'm gonna ask Amanda Guma, our senior manager who managed this project to present on these items. Wonderful, welcome Amanda. Thank you, good morning supervisors. Thank you for inviting me today. I'm going to try to pull up some brief slides um, to share. Yeah. There we go. Great. Um, oops, sorry about that. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm going to briefly discuss uh, the special study that our office conducted on the county's debt management practices, and in particular, the four recommendations that we directed to the Board of Supervisors. Um, the report was completed in December 2021. The purpose was to examine the county's um, debt issuances and debt management practices in order to identify opportunities for um, making um, that process more efficient. We um, submitted five findings in this report with 16 recommendations. And as I said, four of those recommendations were directed to the Board of Supervisors. Um, the recommendations made to the Board of Supervisors appear in two of the five finding sections. The first uh, is in section one, where we looked at uh, debt issuance, transparency, and oversight. Uh, we found that the county's process for selecting and evaluating capital projects that require debt financing to be opaque. Uh, proposed debt issuances are not first heard in the board's finance and government operations committee. And unlike peers, Santa Clara has not established a debt advisory or oversight committee to review potential financing. In this section, uh, we directed three recommendations to the Board of Supervisors. Recommendation 1.6 um, suggests that the board um, amend the rules to include a review of proposed debt issuances as a matter of res the responsibility of the finance and government operations committee so that all proposed debt issuances are heard first in that committee before being heard by the full board. Recommendation 1.7 um, recommends that the board consider establishing a debt affordability advisory committee with formal membership to review and make recommendations to the finance and government operations committee related to debt issuances. And recommendation 1.8 um, recommends that the board modify policy 4.7.1 related to the county's debt management policy to require the finance agency to conduct an annual review of the county's debt affordability model. The final recommendation that we made to the Board of Supervisors in our study appears in section three of the report. Um, and that section focuses on the county's reliance on lease revenue bonds. In this section, we note that the county's reliance on lease revenue bonds was higher than the median for the 10 most populated California counties. Um, lease revenue bonds are more expensive than general obligation bonds. They carry higher costs to taxpayers due to the higher risk for investors, which credit, rate, credit rating agencies typically rate less favorably than general obligation bonds. Um, and we found that the county currently has no a meaningful control in place to constrain the county's issuance of lease revenue debt. We recommended in this section, um, the recommendation that's directed to the board is recommendation 3.3, uh, where we suggest that you consider recommending that the county support or sponsor legislation to lower the state's voter approval threshold for general obligation bonds from two thirds to 55% similar to what is required of school districts. And that concludes um, my slides for today and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Can anyone from the public wishing to speak register electronically? I'll now turn to Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, particularly Cheryl uh, and your team for, for this very thorough report. What I'd like to do is um, is call out a, a couple of of the recommendations, some of which administration has has already agreed to, um, 
and make some some comments on the board recommendations as well and then i'll offer a motion and hope to second. uh first on 1.2 this is direction to the county director of finance um administration agrees regarding training i just want to note um I, I agree that annual debt training for board members is a good idea i'd like to expand that invitation to include our board aides if that's not already presumed uh, within the item uh, with regard to item 1.3 uh, despite administration's uh, hesitation, I really agree with the recommendation, uh, and I'd like to direct that all proposed bond issuances include a review of debt affordability and budget impacts, including debt service impacts on the general fund, and at least a high-level analysis of operating revenues and costs for any proposed capital project. Uh, moving down to the Board of Supervisors recommendations, uh, 1.6. Uh, I agree with the recommendation and want to direct that it be implemented. Uh, debt issuances are clearly a major decision for the board and do require extra oversight and committee review. Uh, with regard to 1.7, uh, I understand that the trade-off here is more staff time uh, required to organize and present to FGOC, but given the importance of debt, more public oversight, I think, is, is critical. So I agree with this recommendation as well and would like to see it implemented. Um, um, with a 1.8, uh, I agree with that recommendation and would direct that to be um, implemented. Uh, item 2.1, um, I just want to note here that I do agree with with administration's response. Um, so thank thank you for that. Uh, on item three point one, which is the establishment of a debt limit, administration has agreed to work with its municipal advisor to create uh, meaning a meaningful debt limit. I would just like to ask that to direct that this be completed by January, please, of twenty twenty three. Three point two. Uh, I agree with that recommendation. The auditor was referring to general obligation bonds, but I believe staff responded the with the perspective of uh, running scenarios for various lease revenue bonds. For any project that requires a bond, uh, Dr. Smith, your mic is on, and you may not want it to be. Um, I would like to direct that the board receive an analysis of both general obligation and, and lease revenue bonds, as well as the operating analysis uh, recommended uh, by the auditor. 3.3, uh, um, I agree with that recommendation and would direct implementation. And with all of those, hopefully you're keeping track, um, I'd like to make a motion that incorporates uh, my comments on the auditor's recommendation and hope to have a second from a colleague. I have a second that. Thank okay, you. we have a second from Supervisor Chavez. Dr. Smith? Yeah. Yes, I, I would like to go through um, the staff's uh, perspective on the issues, uh, of course. if you don't mind. Uh, we have a presentation, which I will skip, but the focus of the presentation is to point out that we have the highest rating available from our credit rating credit agencies. We have um, significant debt policies. Um, we think we perform uh, in the best way possible for this, from the perspective of all the counties in the state. However, um, if you look at the matrix, I'd like to go through some of the proposals, uh, maybe one by one. Thank uh, you. The first Adrian, section, you want, Dr. Smith. This is with the matrix. Um, or bring it up on the screen. Okay, I'll bring it up on the screen. Okay. If I can figure out how to do it. Or if you know what page it's on. Would you like me to share the screen, Dr. Smith? Yes. No, please. I've got it. Oh, he's got it. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Um, so section one had to do with transparency and oversight. Um, and the focus here was to have a 
membership of uh, administrative capital committee were supportive of that. Uh, the only difference we had was um, we felt that county council only needed to be there as needed, um, but um, that's a pretty minimal dif difference of agreement. Um, in terms of the director of finance, uh, the training, we agree and we um, already offer training, but we would make sure that we comply with supervisor um, Ellenberg's concern to make sure that everybody in the offices has that access to that training. Um, the uh, 1.3, uh, we also partially agree. Um, this, ep this effort uh, happens every year during the budget process, but um, essentially what the auditor is saying is to bring it out um, more public and in, in be specific so that we can um, be more transparent about it. So we're happy to do that. Um, in terms of 1.4, um, we also partially agree and uh, you can read the presentation about how to do that, how we think we should do that. 1.5 is to the budget to director and long-term strategy. Um, this is part of the capital improvement plan, which uh, you'll hear later on. Um, most of our debt is incurred, well, virtually all of our debt, all of our debt is incurred to uh, either build or repair uh, facilities. So this is part of the capital improvement plan. So we'll be more specific about which uh, projects need um, funding from debt. Then in terms of the supervisor's proposals, um, we had a no response, obviously, because this is up to the board. We think that 1.6, we can certainly do reporting back to FGOC and uh, um, 1.7, um, we uh, believe that if the board wants to have a, a affordability advisory committee, that's fine. Um, but um, along with uh, 1.8, we should notify the board that um, as was pointed out, much of our debt is lease revenue bonds. And so the affordability is that um, the general fund is obligated to pay those uh, for the most part. So um, this will currently comes up as part of the budget uh, discussions, but we'll pull it out and make sure that we're more specific and uh, more aware of it. Um, in terms of uh, 2.1, um, we're partially in agreement with that. I don't think that's a problem. In terms of 3.1 and 3.2 and 3.3. Um, um, these all relate to the fact that the auditor believes that we should utilize general obligation bonds uh, more than lease revenue bonds. Um, obviously, the board realizes that general obligation bonds have to go to the electorate and they um, currently require a supermajority. Um, I think it's unlikely that one county will be able to change that um, requirement and it's probably unwise to do. Plus, they take a huge amount of time as we found out with uh, the um, seismic project at the hospital. Um, Actually, contrary to the auditor's report, um, general obligation bonds cost the uh, taxpayer more money than lease revenue bonds because they add a new tax, um, whereas lease revenue bonds rely upon current taxes. So we think that this uh, 
set of recommendations was uh, not a wise set of recommendations and uh, we would recommend against it. Um, number section four, internal management, we had partial agreements or agreements on both of those. And section five, use of advisors, um, we also had agreements on those. So I think um, fundamentally the uh, major issue that we're concerned about is that we think that using general obligation bonds for every construction will significantly delay um, and probably paralyze the operation um, and is not a good idea because of the requirements of law. And I think uh, County Council has something he wants to add to it. Thank you. James? Then we'll go back to Supervisor Chavez. So I, I'm happy to speak to some of the, the any questions related to kind of the difference between general obligation bonds and lease revenue bonds, uh, obviously, as the board is aware, but for the benefit of the public, um, under the California Constitution, general obligation bonds require two thirds voter approval. Um, and so there's a lot, there's process and voter approval requirements involved with issuance of geo bonds. They do relieve the general fund because a geo bond is paid back through a separate levy on the property tax bill that's imposed independent of the county's share of the 1% general property tax. Um, and so from that perspective, they're obviously very advantageous budgetarily. Um, and they do for that exact same reason, because they have an independent dedicated levy. That's why they carry a lower interest rate, uh, because they're secured by a separate independent levy. So I don't think there's, um, you know, at the, that's just kind of the, the inherent structure there, but there's real limitations in their, uh, in the practicability of use of geo bonds because of that constitutional requirement. Uh, schools did get a constitutional amendment to lower the threshold to 55%. Uh, and one of the recommendations in the audit, um, that the item 3.3 is related to um, trying to seek a similar constitutional amendment for counties more broadly. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. Um, I think um, I'm not sure what specific um, recommendation that the staff, Dr. Smith, that you're disagreeing with. Is it, could you call it out? What numbers? What numbers specifically, yes. Section, section three is the majority of it. But what in section three? We would uh, mostly section three two, which require which suggests that we use geo bonds um, for construction. Um, and the reason that we disagree with that is because it means a new tax, and it also means a new process. Um, as you know, as you know, when we did the geo bond for the seismic project um, it required quite some time and it required a two-thirds majority if we did that for all of our projects we would kill them i mean well, the board Dr. has been Smith, very specific about wanting to have a number of projects moved rapidly if we relied upon geo bonds um, they would not move rapidly what my understanding of this um, item is, is that the staff present options to the Board of Supervisors, not that the, that the, we only take, that, that that's the direction. And, and let me just say why, it, what's a little concerning to me about this discussion. So initially, the reason I requested that, the, that this be reviewed by the Management Audit Division's work plan is because I wanted the board to have a much stronger understanding of our debt capacity so that when we were making decisions about whether or not 
we need to lease property, purchase property, lease to buy, um, and for the emerging projects we were talking about, which would be how much room did we have um, to be able to afford debt service, that at least by doing the full analysis, that it would help the board understand the choices it needed to make. So my understanding of this is that it's only a, rec a request of an analysis. And when this came to FGOC, not only did we not have a report back from administration, we did not have, as requested, a report back even from council. So I'm, I'm, I'm also saying that the importance of this report is making sure that a committee like FGOC or some committee um, gets a chance to have a deep dive into these kinds of um, Subject. So I want to make sure what I understand what you're saying is that you have a concern about the staff doing the analysis of this, of, of looking at all the options before the board votes on, on um, the path to choose when we need to use debt for construction. No, I don't have any concern about analysis, but I'm saying that the analysis will be pretty simplistic. Um, in the sense that um, general obligation bonds will delay projects and require a two-thirds majority um, vote uh, of the electorate, which will delay the project until the next election and beyond. So we can certainly do an analysis, um, but I think the fundamental issue is um, we're presuming that there's an understanding that a new geo bond means new taxes and a considerable time period of delay. And uh, a lease revenue bond means uh, being able to move ahead rapidly on something. So for example, yeah, um, I understand if, that. If, well, I don't, the recommendation is to prefer geo bonds and to have the board sponsor um, state legislation. I think that's very unrealistic. We're happy to do the analysis, but you know the analysis will be pretty simple. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think robust analysis when we're making choices is just important. That that's all. And if I'm understanding the concern you have, what it what it's what 3.3 says is only to consider recommending that the county support or sponsor. It's not saying go lead the way statewide by yourself. And, and I think that those are really worth, you know, conversations worth having, particularly as it relates to what we don't, what we don't know about the um, economy relative to interest rates and any number of things. So I think having the just having that um, capacity in our back pocket to make determinations about, you know, supporting or trying to to um, sponsor sometime in the future. Again, I, I just think it it's it's creating a, a menu of options. I don't think it's it's limiting us in any way. Okay. Unless it is, and I don't understand that. And I'm I'm happy to hear uh, that. I would just say that, for example. The board has made it clear that they want to move ahead rapidly with the new psych adolescent hospital. If we had to go out for a general obligation bond for that, um, that would delay it significantly. And there's a high likelihood that we would not get a supermajority to support that. So essentially, this recommendation would tie the board's hands, not give you more flexibility. The recommendation says present multiple financing scenarios to the Board of Supervisors when debt issuances are considered. The scenarios should include multiple instruments, specifically geo bonds for larger projects and long term cost implications that include operating costs. I, I don't see that test giving us a direction of going one direction. And to your point, you know, I've worked on every one of these campaigns since 2010, maybe even earlier actually. So I, I do understand the, the challenges and the differences between them, but I think this is only requesting an analysis, um, you know, a, a, 
a broader analysis. And colleagues, I'll just say that um, I, I really did ask for this out of just wanting to better understand how this might develop other policies that the, that the county would be looking at. And um, I do want to say that I, I thought that the staff did a thorough and reasonable job of, of um, providing recommendations uh, for us in terms of how we make sure that um, that we're looking at all options. And that really was my, my primary um, goal. And, you know, and I, I, I anyway, I, I think that what I what I wanted to make sure of is that we do have a more robust um, oversight and the ability to do more um, robust analysis, including and the, one of the reasons that I think it's important to um, acknowledge, I think the point you raised, Dr. Smith, is that for each major project, being able to look at costs for the public and for us and time and all of that is just really critical. So in any case, I, I just I wanted to share with my colleagues what the impetus of my request was initially, and that I thought the analysis done by the, you know, Harvey Rose was very helpful. And this discussion has been helpful, and I would have loved to have been able to um, even had it more vigorously at, at FGOC. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. And if I may summarize something I don't, <laughs> something I've done in 12 years, I think what Supervisor Chavez is asking that when a project's brought forward, we look at general obligation and lease revenue and any other terms of financing. And what Dr. Smith is simply saying is, fine, go ahead and do that, but know that the board can approve lease revenue bonds quickly and general obligation bonds will cost more and, and take much longer uh, to get done. And I think that's all that I'm hearing from Suraj Chavez and Dr. Smith. And I think those two concepts can live together. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman, for that uh, very concise summary of the discussion of what we are trying to accomplish. Yeah, so this item has come before FGOC, uh, which I chair, and, uh, and actually most of the uh, recommendations have already been uh, agreed upon, um, except the uh, we were asking for the follow-up was 1 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, and 3.3. Uh, and from today's discussion, it sounded like the recommendations for 1.6, 1.7, 1.8 are all um, workable with the administration to move forward for the potential implementation. So that's exciting. Um, as for 3.3, um, uh, it's concerned regarding the changing from the two thirds to the 55 percent of the geo bonds. That's not something that our board can determine. This actually requires the state uh, to take action. And then I certainly uh, have no issue of, of, of you know, recommending this to go to voter. But again, this is something that is far greater uh, that this board really, other than the recommendation, I don't think we can do much today other than saying we, we agree to it. Um, and I certainly do agree that uh, more options is better. Uh, so, so as far as the multiple financing scenarios in 3.2, I, I agree that uh, when, when it comes to future uh, debt obligation coming through, um, for the administration to come back to give us that uh, analysis uh, as to, you know, A, the cost, right, the difference between jail bond versus the uh, lease revenue bond, and two, of course, is the timing as well to compare, say, if you do lease revenue bond, we could approve it and move forward, say, next month, uh, as opposed to jail bond that you have to wait till the next election or take another 12 or 14 or whatever. So I think that type of analysis is certainly helpful. Uh, to for us to compare in the future to decide. So I, I certainly do believe these recommendations are, are helpful uh, for the board to have better uh, understanding of what's going on. Uh, and I do think that the organization of having, uh, and one recommendation, I guess, uh, regarding uh, the, uh, to ask the Office of Intergovernmental Relations uh, to provide analysis of any and all bills currently proposing for a change at the state legislature uh, regarding these requirements for the geo bonds. Uh, and any potential implication of such an implication, uh, that, such a legislation uh, that would affect our county here uh, uh, regarding this issue. So if we could just get the information back to see what else is going on the state level. I would really appreciate it. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and bear with me. There we go. Um,
uh, colleagues, I, I, uh, I have for some time had a somewhat different view of how uh, we might most productively use our committee system. Um, it It is, I think, to some extent, a function of the time I spend in the state legislature where committees really do serve a very um, clearly defined function or purpose. I, I think uh, at our board, we've, we've uh, in during my recent tenure, we've we've had a sort of an inconsistent um, way of using the committees. I, I think the um, the back and forth today about what is or isn't on the table and what the recommendations do or don't entail is a reminder why it's helpful to have these issues resolved at the committee level. I, I heard clearly from colleagues that they weren't fully satisfied with what was shared at the committee level. So I, I just wanted to say I, I, I got that loud and clear, uh, but I think that's why we're having what I would characterize as a somewhat jumbled conversation today about what is or isn't in front of us. and. Um, so let me just ask the maker of the, well, let me ask Dr. Smith, it sounds to me like most of the um, angst that you are describing at the administrative level is around this issue of uh, whether future projects are um, funded by uh, lease revenue bonds or GO bonds. Am I, am I hearing that correctly through the chair, if I may? Doctor. Yes, um, and the reason I'm confused by the conversation has to do with the fact that um, we certainly share information right now um, regarding uh, the issuance of lease revenue bonds. The board has to take action to do that. Um, obviously, the board knows what it needs to do to um, get a item on the um, elector or the ballot regarding a geo bond um, we certainly can give you the same analysis every time we come to the board asking for funding but um, i think if i'm i'm trying to read through the the back line of what's being requested there's really no other option it's just a lease revenue bond or a geo bond for a property. Maybe what's being confused is the fact that in redevelopment agencies, um, they also contract with private um, entities to loan money. Um, we don't do that. That's not something that we can do effectively. Uh, it's not a investment that we're able to do based on our investment portfolio. So every time we talk about a capital project, it's either lease revenue bonds or general obligation bonds. And, you know, we're happy to come back with the same recommendation every time, but I don't think that's particularly useful. Well, I think um, through the chair again, and yeah. Supervisor Wasserman, thank you for your patience and forbearance with this. I'm, I'm trying to spark an honest to God conversation here among our board colleagues since we're uh, at the full board level with this rather than in the two person committee. Um, I, I think Dr. Smith, what I would say is I, I hear you loud and clear and frankly, I'm sympathetic with your comments about the challenges of geo bonds versus uh, lease revenue bonds. But what I hear the board saying, and and you know, people will shout out if they think I'm hearing it wrong. Uh, what I hear the board saying is, let's be, let's look at every single issuance with a fresh set of eyes, with a beginner's mind, with a uh, openness to other possibilities, and even if time after time after time you land in the same place, um, we we can and and should all feel like the full range of possibilities was considered rather than just um, 
pursuing one uh, approach almost by default. I don't think that's a problem for you, is it? Through the chair? No, that's fine. Okay. And, and Supervisor uh, Wasserman, through the chair, I, I believe the maker of the motion was Supervisor Ellenberg. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I just am thinking rather than take final action on this today, uh, that it, uh, that there's the recommendation three, and I'm looking at packet page 105, that it, you know maybe if this one went, rather than report back to the board and Supervisor Chavez had some helpful uh, clarity about what this entails, or that we send this one, but yeah, bring it back to the board, but bring it through committee again so that when it gets here, it's a little tidier, frankly, than it is today. Does that work for you? Because I understand the recommendation to be come back to the board on on some of this, uh, and maybe I misunderstood that part of the recommendation. Vice President Ellenberg, clarification, please. Uh, yeah, the, what what I noticed in um, listening to the recording of of FGOC was that Supervisor Lee actually did make uh, offer direction that somehow did not translate to the minutes. Uh, or the report. So I, I would certainly defer to the committee members if they think that there's value in going through this again and coming back with a tighter recommendation. Uh, that's fine, but truly I didn't hear any disagreement amongst any of us today. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what would be gained, but I'm happy to defer to um, Supervisors Lee and Chavez before I'm amending my motion. Thank you. And before I, we hear from those two supervisors, <clears throat> I'm going to say I appreciate what Supervisor Smithian just said, but I also think we're very, very close to putting this thing to bed right now with a vote and a motion, if that's the will of a majority of the board members. All right. Well, if I then let me just wrap up. Thank you. That's a helpful. I, I'll withdraw the suggestion if you want to just wrap it up today, but I think we shouldn't kid ourselves. Um, Supervisor Chavez, uh, who uh, I'm hoping will uh, speak up again in a minute, um, I, I heard saying essentially um, that the concerns of administration were perhaps overblown, my language, not hers, uh, were perhaps overblown because it was just a, a direction to come back with analysis when we do this in the future. It wasn't saying we want to go this route on geo bonds versus that route on uh, lease revenue bonds. I, I have to say, my experience as someone who spent 12 years in the state legislature working on these finance issues, and, and I did, in fact, uh, carry legislation dealing with um, voter thresholds for uh, various measures. Uh, I don't think there's a snowball's chance in hell we're going to get to 55% for uh, uh, bonds uh, anytime in the near future. I, I just think that's a political non-starter. Now, circumstances change, times change, uh, fine, good. Um, and I'm, I would not be adverse to, I'm perfectly comfortable with the suggestion that we take the position that's been articulated. But I also want to be sort of clear-headed about what the real prospects of that are. And, and my experience tells me the prospects are uh, yeah. somewhere between slim and none. Uh, and um, so that's a, a lot of talk. I, I can live with the motion uh, now as I understand it. Uh, and again, I, I thought Supervisor Chavez did a nice job of saying, hey, we're just asking for the information and analysis going forward. We're not making a determination today that we would use one tool or another, and I, I counting on my colleagues, Supervisor Ellenberg and Chavez, to tell me if I misheard any of that. Thank you. Thank you. I think they're all agreeing everything is just fine. I don't see any hands going up. I will, I will call on Supervisor Lee for additional comments. Yeah, just wanted to clarify regarding the uh, formation of these uh, advisory committee. The debt advisory committee that was recommended one six one seven one eight. Uh, that those recommendations, when they're being formed to come back to FGLC, I uh, appreciate that. Thank you. You got it. With hands all down, uh, I'm going to say that I'm going to be supporting the motion, um, except for 3.3, 3, 
which was the um, lobbying to lower the state's voter approval rate. For me, I think about taxes. California already has the highest income tax rate, 13.3 in sales tax rate, seven and a quarter in the nation. And personally, I feel increasing taxes that uh, often go in perpetuity should not be that easy. So I will be supporting the rest of the motion, but for the record, um, will not be supporting 3.3. And seeing no further hands, David, I see we have one person from the public wishing to speak. Please let we that do. person in. All right, and just for the benefit of those who are on the call, uh, if you are calling in on a phone, if you wanna speak, you can press star nine to raise your hand and then star six to unmute yourself. Um, one moment, please, while we get the timer up. Thank you. Next speaker is Jen Meyer. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, thanks. This is Jen Meyer, and I'm just speaking today as a local voter who just felt moved to comment on this discussion that uh, considering voter preferences as an inconvenience, it's really tough to listen to when you're listening to a public meeting like this. And while I don't know the ins and outs of the budget, I do know that lease revenue bonds were an instrument intended for projects that actually earn revenue. And even though the state allows loopholes for things like buildings that don't earn revenue, I feel like that uh, kind of fundamental principle that uh, you know we voters should be asked to fund projects that don't earn revenue. <laughs> Uh, just seems like a, a democratic principle. I don't want to fall out of your budget discussions that like there is a reason why we're supposed to ask voters because this is what democracy looks like. So anyway, I wasn't planning to comment on this, but I just couldn't take it. <laughs> and I'm just asking you to remember that voter wishes are not an inconvenience. Thank you. Next speaker is Catherine Hedges. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Um. Good morning. I'm Catherine Hedges. I'm a registered voter in District 2. And I just want to echo what Jen was saying. I was just really shocked to hear the wishes of the voters being considered inconvenience with all we're hearing about threats to democracy in our country. It seems like this is a threat to democracy when our legislators are talking about loopholes to get out of following the wishes of their voters. And I really am disappointed in the Board of Supervisors in the County Executive, particularly the County Executive. Thank you very much. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you, David. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Hi. Supervisor Chavez. <clears throat> Supervisor Travis? Yes. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes, except for the 3.3 as noted previously. That concluded item eight. We now move on to item nine. We'll bring our Director of Behavioral Health Services, Sherry, back for a monthly report on mental health and substance use as a public health crisis. Good morning, Supervisor Wasserman and yeah. the board members. Yes, um, I will actually be kicking this one off. Um, mm -hmm. This is Chief Operating Officer Greta Hansen speaking, and this will be the first um, of what will now be monthly reports on the expansion and improvements to our system of care for treating mental health and substance use. Um, you're going to hear from several uh, departments as part of this report, all of whom are working with behavioral health to effectuate our uh, expansion and enhancements in this area. And um, this, again, is, is the first of what will now be monthly reports. We look forward to hearing feedback from the board on this presentation, on the depth of uh, coverage of the various items that are included in the report. And um, uh, hearing from the board about how um, you'd like to get uh, progress updates, information on challenges and other issues that are coming up in this body of work. Um, this uh, month we cover certain areas in greater depth. Other months we'll cover other areas um, to make sure uh, that we're providing in-depth um, presentations on certain 
issues, but we're also going to make sure that we at least uh, provide any pertinent updates on some of the key projects and issue areas that um, we know are top of mind for various members of the Board of Supervisors. So with that, I will turn it over to Sherry Trout. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Greta, and uh, good morning, uh, President Wasserman, Vice President Ellenberg, and members of the Board of Supervisors. Um, I'm Sherry Terrao, Director of our Behavioral Health Services Department, and if we could advance to the next slide, please. Um, as Ms. Hansen mentioned, we will be um, focusing on uh, three specific areas in this month's report. The first is an effort to increase capacity at acute hospitals, locked treatment facilities, residential treatment facilities, and temporary and permanent housing. Um, our second update will be related to efforts to address uh, workforce shortages. And then finally, uh, we will provide a brief update regarding uh, behavioral health system reforms and efforts recently completed or underway. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now we are about to uh, share some updates related to um, increasing capacity at these various facility levels. Next slide, please. Great. Um, so this is um, a reminder, a bit of a reminder. We've shared on a um, regular basis um, efforts to increase capacity at different levels of care. Um, this is a brief description of acute care or inpatient mental health hospitals. Um, so just as a reminder, um, this particular level of care includes locked hospital settings, providing short-term stabilization to patients experiencing acute mental illness. Uh, these facilities also often treat patients with uh, drug-induced psychosis, for example, from methamphetamine use. Um, our county operates uh, Barbara Ahrens Pavilion, uh, which is a 48-bed psychiatric hospital that is part of Valley Medical Center, and another um, large inpatient psychiatric hospital currently located in our county is operated by San Jose Behavioral Health uh, that offers an 80-bed facility. And um, other hospitals also provide a smaller number of beds for patients with acute mental health needs, but generally do not provide care to Medi-Cal patients for whom the county is responsible. So there are two specific projects underway to expand the number of acute inpatient treatment beds. Um, one is we are currently securing eight dedicated beds at San Jose Behavioral Health for sole use by the county, and this contract will be executed by November 1st, uh, 2022. And secondly is the Adolescent Psychiatric Facility and Behavioral Health Services Center uh, and a contract which will be considered by the board on November 15th. And I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Jeff Draper, our Director of Facilities and Fleet, who will provide an update on this project. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so <clears> the <throat> summary of the project is here, 77 inpatient beds for various levels of, of uh, clients. Uh, the project is currently uh, underway in terms of demolition and site excavation with a target to complete that work sometime right after the first of this calendar year. Um, we are currently in discussions with WebCore on a pre-negotiation, a pre-construction agreement uh, to uh, continue momentum to build, build toward the actual construction of the facility that was on your agenda today and was approved uh, in terms of giving the county executive delegation to move forward. We also have received from WebCore uh, some initial information in terms of their proposal for an actual construction contract and to move things forward. There's a lot of detail coming in on that. We look forward to moving that to the board as soon as possible, again, targeting November. Great, thank you, Jeff. Uh, the next update we wanted to provide is related to subacute care. Um, so uh, subacute care include locked facilities providing intensive mental health treatment, uh, for example, mental health rehabilitation centers or skilled nursing facilities with specialized treatment programs. Uh, these subacute care level programs provide step down care for patients leaving acute hospitalization and also provide care to patients to prevent hospitalization. Um, Patients often require one-to-one -one nursing care and often have long lengths of stay, um, sometimes for many years. Um, and patients provided care in these facilities um, have specialized needs that um, 
preclude them from living independently in the community. Sherry, um, if I may interrupt you just for sure. a minute, I missed the fact Supervisor Lee has his hand raised. Oh, apologies. It might be a question about a prior item. That's not your responsibility, Sherry. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Sure. No, I, go ahead. I uh, I would uh, ask the questions. You're good. Time. Okay. Let them finish the presentation. Thank you. Please continue, Sherry. Sure. Thank you. Um, and so just as a reminder, what we've shared in prior presentations is there is a very severe shortage of subacute facilities statewide, uh, which create major challenges for counties across California. So this is not specific to Santa Clara County, but really happening across the state. And currently we have 256 subacute beds available through our network of contract providers. Next slide, please. Um, so there uh, is a care expansion strategy that we are currently working on with uh, respect to subacute care. Uh, this is related to expanding a contract with Crestwood San Jose. Uh, the expansion contract would be to secure an additional 45 dedicated beds, which would take place in two phases. By November 15th of this year, the contract would be expanded to add 20 beds, allowing placements to start based on turnover. And secondly, the contract would be further amended in July of 2023, adding remaining 25 beds and making placements based on turnover. In addition, we are exploring other potential providers outside the county, as well as collaborative efforts with providers in the Bay Area for expanded bed and facility expansion. And then we are also exploring a construction of a county operated mental health rehabilitation center or a MHRC uh, formerly um, referred to as an IMD. Next slide, please. Uh, just a reminder, residential treatment programs, which we've also shared updates are on are for uh, programs or for clients with severe mental illness, but with uh, less specialized needs who need residential based treatment, but do not need to be in a locked facility. Uh, these facilities are licensed um, and must meet certain standards of care from both uh, the California Department of Social Services Community Care Licensing Division and the Department of Health Care Services. And um, similar to subacute levels of care or facilities, there is also a shortage of residential treatment facilities statewide, uh, particularly in communities like ours here in the Bay Area where housing and facility costs are very high. So there are two specific residential treatment expansion projects that we have underway. The first is a contract with a new provider that recently opened a new facility. Um, they are A and A Healthcare, and uh, this uh, contract agreement would be for 11 beds uh, in San Pablo, California, and the contract uh, will be executed by November 1st of this year. And secondly, is a project that we've been sharing updates on with the board, uh, which is 650 South Bascom. And the county entered into a lease and the property owner is currently renovating the facility and when complete momentum will operate 28 residential treatment beds at this site. Um, I'm now going to turn it back to Jeff Draper who's going to provide an update on this project. The project is currently permitted and in construction they're actually done doing the demolition portion of the work so far. We expect them to move quickly into the actual uh, you know new tenant new tenant improvements fairly quickly uh, over the next uh, couple three months. <clears throat> the um, the other thing that's really important on this project to note is we've heard the board's call for us to try to accelerate the project, and we've reached out to the owner to see where there might be opportunities to do that. And, and we haven't quite heard back from them yet because it takes them a little bit of time for their contractor and their subcontractors to all meet and discuss and find out where ways that they can actually crash the project schedule. But we're doing our best to see if we can't move that time up. Thank you. And Supervisor Lee, you still wanted to wait? Well, the issue is related to uh, 650 Baskin as well. So if that's okay, maybe I could go talk about it right now since the, <clears throat> we just talked about this. So thank you very much, Chef uh, uh, Draper, for, for your report on, on the expediting. So basically, again, I just, just want to reiterate, I'm glad that you have reached out to Swenson uh, the, in regarding the 10 improvement and, and finding ways to speed it up. So currently, right now, we have until... Uh, April 3rd is the estimated opening date, and I really would like to see uh, a, a response back from uh, from the contractor to see if there's any way they could expedite it. You know, just we, we call this a, a, a 
emergency a crisis for our county. Uh, when we look at the emerging crisis, we're looking at something like the hurricane that's going through in Florida, Ian, and you know how the FEMA moves quickly to, to move resources. I think we need to have that type of mindset when it comes to emergency. Uh, so I think I just we just need to uh, relay that to uh, the property owner. Uh, that's the type of emergency we're looking at. So please ask them to uh, come back with a uh, accelerated date, and we really want to make sure that this could open much sooner than expected. Thank you. Gotcha. Great. Thank you, uh, Jeff, and thank you for your comments, Supervisor Lee. Um, if we could advance to the next slide, please. Uh, the next uh, update we wanted to provide is uh, related to um, supported shelter, and we've shared um, prior in prior presentations, a supported shelter includes temporary housing programs that provide some supportive services on site, but generally no on site outpatient mental health services. And so one project that we have underway um, to expand capacity at this level is expanding a contract with community solutions that would add 30 me mental health residential recovery beds. And we formerly referred to um, residential recovery beds as a THUs or transitional housing units. Uh, so Community Solutions is currently identifying homes to lease to support program expansion uh, with the goal of serving clients by January 1st of 2023. And this contract expansion will be executed by November 1st of this year. I'm now going to turn it over to Edwin Poon, our Deputy Director of Managed Care with our Behavioral Health Services Department, who will uh, share some information and updates related to withdrawal management. Edwin, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Board of Supervisor. Good morning, President uh, Weisman. Um, yes, for um, I will be covering the next few slides regarding withdrawal management. Uh, the, this current slide that uh, we wanted to uh, bring to your attention of the level of cares on, according to the American Society of Addiction Medicines uh, regarding the withdrawal management. So what I wanted to highlight are the, the categories uh, under withdrawal management one and two. Uh, those are what we call ambulatory withdrawal management. So they're outpatient based uh, services. Uh, the next level, the third level, is the withdrawal management, what we call 3.2, uh, social detox. And I have a, a, the next slide will cover um, more details of our efforts in expanding social detox. Uh, the last two levels, uh, 3.7 and 4.0, are what we call medical detox. And then we also have a specific slide that talks a little bit about our current effort uh, in, in this area. So we can move to the next slide, please. So uh, what I wanted to cover today uh, regarding social detox is again that this is a residential treatment program essentially providing 24 hour supports to, um, to clients who need withdrawal management. Social detox is the only withdrawal management level that is currently covered by Santa Clara County Drug Medical Organized Delivery System, which is administered by the Behavioral Health Services Department. Of course, uh, DMC ODS also cover other substance use treatment services, including outpatient and residential treatment services. We do have several efforts that are going on right now in looking at expansion of our social detox beds. Uh, first, uh, we have worked with our one of our current provider in expanding their or adding uh, additional 3.2 FTE. Uh, to their uh, staffing to allow the pro provider to expand their program to better support individuals who meet those criteria. We're also uh, in the process of releasing a, a request for additional qualified provider. Uh, we have uh, worked with our procure procurement department and uh, we are ready to release the, uh, the request uh, by the end of the week. So we're very excited of this opportunity to expand our network. Uh, we're also looking into discussing with providers in our adjacent county to see if there's any interest in expanding their services uh, to our county. So this is an early effort, but we think that this is an important step for us. And then last but not least is that we're currently negotiating a contract with uh, a provider to add five social detox beds for youth. Uh, this provider have expressed interest 
and is in the process of uh, working on the scope of work. And also um, there will be steps that we have to take, uh, including uh, seeking uh, DMC drug medical certifications, but uh, this uh, we are targeting uh, the start date of early 2023. Uh, next slide, please. Regarding uh, medical detox, uh, there are two levels, as I stated earlier, 3.7 and 4.0. Uh, both of them, essentially, they're very close or very similar. The only difference is that for 4.0, it requires a physician visit on a daily basis, whereas 3.7, uh, you do have uh, physicians available, but it's only as needed basis. But they're both considered the most severe withdrawal, you know, treating those with most severe withdrawal symptoms. And uh, the, there are still a variety of settings that can be provided in for medical detox, including acute care hospital settings, clinical settings, or in a residential settings. Um, here uh, in Santa Clara County, we rely mostly on our hospital systems to provide medical detox for our Medi-Cal or Medi-Cal eligible beneficiaries. And of course, our county three hospitals has been playing a, um, a critical role in the continuum of withdrawal management services. Here we wanted to highlight two very uh, typical type of uh, scenarios that uh, really uh, fall under medical detox. Uh, the first is when we have client or beneficiaries showing up or presenting at the emergency department as having a primary medical issues uh, that meet inpatient criteria, but at the same time, they also have a substance dependency. And because of the acuity of their medical conditions, they were admitted to the hospitals and then also at the same time, uh, um, uh, receiving, will, will receive withdrawal management services. Uh, this level of withdrawal management services may or may not arise to the ASM level of 3.7 and 4.0, but regardless, uh, their uh, substance use treatments were, were, uh, will be addressed uh, during their hospital stay. Uh, we have reported in the past um, to the board that uh, we have looked into some of the averages numbers that we see this type of medical detox here at the county hospitals. And we're looking at about averaging um, about 50, 48 to 50 a month um, uh, of these type of medical detoxes coming through our system. Second type is when you have patients that presenting at the ED as having a primary substance dependency and do meet the ASM criteria for uh, withdrawal management 3.7 or 4.0. These are because of their severity of their withdrawal symptoms that require hospitalizations and, and, and 24 hours nursing care monitoring and management. And so uh, for, for county here, we do administer, we have been working with a community provider and seeking a contract uh, outside of, of course, our hospital system to provide medical detox. Um, but we wanted to make sure that uh, we do continue to provide care coordinations because that's one of the criteria and requirement for our drug medical, again, DMC ODS plan. Uh, while we are not directly uh, covering that benefit, but still that we are required to uh, ensure that uh, care appropriate care formation takes place. So when someone completed their withdrawal management 3.7 and 4.0, uh, we do uh, want to make sure that these beneficiaries uh, will be able to receive their uh, appropriate level of care as they continue their recovery process. So I think this is my last slide. So at this time, I'd like to uh, turn it over to T. Lee, a Deputy County Executive, and Consuelo Hernandez, Director of the Office of Support Housing, who will share some information and updates about residential care facilities. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Edwin. Um, hey, good morning. Hey, excuse me one second. Before we switch over to you, Supervisor Lee has his hand raised. Did you have a question about this part, Supervisor? Uh, yes, this regarding the uh, <clears throat> the medical uh, detox issue, but uh, I just want to make sure uh, if uh, Mr. Poon has finished with it, then I'll go ahead and ask my questions. Okay. Um, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Wasserman, Kiwi Deputy County Executive. Um, you know, on August 30th, our report touched on some additional state funding 
for uh, local residential care facilities or RCFs, uh, given their importance to our system and uh, to our housing goals, we wanted to provide a little bit more information on some of the uh, new funding and our strategies. Uh, as the board may be aware, residential care facilities are non-medical home-like facilities for adults whose disabilities and health conditions uh, necessitate assistance with activity, activities of daily living, um, such as meal preparation, uh, dressing. Um, while RCFs can serve uh, as a transition from or to different levels of care, they're really critical for our permanent housing system and our permanent housing goals. Uh, and the gradual closure of RCFs statewide is really contributing to the housing crisis that we're all facing. Um, to prevent further closures and to increase the supply of RCFs, the county is implementing several uh, strategies. The first uh, we mentioned a little bit last report is we were recently notified that we are, were awarded six million dollars from the state's community care expansion program. These funds have to be used to support the capital needs or to provide operating subsidies for existing residential care facilities. Um, our, we're planning to submit the required plan to the state uh, no later than the end of November, and then we'll issue our local solicitation process uh, immediately following sort of the state's approval of that plan. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, in addition to the community care expansion program uh, to preserve and expand, we're going to use the CCE program and other funds to try to, you know, increase the supply of residential care facilities. Uh, here we sort of outline three broad strategies. One is what we call tenant-based rental assistance, using local funds or other funds as essentially a housing subsidy tied to the individual, but to be used as a residential care facility, thereby effectively providing some type of operating subsidy. Um, and then we were also pursuing the uh, financing, uh, the development of uh, RCFs, including perhaps operating subsidies. Uh, and then we're also pursuing the acquisition um, or renovation of facilities for that same purpose. You know, to implement uh, these strategies, the Office of Supportive Housing is currently modifying its uh, Supportive Housing NOFA, or Notice of Funding Availability, uh, its uh, Qualified Developer Pool, and preparing solicitations for several county-controlled properties. Uh, and then lastly, I just mentioned that um, the board may recall that we, through MHSA funds, Mental Health Services Act funds, uh, we uh, have implemented something called the Independent Living Empowerment Project, this is a project that aims to uh, improve the quality of services, quality of, of life at unlicensed uh, care homes, sometimes known as sort of unlicensed boarding cares. While that project is focused on unlicensed homes, I think uh, we'll be partnering with the, uh, those individuals, uh, many of whom have lived experience, to improve the quality of care at uh, licensed facilities, but also to expand the network of agencies and providers that may uh, participate in our upcoming solicitations. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back to Sherry. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Key. Um, I do see two hands up, uh, President Wasserman. Yep, Sherry, that's that's from the pub. Well, Supervisor Lee still has his hand up. Did you want to speak now, Supervisor Lee? Yes, I think it's probably appropriate <clears throat> regarding detox services issues. It's been uh, discussed already. Uh, so uh, I've been last few weeks. I've been learning more about our county's uh, detox services. Uh, and I'm learning that there certainly isn't enough oversight or performance tracking of the placements, uh, maintaining the wait list, and finding out how long does it take to place a patient seeking to be placed in the detox bed. Uh, when I asked a simple question regarding the detox services wait list, such as the length of the wait list or the wait times, we as a county right now really need to have the information at our fingertips. And frankly, this is very surprising for our county as progressive and, and careful as we are. After digging deeper into these uh, issues uh, and visiting the provider, uh, and I am now realizing that this is not clear of how our health system has addressed these detox services. First of all, I'm very shocked personally to find out 
when I visited the site that half of the 15 contracted detox beds were empty. And when asked why they were told, I was told that this was due to a staffing shortage. I know we sent all detox requests to the current provider, but I also want to provide some type of uh, oversight from our county to know how many patients requesting services have been turned away uh, on a daily basis. And then what is the following up support that we provide to those individuals? I would like to have this in the report um, as an agenda report back to the HHC Health and Hospital Committee during the November meeting. Here's really the central question. How's the continuum of the detox services being met currently by our county? As we know, as illustrated, there's a full continuum relating to detox services, and we only dedicate resources to provide a portion of this continuum. We have the level 3.7, 4.0 only as necessary in a hospital setting without dedicated beds. With 3.2 withdrawal management, currently we have one or two providers. We do not provide withdrawal management levels at 1.0 or 2.0 services that is known as outpatient or ambulatory detox services. It is somewhat appalling to see how many of these gaps we have in this continuum regarding the continuum of detox services. Therefore, I would also like to request the administration to map out the detox services being provided by us now in a flow chart to illustrate the workflows for how a patient could access each level of withdrawal management outlined in the slide 11, namely levels 1, 2, 3.2, 3.7, and 4.0. And I ask that this be provided back to us at HHC uh, by November as well. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I uh, before I ask my question, I would be interested in knowing if the staff has a response to Supervisor Lee, because it could impact my questions. Okay, Sherry. Um, I'm actually going to have, I believe Edwin's going to respond to the to Supervisor Lee's comment. Edwin. Sure, yes, and and um, so a couple, couple of comments uh, to uh, uh, Supervisor Lee, your, your, your questions and comments. Uh, first, uh, one of the um, the FTEs that I've referenced in terms of the expansions or addition of staff is, I believe, is with the provider that I think you are referencing in, in your comments. So we did uh, approve the uh, the addition of staff uh, for that particular providers uh, with the expectation that they will be able to utilize uh, all the beds that are available to that facility, to that providers to ensure that um, all the existing 3.2 social detox beds that we have um, dedicated to are available to our beneficiaries. And, um, and then in terms of the um, the withdrawal management of various different levels. Uh, our, currently, our system for the ambulatory uh, withdrawal management one and two uh, certainly would be happy to provide uh, a workflow um, as to how uh, individuals or beneficiary accesses. Uh, just, but I do wanted to give a, a little bit of a broader context of the ambulatory withdrawal management. Uh, they are not for everyone, and and just like uh, all withdrawal level of care, uh, it is very uh, much customized or tailored to the individuals. Uh, but generally speaking, for ambulatory withdrawal management, uh, it's really target for those who have really no prior history of complicated detox. Um, they typically don't have history of uh, complicated medical or psychiatric uh, conditions. Uh, they have a very strong supportive uh, recovery uh, environment and support system. Uh, they usually have really good transportations um, and really, uh, really uh, willing and, and ready to, to accept treatment. So those are typically what we look for in an outpatient uh, withdrawal management setting. So um, as you can, can expect, um, that may not really fit 
some of the clients and beneficiaries that we serve. Uh, but we also, in our DMC ODS, uh, also continue with care. We do have outpatient services um, that we offer our beneficiaries, including our um, um, NTP, uh, as well as medication-assisted treatment. So many of those outpatient environments really incorporate both treatment and potentially uh, withdrawal kind of uh, management elements of that. So from an ambulatory settings, uh, we do have those uh, services available to beneficiaries. Uh, those are just my, my few comments, uh, but um, uh, Supervisor Chavez, uh, I, I don't know if that's specifically answered or your questions, but also happy to, to, to address any other questions you may have. Supervisor. Yeah. You. I, I, um, I appreciate that. Here's a recommendation that I would like to make relative to these kinds of reports. Um, one is that I, I know the staff has been concerned about us continuing to ask for more information, then re re creating more reports, then re creating more uh, presentations at um, committee meetings. And I'm raising this because um, I think the, the reason, uh, and I'll just say this again, colleagues, that this is so important and the reason we keep pressing on it, it is probably for all of us, one of our one or two top issues is how we're getting our arms around behavioral health, drug and alcohol um, uh, addiction and what we're doing relative to treatment. So my request is that when these items get presented, that we have a very consistent um, chart that shows what um, we're providing today, what is coming on board, and what is the waiting list um, that we see in each area along the continuum so we have a better understanding of what parts of the system are underfunded. And, and actually, the other thing is who has access to these kinds of resources? And Sherry, a number of times, um, Dr. Tarao, I'm um, sorry about that. A number of times you have reminded us that we have a, a patient population rel relative to Medi-Cal. And what would be helpful for us to understand is when, if, if the patient population is X and the, the and we also have private sector beds that are handling you know, other insurance, that would also be helpful for us to know because what's difficult to understand is what should the goal of the county be relative to our other partners in making sure that X amount of beds are available for Y activity. So anyway, colleagues, that's just something I'm, I'm recommending because I think it would help us all track better and, and be on the same page, know who we're serving. And later on, I'm gonna ask a little bit about who we're not serving. Um, so anyway, that, that's, a, that's a request through the chair to the, to the staff. And I, I see Greta that you have your hand up Perhaps, um, Chair, may, may Greta speak before I finish my thoughts? Yes, and then we'll go to Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you, Supervisor and, um, and President Wasserman. Um, we will definitely uh, think about the best ways to graphically represent in some sort of a chart form some of these. I'll just point out one um, example of some of the complexity that we're grappling with in trying to figure out how best to present this information, um, which um, we'll continue to work through and and this feedback um, and Supervisor Lee's feedback is really helpful as we try to refine and get a consistent format so you can track progress through each monthly presentation. Um, one of the challenges we're having uh, with withdrawal management and um, Edwin referenced this, but an example is sometimes we have beds available through our withdrawal provider to which we refer patients, but they aren't accepting the referrals and there can be various reasons why they declined to accept a particular referral um, for a patient who, for example, is at um, Vapor EPS, who we'd like to discharge to that lower level of care. Sometimes it can be because they don't have all of the staff that we've authorized funding for available because of the staffing shortage. Other times they're saying that they uh, can't accept a particular um, patient given the patient's needs, even though we would expect that they would be able to take that patient. So I'd I reference that as an example of where um, sometimes there's just nuances and complexity to why there can be longer wait times that aren't necessarily just a function of do we have contracted uh, beds available at lower levels of care, but we'll think through how best to capture 
in the clearest, most straightforward way possible, some of that um, type of challenge and uh, some of the progress that we're trying to make. I read. I didn't mean to interrupt. Did you finish? I did, and and uh, and 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 I did want to um, follow up on one other thing that that you asked about, Supervisor. But I'll let you um, ask your next question to and come back to that. Yeah, I just want to say that I think you raised really good points, and none of the points that you raised are are new. So this is something that really now for years we have been requesting, and I think the issue about um, what our our providers will and won't provide whether or not we're covering them from an insurance perspective, whether it's a staffing issue, all of those issues have been represented in the past and have not been documented in a way that helps us. For example, one, one question I would have given that, that I, I think the first time I heard about this concern was probably in 2016, 2017. One of the things that we'd requested then was that we take a look at the contracts that we have right now or then to determine whether or not we had the right contract partners, and if in fact we did or didn't, what was the, the, um, the actions that needed to be taken to make it more possible for people to accept clients? And so I, I don't say that as a, um, a, it's an observation that I, that I recognize this has been an ongoing issue, but the challenge for us is without properly denoting the trends, we are unable as a, as a policy body make recommendations. Instead, we're kind of on the receiving end of still not having the information that we need. Um, so I, I, I understand that. I think you raise excellent points. I, I would just ask that, you know, that where we have significant trends, that, that those be of the presentation, and I'll just recognize this as it relates to the detox. For some time now, recognizing that we offer medical detox now, and we're offering it in a, in a very expensive environment. And that may be the only environment because we have providers who are unable or unwilling or, and maybe it's a combination of both to take on a certain amount of risk that at some point, if we can settle that um, agreement or disagreement, move into providing the services in a more robust way at the county hospital until we can make that pivot as appropriate and based on whatever we learn. I'm very interested in us having that um, discussion, but I think the points that Supervisor Lee raised are just of really significant concern because again, these are, are issues that um, have been bubbling up now for quite, quite some time. And so I, I will just restate that I think um, having a, a, a clear framework, would just it will just offer all of us an opportunity to be more Productive, and I find I think feel like we would be chasing our tails somewhat less. My question on my last question, just on this section, is: um, Are we speaking mostly of medical patients? And if somebody is an un uh, is a insured from another insurance product or uninsured, are they covered through the programs that we just talked about? Greta, Sherry, Edwin. Go ahead, Sherry. Uh, we are speaking of uh, Medi-Cal and uninsured beneficiaries. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. And Supervisor, if I could just ask one follow-up question related to Supervisor Lee's request, which is um, for the a more detailed um, report back to come related to uh, some of the withdrawal issues to HHC. I just wanted to make sure I understood whether the preference was, uh, since he, he had requested a November report back, we will be doing the full board monthly presentation on these topics also in November. So we can okay. include that in the presentation to the full board and in November, or we could instead report to um, separately to HHC. And I just wanted to make sure I, I knew, given that we're doing monthly reports on these topics now, which was the board's preference. Thank you. And Supervisor Lee is nodding yes, Greta. OK, we understand to come back to the full board with that information yeah. then. Yes. Vice President Ellenberg. Greta just confirmed. I know that Supervisor Lee initially asked for this to come to HHC, but I appreciate the continuous thread with the full board. So thank you. 
Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is still raised. It's down. Greta, your hand is raised. It's down. All right. Sure, you want to continue, uh, wrap up your presentation, and then we'll turn to the public. Yeah, sure. Um, so our next section uh, that we, we will be focusing on is addressing behavioral health workforce shortages. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this uh, provides some information uh, just generally about the workforce shortage, um, that this continues to be a challenge, um, as we've discussed, around the availability of different levels of care and service. Um, and it is uh, related to um, the availability of a pool of qualified behavioral health providers, which has not grown nearly as fast as demand. Uh, many licensed clinicians working for counties and con county contractors are being hired by entities serving privately insured clients with less serious needs. Um, we also reference an article here um, in Cal Matters um, that's related to why California faces a shortage of mental health workers. Um, it's also contains some information that really highlights that this uh, workforce shortage um, is not uh, necessarily the result of the pandemic, but rather that this was already a challenge prior to the pandemic and um, was even further exacerbated following the pandemic. So this is something that we have been addressing for many, many years um, and continu continues to be a challenge for our system. Uh, next slide. Uh, so what are we doing to address the workforce challenge? Uh, the first uh, area that we wanted to highlight um, is something we've shared before, but that we did provide a rate adjustment for our behavioral health contractors uh, that would allow contractors to pursue uh, retention and recruitment strategies of their own, um, including increasing salaries for clinical positions and difficult to fill positions in our network. And then the second update we wanted to provide is related to co-occurring training, which we've shared in prior presentations. And this is really focused on improving uh, the existing workforce capacity to meet client needs. Um, in the description of some of the challenges associated with serving um, our Medi-Cal clients, uh, many of whom have what we refer to as co-occurring conditions, which includes both mental health and substance use, uh, uh, conditions, um, we are very focused on ensuring that our providers have the capability uh, to, to address both mental health and substance use treatment needs. And so uh, this just uh, highlights some of the trainings that we've already launched and our plan to launch uh, an enhanced training beginning in December of this year. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to John Mills, our Director of Employee Services Agency, who will share some updates uh, related to our partnership uh, with ESA to, uh, to prioritize and accelerate hiring. So I'll turn it over to John. Thank you so much, Sherry. Uh, President Wasserman, members of the board, John Mills, Employee Services Agency Director. As Sherry mentioned, we have been in very close partnership with the Behavioral Health Services Department over the last many months, um, strategizing and prioritizing efforts to accelerate hiring. The second half of this slide mentions some of the efforts that we have implemented to date, including increasing the hourly rates for interns. The department has increased the total number of slots for interns so that they can bring um, more clinicians in training on to provide them with career opportunities. We have enhanced our um, active marketing and outreach efforts to job seekers, and I'll speak to that on a succeeding slide in a little bit more detail. We have also been engaged with the department in specialized recruitments for specific prioritized clinical positions where we've been able to develop um, tailored job bulletins and marketing and outreach strategies to reach the um, candidates with the specialized qualifications needed for those clinical positions. As the board might recall, um, a few board meetings ago, we, the board adopted our recommendation for a sign-on bonus for newly hired county clinicians. We also, a few board meetings ago, had brought forward a recommendation to create a new supervisory clinical classification, and that was to address a need that we had identified with the department to create a career ladder 
so that clinicians could advance to management opportunities in the department and see a long-term career for themselves with the county. And then the last bullet point on this slide mentions the addition of unclassified positions. We had brought to the board, again, a few board meetings ago, a salary ordinance amendment that added an alternately staffed unclassified rehabilitation counselor to the clinical positions in the department to allow the department to bring um, clinicians on who were still in the process of finalizing and obtaining their certification. So once they met the employment standards for the clinical positions, they could be promoted in the alternately staffed classification. And we had a very clear um, trajectory to retain them as county clinicians. Um, next slide, please. So this slide just gives a little bit of data related to our progress over time in filling vacant positions in the department. The first two rows, the interviews in progress and the offer made, um, each month for those rows represents positions and it's just a snapshot in time for that month in terms of how many positions for that month that interviews were ongoing or that job offers were being made. And then the final row, the position is filled row, that is a cumulative number over time that shows the progress we've been made since April in terms of filling vacant positions in the department. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that third row from the previous slide is visually represented here in a line graph that shows our upward trajectory and trend of filling vacant positions. Uh, next slide, please. And then th this is actually my final slide. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, and apologies for the phone ringing in the background, um, we have enhanced our outreach and marketing efforts with the department. We've adopted a very proactive um, strategy to reach out to active job seekers. We've hosted with the department um, essentially virtual job fairs on LinkedIn and Indeed, where we've been able to have the department leadership and hiring managers available to candidates. Candidates have attended and been able to ask questions of the hiring managers and the department leadership about what it's like to work um, for the county and to work in the department, and those events have been very successful. We've also had um, proactive outreach via LinkedIn and indeed to active job seekers where we've been in frequent communication with them and walked them through the process and they've been able to answer their questions about working for the county and working for the department. And then the second half of this slide just shows and examples of a couple of classifications, marriage and family therapist and behavioral health services division director. Um, this data actually is a little bit outdated since we presented this slide because those numbers are now higher, but it just gives you an example of the number of candidates for each classifications that we're actively in communication with and then how many of them go on to submit applications to the county. Um, and with that, I think I am turning it back over to Sherry to speak to the loan repayment program on this slide. Thank you, John. And before we go to Sherry, I see Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. Uh, very quickly, um, right here, Mr. Mills, uh, looking at the chart you showed, um, the recruitment number has come to a bit of a low over the summer, right? Uh, we've only hired, I guess, what, four, three, seven people really for July and August. Um, I just want to bring that up to make sure that we are not slowing down in any way and, and we're actually getting more aggressive uh, with the loan program that's going to be discussed, hoping that we get more qualified applicant interested to uh, apply for this and that we are <clears throat> more aggressive to uh, make sure that after offer is made to try to get folks to, to join us. Yes, Supervisor, um, uh, you shouldn't interpret that as a diminishment of our efforts. Our efforts are ongoing and, and ramping up, absolutely. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, um, thank you for the presentation. And I, that's a great strategy just to go be very assertive and call people, so good job on just going in and getting them, thank you. Um, I'm curious about 
why we're not using the living wage standard uh, for for folks. And I'm asking that because it's a it's probably not a significant impact to our budget. Um, but I two things. I thought we had a living wage standard that we didn't pay people before below a living wage, and it does seem like that would be more attractive to keep people um, and then to be able to retain them. Supervisor, is, or is this referring to living wage for county employees or for contractors? Well, for the, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I might have confused the slide, um, but there was a slide that said that we were paying an $18 an hour minimum. And was that for contractors? Oh, I, I believe that was for interns. Yes. And are they, are those interns working directly for the county? Uh, yes. Yeah, and so I, I didn't think we had a below a below even for um, for interns, but it, that may just not be my appropriate recollection of the policy. But I so it's a question: What is our policy? Maybe the question one and question two is: Is there a benefit to considering the living wage standard for these employees? Absolutely, and yes, we can look. Um, at that more closely. We did bring some recommendations related to the county student intern classification series to the board a number of months ago where we did increase the hourly rates, but we can take a look at that again in the context of the living wage policy. For sure. We'll yeah, come I just back make... with a report. Oh, well, and I just want to make sure we're following the policy A, and if we are, okay. But, it, but the other thing is, I'm just curious more because I know retention is a big part of our job too. Like we're both trying to attract and retain. And if that is, a, is that if that's helpful, then I would like that to come back as you're uh, working with folks that you're bringing on board. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, back to Sherry. Where are we at now? Yes, um, thank you, uh, John uh, and President Wasserman. Um, uh, I just wanted to highlight two specific strategies uh, that we are implementing across the system for both hiring and retention. Uh, the first is the loan repayment program, and this is an update. Uh, we shared information on August 30th, uh, but wanted to share some additional information uh, related to the number of applications received, uh, the number of slots available, and the number awarded uh, with some additional context uh, for the reasons why um, a certain number were awarded. I think the primary uh, uh, comment that we want to make related to this is based on lessons learned from the first cohort. Um, our Workforce Development Committee has expanded eligibility requirements for the second cohort, and that county administration will recommend fully funding all eligible applications in the second cohort, even if they exceed the 101 slots currently allocated and all 37 applicants who were not initially deemed eligible um, have been invited to reapply, and that just recently opened uh, on October 1st. And again, this is related to um, opportunities for uh, $10,000 to be paid to eligible professionals working in county operated or county contracted programs. Next slide, please. Uh, the second update is related to workforce tuition. Um, again, uh, information is provided here related to the first cohort, number of applications, number of slots, and number of awardees. And again, similar to the loan repayment, um, we are looking at um, opportunities to be more flexible um, in our criteria for the new cohort. Um, and we are also um, continuing to explore other strategies to encourage recent graduates to enter the public behavioral health system workforce. Um, and I will go ahead and on to the next slide. Uh, this last part of the presentation just simply highlights other significant recent and ongoing efforts to improve and expand systems of care. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I will not be going through each of these, but um, we'll just call out some specific highlights. Um, one, that we have launched our local 988 number as part of the national three-digit suicide prevention lifeline network. Um, and this has also reduced the number of phone, call, phone numbers uh, to be able to access both crisis and services. Uh, so now we have 988 as part of um, our 
access to suicide uh, prevention and crisis services and our 800 number to be able to access specialty mental health or substance use treatment services for Medi-Cal insured and or uninsured residents. Next slide, please. Um, uh, for this particular area, we wanted to highlight that um, we have launched our Behavioral Health Navigator Program uh, Phase 1, which was launched in July of 2022, uh, which includes a centralized access phone line staffed with mental health peer support staff that have been trained to offer navigation support both via phone and walk-in at our Zephyr Self-Help Center and our Behavioral Health Urgent Care. Next slide, please. Uh, these uh, highlights include um, uh, expansion and improvements related to our children, youth, and family systems. And we wanted to highlight that we have recently launched our Downtown Youth Wellness Center, uh, serving youth and young adults ages 12 to 25. Uh, this is located at 725 East Santa Clara and is a partnership between our Behavioral Health Services Department and Alum Rock Counseling Center. And finally, next slide. Uh, Key Lee touched on this, but we wanted to again highlight the launch of our independent living empowerment project uh, with the goal of expanding the number of high quality independent living facilities in the county, uh, which will help develop core quality living standards for low income adult and older adult residents uh, with serious mental illness and other disabilities who are able to live independently. And with that, that concludes our presentation and we are open to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Supervisor Chavez, your hand is raised. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. And I, I just wanted to um, go back and, and get, uh, just to talk a little bit about um, 988. Um, and it's really good to see, I know it's just starting. So going from 15 to 10 minutes is, you know, it's we're just we're learning while we're doing. I, I really appreciate that that's going to be an ongoing challenge. My question um, for 988 is um, that if if somebody dials 988 and it's a it's an emergency, a 911 emergency, we're we're able to communicate directly with um, other facilities. I mean, other call centers. Is that accurate? Like our county call center, the city of San Jose's uh, 911 operations. That is accurate. Great. And then um, along those lines, um, so I I will just share with you that um, we, my office and the community have had a very difficult time getting PERT or MCAT or the right response still to the right kind of crisis. And I'm wondering if, if, you, if, if you could talk a little bit about how 988 should operate you know, eventually versus what it's operating now, or uh, yeah, relative to somebody calling and saying, I have a person who's needing assistance or clearly then what happens? Sure, so um, we have um, folks trained to answer the 988 call line um, and they are trained to one, um, evaluate what the circumstances are related to the person calling. Um, at times, they may um, be able to, to take the call and help de-escalate the situation just by simply staying on the phone with someone and supporting them. At other times, uh, there may be a need to uh, dispatch or deploy um, in-person uh, teams. And so there is a, an evaluation and workflow that the call answerer is looking at with respect to the nature of the call. And then they are following that protocol and then engaging uh, the appropriate level of response necessary in that circumstance. So, um, Dr. Tarrao, that, that so far has not been my experience. My experience to date has been that the response is very um, inconsistent and it's not clear um, to all, frankly, to all of our partners, we get bounced around between different teams when we make those calls. And um, when I'm making a call or someone on my staff is making a call, we're, we're, we're pretty dialed into the services that we presumably provide and we're not able to get folks dispatched or, or the right folks or response in some instances at all. And one question that I have for you is um, how do we 
um, what's the appropriate way to resolve the, the inconsistencies first in our response? And then second, um, and you know, I, there's also this issue about whether or not, depending on the kind of call you're making, whether or not you're willing to press charges as to whether or not our police partners or maybe even our own protocols don't allow us to respond. So in any case, I'd love to get your thoughts on, on that. Sure. Um, as um, we've shared, um, the launch of 988 is a new process. And so part of what we are doing um, on a regular basis is evaluating, um, you know, the training of the staff, being able to debrief situations that we learn about from the community or um, hear from uh, others who may um, have had a different experience than what we would expect to be able to provide. So that's happening on a very regular basis, whereby uh, we're working with our staff, um, evaluating calls, and being able to uh, train and retrain staff as needed. Um, and so that is one opportunity that I think will we'll continue. Um, the other piece is, as I've mentioned, um, working uh, through that protocol and evaluating the need for the type of level of response uh, generally with respect to um, the situations that we respond to at times there there may need to be um, a law enforcement accompaniment but uh, we do of course consider opportunities whereby our clinical teams can go out and evaluate the situation and then um, you know, de-escalate the situation in, in real time. So Sherry, um, I think of the times that I have called in my office have called that we have not received a, um, an on-site response. Um, maybe once out of all the times that we've called and what, what I'm really wondering is hurt MCAT trust I all of the all of the um, all of the things that I I am wondering what our our real expectation should be for those services and how how we have something that's more um, a more blanket evaluation in real time so that we can further refine what is working, what's not working, and, and, and how to properly prepare the public to know what to expect. And, um, and I'm, I'm particularly mindful that, um, I'm, I'm mindful of this for a couple of reasons, but, but I think that we have to have a different approach to our evaluation so that we're looking at all calls for service and all dispositions for those calls for service, at least for some period of time until we get all the protocols put in place. So um, that would be my request through Dr. Smith to um, to the staff, um, because I, I just think we're, I, I appreciate that there's a lot of new programming going on and that, but I, I don't think, um, I think it has to be all encompassing until we get it, get it together. Thoughts sure, I appreciate, that? yeah, your comment, Supervisor. Um, I think that's a good suggestion. The other um, point I wanted to raise is um, the 988 calls that um, may be uh, called into in our county, if they're not answered within a certain period of time or a certain number of rings can actually roll over to other um, sites across the state that are answering 988 calls. So we call that rollover call. So when they're not answered, here locally within a certain period of time, they roll over. So what we're doing with the state agency that is responsible for training all 13 sites across the county is to one, uh, to your point, you know, evaluate the nature of the calls that are coming in, how they're being responded to, but also to be able to address more specifically in our county, the resources that are available in Santa Clara County and to be able to make that information available, even if the call rolls over, for example, to Sacramento. So those are some of the other things that we are continuing to work on um, as we roll out 988. Here, that's really helpful. And then here's my second question. 
we had a couple of years ago um, given direction to have the contracts with our behavioral health partners restructured so that we had proactive outreach happening in different areas of the county, one of them being downtown San Jose. And the idea there was to um, be doing outreach to people actively to try to get them to voluntarily take services, build relationships. That's, in fact, maybe it was a little bit longer ago than that. Um, and one of the things I had requested was that we get a monthly um, uh, report that just said, here's how many staff we have doing it, here's how many people they've talked to, here's how many folks they were able to voluntarily get into service. I have never seen that. I don't know who the contracts are with. And so I'm curious about who those contractors are and um, and what the what the effectiveness of them is. Sure, so we did in fact, um, add funding uh, that would allow for um, outreach and engagement with our intensive treatment providers. Um, and so we can certainly come back and provide an update um, as you're suggesting Supervisor Chavez related to the outcome of those, um, those adjustments to the programs and um, how that's working in the community. And, um, and what I had asked for again a couple of years ago was that that come back to us monthly so that we understand whether or not that was an effective strategy. Who are the contractors that are doing that work? Do you, do you know off the top of your head? Um, I wouldn't be able to just name all of them. Okay. So I, I think because I, I think this is actually the maybe the third time I've asked for this publicly too. So I, I'd be interested in getting this information like within a few days because I think we, we just need to know the contractors and their and their, get their report, even if they report that directly go to you. Thank you, colleagues, and thank you, Dr. Terrell. Thank you. Dave, let's hear from the public, and then we're going to break for lunch from uh, 1230 to 1. Next speaker is Sandra Asher. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, good afternoon. Sandra Asher. I am a board member at Parents Helping Parents and Community Solutions, although today I am speaking uh, on my own accord and not as a member uh, or representative of the agencies. And apparently I'm what's standing between you and lunch, so I'll try to be quick. Um, first, I appreciate all of the work that our Behavioral Services Department is doing to provide needed care in our community. But I have two issues I wanted to point out based on hearing the report. The first, um, and Supervisor Chavez alluded to some of this, is that are we looking at our total capacity and are we truly expanding our capacity in this in this area or are we just moving the shells around and what i mean by that is are we ensuring our privately insured um, members of the society also have equal access if we're taking those beds to fund county beds then we're not truly improving our capacity. And as a parent who had to send their child out of state because of lack of capacity, who has friends who had to send uh, children up to like Santa Rosa for psychiatric hospitalization, we really need to be looking at the total number of beds and not just robbing Peter to pay Paul. The second uh, issue I wanted to bring up was around 988. And I know it's a new service. However, I am concerned that not all calls placed locally get routed to 988. As an example, my son, because he spent time in Utah, his mobile phone prefix is a Utah number. So if he calls 988 locally, my under, uh, if he's in a mental health crisis and needs that support, my understanding is he will not get routed to our local 988 service. And I don't have a solution for that. Um, but having worked for a wireless uh, company in the past, I'm sure they can determine which cell tower he's pinging and be able to route it appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. And all speakers are entitled to their two minutes. The board isn't going anywhere until we hear from all the speakers. Next speaker is Uday Kapoor. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Uday Kapoor, President, NAMI, Santa Clara County, although I'm speaking for myself. Again, thank you so much, uh, Sherry and everyone for fantastic uh, service and all that you have done and all that you're doing. I really appreciate it. And I wanted to um, repeat what um, I have been saying in the past, which is that we definitely need crisis and acute beds and services, but I think we need to also look at the subacute 
and residential care facilities for sustained care for people that don't need crisis services. And there, I think we need, I would say, hundredfold service, hundredfold capacity than what we have now. We don't have a system in place to track and to really know what our needs are. But I'm, I'm submitting that I think we are woefully short of residential care facilities. But in spite of that, I really appreciate what Keely is doing and I think the, his uh, thoughts that he put together make a lot of sense and I really support that. But again, we need that scale, the massive scale. Also uh, appreciate the ILEP support because I think that's what we worked on for years, you know, as Community Living Coalition. And it's good to see that happening, but I think I'm part of the work team and a uh, lot happening. The other submission I'd like to make is that not only uh, co-occurring issues of substance use and mental health, uh, but also mental illness, but also co-occurring issues of mental illness and intellectual disability. That's an area that has been ignored a lot. And I think that's something I would like to submit and I'm playing some key role in that area if somebody would like to talk to me about. So thank you again very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Lori Catcher. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Lori Catcher. I am a resident living in District 2, um, and I'm also a mother of three um, young adult children. And I first just all as well want to give a sincere thanks to all of our behavioral health and mental health care workers in our county. Um, I so appreciate that you've given your careers to bring um, healing and well wellness to our county residents. Um, and I can imagine it would be easy to get discouraged when um, there are um, so many complex issues and lack of staffing. Um, but I, I just want to, as a community member, say um, that I really appreciate you. Um, I also want to thank Supervisor Chavez and Lee for all of your wonderful questions and um, clarifying questions. Um, and Supervisor Chavez for really making the point that we need to be paying a living wage standard to those that we're employing. Um, I just think about how important these jobs are and for years we have not prioritized them just even as a society and um, providing people with living wage standard will allow maybe even my own college students to choose a career um, where they will be um, seeking to help people with health and wellness um, in our community. Um, and then I would also want to just um, highlight to our behavioral health and mental health staff that I think you have a board and you certainly have a community um, behind you. So where there are needs, um, just as a community member, I would say, please um, make them clearly known because I think you have a community supporting um, supporting you and, and that would get behind um, saying, yes, let's please fund these needs for our county. Finally, um, in on September 23rd, there was an NPR segment that I just want to draw your attention to on uh, the segment called Invisibilia, and it's a um, episode called Therapy Ghostbusters that highlights Santa Clara County and Gardner Health and the needs there. And I just uh, suggest everyone hearing it. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Catherine Hedges. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Catherine Hedges, registered voter District 2. Um, I'm a member of a lot of local housing, um, affordable housing organizations, but I'm not speaking for them. I agree with everything the previous speaker said, and I also noticed um, the use of housing vouchers to fund residential treatment. And it seems like um, that's stealing from Peter to pay Paul because you're taking housing vouchers away from other people who need them. We have a very limited supply of Section 8 vouchers and using them to subsidize a treatment facility means that somebody else is out on the street at risk of death because they couldn't get that housing. Now, I don't know if the people get to carry this um, housing voucher with them when they leave treatment, so we're just giving them housing early, or if the treat or if the voucher stays with the facility. But if the voucher stays with the facility, that's a misuse of uh, our limited supply of federal housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you, David. I'm going to recognize Supervisor Smitty and then Vice President Elbert. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I really just wanted to associate myself with Supervisor Chavez's comments about 988. Um, I thought they were uh, points well taken and want to just add uh, a me too on that. I'm guessing Supervisor Chavez remembers all too painfully the time we spent uh, on the CAN Center together uh, trying to uh, drive down the wait times on on that. And I think, you know, the silver lining in that experience was that the staff proved it could be done. If the will was there, uh, it could be done. So uh, I, I'm in alignment with her comments about 988. And um, I think people are understanding that it's a new endeavor, uh, but that um, uh, I share her sense of urgency about trying to uh, refine the system, improve the system as quickly as we uh, possibly can. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Hellenburg. Thank you so much, and and I will I will pile on as well. Um, something that that I've noticed and just want to want to sunshine again is that there's sometimes a disconnect between what we believe that we're providing and say that we're providing and how it's actually accessed uh, by users. So I think that the information that was heard today is critical. And I think that it's important as well for us to have a way to continue to get feedback on the efficacy of the 988 system as it is billed out. So my my ask to, to any of the public that's listening today is to please let uh, let one of the the board members know um, of your experience with with nine and eight to the extent that you're comfortable doing so. Did it work? Did you get the help that you needed? Where were you routed? Were there glitches? Um, it, it's it, this is a tough system I know to build out, but I think we can only be as good as the as the feedback. So that is my uh, request to the public. Um, I'm in agreement with all of my colleagues around the urgency of this work. I'd like to make just a general comment and then um, offer uh, some direction in the form of a, of a motion. Am I correct that there's not a motion on the table? Correct. Okay. Um, so <laughs> treatment, treatment for people with severe mental illnesses and substance use disorders are core county services that we're required to provide. And of course, inaction or backlogs in our system of care results in the suffering of residents and their families on a really significant scale, including preventable deaths due to suicide and drug overdoses. Uh, I really appreciate the report today uh, by Dr. Terrell and her team. I appreciate the ambitious goal that was set by administration in our uh, May and August reports to add 500 beds across the behavioral health system of care by 2025. Some of those beds are in process as noted in today's report, but the biggest portion of those beds, 214, are slated for subacute slots that have not yet been scoped by administration. And, and for me, this was a really glaring gap in today's progress report and will impact our discussion after lunch uh, in the Capitol capital prioritization uh, conversation. I, I think if we have any hope of meeting the goal of having 500 more beds by 2025, we absolutely have to move forward with real urgency on a specific plan for those beds. Otherwise, we're gonna continue to have a really glaring mismatch between our stated goals and our implementation plans. I do recognize that today is an interim report uh, and I and I really am glad to see progress on a number of these items, uh, but I'm I'm going to hold firm on the expectation that all ten of the charges to uh, the CEO uh, need to be met by the end of November and reported out in December. And I will look forward to to the progress in our next update. And uh, as we discuss the challenges of the lack of accessible treatment and set down, step down care. I, I wanna recognize also that, that it, it seems to me that we're using some of the funds that we do have in inefficient ways. And as noted in the Harvey Rose memo in response to a, a 40 hour project request that, that my office made and that was discussed at HHC in September, 
we spend more money to treat people in higher levels of care like BAP because we don't have sufficient step-down facilities for care. And these costs are most often borne by our general fund. So to help inform how we expand our system and how we maximize the resources we already invest, I'd like to move that um, in addition to the, the information that, that I believe um, Supervisor Lee uh, requested earlier uh, in this meeting to come back to the full board, that the work plan um, amend the, that the board amend the current year work plan for Harvey Rose to take on an analysis of the county costs, revenues, and service volumes in our current system of care with the existing limits on, on available beds and analyze the impact of expanding beds at each level of care on county costs and revenues, and then to refer uh, this, this specific body of work to FGOC um, to work out a timeline for this additional project. Uh, that would be my motion. If, if, if that wasn't clear, uh, I'm happy to, to say a little bit more. I'll second it. Okay, then it was crystal clear. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Vice President, are you done or had additional comments? I, no, I am finished. I just wanted to make thank that you. point. Thank Supervisor you. Supervisor Lee. Yeah, first, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Corral, for this uh, very comprehensive report. This is very helpful that you have addressed so many of issues has been laid out on that uh, joint memo uh, on the charges. Uh, certainly there are, uh, gaps in many areas that we are identifying and hopefully by our continuing uh, hard work moving forward at this point that we'll be able to uh, figure out what those bottlenecks or gaps are uh, and uh, and certainly the, the you know, expediting like 650 South Bascom if that's something that's doable will be uh, immensely helpful uh, given the fact that the subacute care uh, shortage is so uh, glaring uh, this is certainly something that we really need to uh, uh, hit and as you can see this is not, there's no silver bullet. It's not like one thing. We're doing so many different things, at least identifying what they are and that we're moving in parallel is uh, really important to uh, help our, our county's uh, issues. Uh, certainly our COVID pandemic has only uh, highlighted where the, the, the exacerbated the problems uh, and that uh, in, in, in addition to the drug uh, abuse issues, our high housing costs, uh, and in addition to mental health issues, all of these you know, issues become interrelated. And that's why it is so important that we uh, focus so much on uh, on trying to find out so many different solutions to try to uh, uh, figure out these issues. Uh, to add insult to injury, the facilities we have like BAB uh, and, and Aaron's has, has been getting uh, older and older, and we clearly identify that we need new facilities to be built. Uh, the, uh, uh, Adolescent uh, and adult psych facility is uh, glad to hear that we finally have a uh, uh, dedicated uh, a contractor that we're working with for now. I really hope that we could really expedite that so that the intended deadline uh, that we've uh, hoped for could be met uh, at the end of the day. Very good job on getting the demolition done. The demolitions fast is great, and uh, we got that moving. That we certainly need to uh, uh, get to the the more important part, which of course is to get that built. And uh, that's all I have for now. And I just want to thank staff for all the hard work to bring all this to us today. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian. Thank you. I just wanted to ask the maker and the seconder of the motion if the work product from uh, the Harvey Rose organization that goes to FGOC could also be referred to the Committee of Jurisdiction on Health Matters, which is the Health and Hospital Committee. I, that that's fine or should we just bring it do, do you particularly want to discuss it in your committee or should we just bring it to the full board well if i recall uh i think it would be helpful to bring it through committee first um the uh the protocol as i understand it is and has been that uh items that involve potential recommendations from harvey rose go through fgoc Mm -hmm. Not clear to me if that's the anticipated result of the request you've made, but since it uh, the request deals entirely with mental health issues, um, it seems appropriate that before it comes to the full board, it get a, a, a good full hearing at the Health and Hospital Committee. And to some extent, this just goes with what I was saying earlier about, I think we need to be 
mindful of how we can best use our subject matter committees so that things come to the board um, more fully developed, more fully parsed, more more uh, precisely presented because they've already had a, a conversation. Folks in the organization have already had a conversation in the right committee. Sure. Th thanks, Supervisor Smidian. Um, my, my, my thought is that this isn't directly about treatment. It's, it's about the, the, the push and pull of, of adding and and removing beds at various levels, but I, I think it's it's fine. Um, I'm noting that Supervisor Lee sits on both FGOC and Health and Hospitals, so you know we're getting some of the same voices anyway. So if there's no objection by um, any of our our colleagues, I'm happy for it to go to HHC. Thank you. So you're okay amending your motion that way? Absolutely. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. You're okay with that amendment? Uh, I have no issues on that at all because either way I'll get to hear it. I, I want to hear from Supervisor Chavez if she sounds like you're going to get to hear it three times, Supervisor. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I'm in favor of it going through committees too, so that it's been vetted. And by the time it reaches the Board of Supervisors, where there are many, many, many more staff members in attendance, it can be handled as efficiently as possible. Supervisor Smidian, any further comments? No, thank you. That was all I had, Supervisor. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I'm I'm very comfortable with it going through both committees. The only reason, um, the only part that needs to really come through FGOC um, is that it, it is a financial issue, which is what the FGOC committee oversees. But more importantly, um, with this new added work, something may have to come off the work plan, and that's something that Supervisor uh, Lee and I would have to address in committee. So I'm, I think it makes a lot of sense for it to go to uh, Health and Hospital and FGOC for different purposes. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to say to the maker and the seconder of the motion is that I did request a different format for these to the the um, reports to come back just so they're very consistent and we can follow the um, the growth or decline of of different areas of work. So I would like that to be included by the maker and the seconder of the motion, and then. Um, I think that's actually all I needed from that, if that's comfortable for the maker. Absolutely. They yes. both nodded yes. And anything else, Supervisor Chavez? No, thank you. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. We heard from the public. We have no more raised hands. So I'm going to ask Dave to call a roll call vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you. All right, that item took exactly 90 minutes. We're now almost at 1250. We need to take a lunch break. Let's do it for 30 minutes so that we can resume. So we will re we will resume at 120, David. We'll take a roll call vote then to establish the presence of a quorum. We'll then hit item number 11 as we have several doctors waiting to speak. All right, see you all at 120. Thank you. Recording stopped.
Rhonda, are you around? Hi, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Thank you. Anytime. Recording in progress.
Blend him. All right. David, are you there? I am here, sir. Thank you. Would you please take a roll call vote? Supervisor Lee. Lee present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. You're muted, sir. Here as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, board members, we're going to start with 11, as I said, and our district attorney um, has asked that uh, item number 16 to be heard around two o'clock, if possible, because he has another commitment uh, this afternoon, and I believe the same is uh, with Vice President Ellenberg. So let's start with 11 at this moment. We'll turn to Dr. Cody and her team for a PowerPoint presentation. Good afternoon, uh, President Wasserman and members of the board. This is Dr. Sarah Cody, Health Officer and Public Health Director. Thank you, and Dr. Cody. If you could hold one second, just to sure. keep things moving along. Anybody who wishes to speak on this item, please register electronically. And when the doctor has finished her presentation, uh, we will then recognize you. Thank you, Dr. Cody. Certainly. So I will be providing you a brief update on both COVID-19 as well as MPOX. So the first slide, as always, I'll orient you to where we are in the uh, pandemic locally uh, since January 2020. Uh, you can see that these are our reported cases, and they have been slowly, slowly drifting down after this prolonged sixth wave that we are in. And the reported cases you can see are getting down to almost where they were between the Omicron wave and this wave of successive subvariants that we're in now. But what I want to show you next is how these reported cases uh, really no longer reflect the actual level of SARS-CoV-2 virus that's circulating in our community. Rather, cases reflect the level of testing, uh, reportable testing that we're doing. So let me walk you through this slide, which is a little bit complicated. This shows in blue the seven-day average um, case count with the population that lives in the San Jose sewer shed. So as you may remember, our San Jose sewer shed is the largest of the four sewer sheds where we do surveillance in the county. And it captures um, a little over 75% of the population of our county. So this is an apples to apples comparison where you can see, uh, if we go back one slide, where you can see, you can see and compare the wastewater and the reported cases in the same area. And over time, for the first um, uh, several waves of the pandemic, you can see that the red line, which is the wastewater and the blue bars, which are the case counts, they track pretty well together. And then um, this spring, they begin to diverge. You can see how the wastewater uh, you know, goes way up, almost where we were with the Omicron surge. Uh, and then it's come down, but it still remains fairly high. If you look just at the reported case counts, you would conclude, aha, we're in the clear, we're almost safe again. Um, but if you look at the wastewater, you can see, unfortunately, that it's not really the case. There's still a significant amount of virus circulating um, and therefore our risk of exposure still remains um, elevated. The next slide shows our trends in hospitalizations. And again, these are people hospitalized with COVID. That is, they come into the hospital and they test positive with COVID. Um, what we know is for this wave, roughly around 25% of those in the hospital testing positive are actually there because of COVID and hospitalized for their COVID. And so those numbers have also um, drifted down, but they're not down to where they were um, between other waves. So hospitals are managing and in pretty good shape, um, but I wouldn't say that um, they're totally out of the woods as far as um, needing to provide care for uh, COVID patients. In our next slide, uh, our trends in 
uh, in deaths over time. And I, I want to emphasize, of course, the good news, which is that we're not seeing these big surges in people dying of COVID. And in large part, I think that's due to widespread vaccination and boosters. Um, pretty much the whole population has some immunity of one kind or another. Um, but there's still a lot of people dying of COVID. And if you it just even look at the, the most recent wave, um, uh, I highlighted the last two waves, the wave of, of the sub-Omicron variants, 184 county residents died. And during the Omicron wave, uh, 320 county residents died. Um, so it still is causing, you know, and that's of course at the one far end of the spectrum as far as illness, uh, illness severity. So next, I'll just give you a brief update on bivalent boosters. Um, so as you know, these uh, bivalent boosters that protect against both um, the most recent um, BA5 uh, variant as well as the original strain, they've been available to our county residents for uh, just under a month. And you can see here that most of the bivalent boosters of the 92 plus thousand um, residents who have received a booster as of the end of September. Most of them got their booster from a retail pharmacy, uh, followed by Kaiser and the county health system, and then uh, fewer in the other, other systems. We also provided a column there with the estimated number of people that are covered um, or served by that system. So you can get a sense for how many vaccinate, uh, uh, vaccinations administered uh, per uh, persons served. Um, the next slide shows you uh, an overview, again, just in the first, not even four weeks, really just about three weeks um, of making these bivasal boosters available, um, how they break out by age group. And as you recall, they are recommended, the, the boosters for anyone 12 and up, um, but we are especially, especially um, anxious to see people 50 and up vaccinated because of course those 50 and up are most likely to be hospitalized or die from COVID. And you can see that the uh, percent of, of boosted people does go up with age. So people six, uh, about 11% of those 65 and up in our county have received the bivalent booster. And then it, um, it, it uh, decreases um, with decreasing age. So I, I think this is the last slide I have for COVID, but what I, what I wanna say is um, just a couple of things. Um, one is that the level of SARS-CoV-2 virus circulating in our community remains fairly elevated. We are in a very unusual position in Santa Clara County to be able to see this. Most communities can't see this because most communities don't have comprehensive and longitudinal wastewater data. So we are one of the places that can see it. And I just wanna tell you that it's still there and it remains eligible. The second is um, we continue to urge everyone uh, who can um, who is eligible to stay up to date on the vaccination. And for most, that means getting a bivalent booster. And while we don't know exactly how that booster is gonna behave, based on our experience with the other COVID vaccines, um, we are um, uh, confident that it's gonna help prevent infection, at least for a period of time, and that it will boost protection from severe illness and death. Um, and, and finally, I just want to say that with COVID, we really never know what's just around the corner and the virus continues to mutate and change and surprise us. Um, so I can't look to tell you exactly what's around the corner, but I can tell you about what we know now and what we can uh, continue to do to keep each other safe, um, even, even as we um, return to something that feels at this point um, Pretty, pretty normal, which is nice. So next, a brief update on MPOX. Um, the, the, slide, the next slide shows you that uh, as of the end of September, over 
thousand cases in the country, a little over five thousand in the state of California, and one hundred and eighty cases um, identified and reported in Santa Clara County. The good news on the next slide you can see here with our epidemic curve is that in our county and in much of the Bay Area, uh, MPOX activity really peaked in late um, late July, early August, and it's actually been trending down since. And right now we have a pretty, you know, there are days where we don't have any new cases reported. So it's really slowed down. I think a, a combination of behavior change and vaccination uh, has, has slowed down the outbreak here and elsewhere. And that's really, really good news. The next slide shows you um, vaccinations, both what the first and second doses look like in our county. Over 7,000 residents have received at least one dose of MPOX vaccine, and a little over 3,000 have received uh, two doses. And of course, we continue to do um, outreach and education to bring eligible people in for vaccine. And I'll close with just an update on our MPOX vaccine eligibility. Last week, we expanded eligibility to include three new groups, um, and they're italicized in bold at the top. And these three groups are, regardless of gender or sexual orientation, um, any sexually active person living with HIV or AIDS, we encourage to get vaccinated, as well as anyone uh, taking pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, and anyone diagnosed with syphilis or gonorrhea in the last year, just as an indicator of um, increased sexual risk, we encourage to come get vaccinated. So I'll, uh, um, I guess one final thing that I will say just to, um, uh, just to illustrate that I think that the MPOX outbreak is coming under control is that over the next uh, few weeks, we're gonna move from a, um, uh, an emergency response activation in the public health department to folding the work of responding to monkeypox uh, into one of our programs, into the, um, uh, sexual health and harm reduction program with uh, staff that have expertise in uh, managing sexually transmitted diseases. So that's good news as well. And I'll close there and happy to uh, answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Cody. I appreciate that. I don't see any hands raised at the moment. So David, I'm going to turn to you and allow each of our speakers to speak. All right. One moment, please, while we get the timer up. Thank you. Next speaker is Catherine Hedges. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Um, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Hedges. Um, and I'm a registered disabled voter in District 2. And I just want to say that I'm really concerned that everyone is acting like the pandemic is over. We can go everywhere without masks. We can be indoors without masks. Um, well, there's still high levels of COVID circulating as shown by the wastewater data. And this is especially concerning for people with disabilities who will be affected more by COVID than the average person and all the unvaccinated people who may get a worse case. And a lot of people are underestimating long COVID, even though pretty much everyone I know who's had COVID has at least some kind of prolonged recovery period where they're just not up to their uh, normal activities of daily living, brain fog, fatigue, that kind of thing. And um, I hear more and more in the research about long-term problems like blood clots, causing strokes, causing lung problems, causing heart problems. And I just feel like people are not taking COVID seriously enough at this stage of the pandemic. We still have a pandemic and pretending that COVID isn't there isn't gonna make COVID stop infecting people or causing long COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, next speaker is Bren Perez. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Um, I have a question regarding the memo sent by the um, chief operating officer regarding the updated county 
vaccination policy in the memo states COVID-19 vaccine means a vaccine authorized or approved to prevent COVID-19 by the Federal Food and Drug Administration, including by way of emergency use authorization. The COVID-19 vaccine never prevented COVID-19. This was the basis of putting people on leave and enforcing these mandates. And it was done under the false claims. So how can you continue with the original vaccine mandate if it doesn't prevent COVID-19 and it doesn't even do anything against the new variants? I would like to, um, that question answered. I also have a question regarding the masks with Smith stating the masks only protect the wearer. Then how can you continue to enforce a mask mandate is um, good conscious. Uh, the COVID-19 vaccine states that it prevents COVID-19 by way of an emergency. So what emergency do we still have here? As we still um, under the local emergency related to COVID-19, and I'm not talking about the California state of emergency. What I'm talking about is Santa Clara local emergency related to COVID-19. Do you guys still have us under a local emergency? And if so, why? What emergency do we still have? Many of the border supervisors from our um, bordering counties counties have uh, terminated the local COVID-19 emergency, shifted to an endemic status and dropped all the mandates. California State Lab declares that whatever our local emergency is proclaimed by an official dis um, design by ordinances, such as the board of supervisors, the local emergency should not remain in effect for a period of excess of seven days, unless it has been ratified by the governing body. The government governing body shall review the need for continuing the local emergency for the next 30 days until the governing body terminates a local emergency. Thank you. Next speaker is Christina Lopez. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Christina, are you there? I'm going to ask you to unmute one more time. Hi, sorry about that. Uh, I'd like to ask to please align with California Public Health Order's mask mandate that allows unvaccinated workers to wear a surgical mask. A few months ago, Jeff Smith told the Board of Supervisors that the mask only protects the wearer. I am vaccinated. I had COVID-19 twice. I'm not in the high risk tier, but I'm still forced to wear the N95 mask because I didn't get the booster. California health orders say exempt workers can wear a surgical mask or an N95 mask. Why is Santa Clara County forcing people to wear the N95 mask when it's difficult to breathe? Like I said, I had COVID twice and I had the vaccine twice. Please stop the discrimination. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Happy October 4th, everyone. Uh, it's my birthday today, believe it or not. Uh, I'm 54 years old. Um, hopefully I can make it to 55 in this era of COVID. Um, uh, good luck to yourselves and how to address um, um, what I, I think will be a, a, a bit of an increase in COVID this, this winter and what you're gonna have to do about that. Um, you know, places like uh, Oakland City Council meetings, they're trying to bring back the public meeting process, but, uh, they're a bit concerned, you know, with coming winter time. Uh, good luck in that sort of thinking, what you have to uh, navigate around. It is growing less, but uh, it's still around. <laughs> so good luck what you can do. And a good luck in uh, starting to really want to uh, use, uh, as you're using uh, new technologies, um, uh, I guess it's called biometric technology, uh, a bit more often now, don't be afraid to talk about that openly in the public meeting process and what can be its accountable practices. Um, this is subject matter that, uh, you know, the surveillance and technology ordinance has made it easier so we can have these open conversations and, you know, we can have a structured conversation about uh, good practices. And, and from that, we can just have a more interesting, informative conversation as a community process and, and, and feel a safe place to talk about these issues, which is so key to our future about uh, sustainability and community harmony and good practices. Uh, uh, we really have to build this positive future and uh, we have the tools and structuring to do that now with, with good surveillance tech policies. I hope you can practice those things uh, into our future. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. 
Thank you very much, David. With that, I'll go to the supervisor, Supervisor Lee, followed by Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Cody, uh, for the uh, uh, good report. And also uh, with Dr. Smith, um, there was a question that was raised and we had this discussion as well regarding a statement you've made previously regarding the uh, efficacy of the mask only protecting the wearer. I don't think you, that's exactly what you meant, but maybe we, you could uh, clarify it for everybody because obviously caused a lot of confusion. Dr. Smith? Dr. Smith. Yeah, I was trying to say that uh, the mask was designed before COVID to protect the wearer, but it doesn't only protect the wearer in this situation. So my misspeaking and miscommunication. Okay, th thanks for the clarification, Dr. Smith. Um, and with Dr. Cody, uh, thanks for the uh, good news. Uh, let's talk about <clears throat> MPOX first. Um, case rate seems to be looking better, and then you've now been <clears throat> able to open to three more uh, potentially uh, uh, group uh, because of the fact that certainly there's still some, um, uh, I guess, the the potential risk factor versus the, you know, the cost benefit analysis, because I guess there's still a shortage of the vaccine. Uh, have less, uh, are we able to get more and more people getting the vaccine uh, um, appointments filled? Or do you think we can actually uh, speed up the process of opening to even further uh, more people who desires to get the unboxed vaccine do you see in the near future? Uh, thanks, thanks for that question. First, we have adequate supply given the demand. The supply issue uh, really was uh, solved when we began, when we transitioned to doing intradermal and were able to get five doses, whereas with subcutaneous, we'd only had one. Um, the vaccine appointments are easily available. The challenge uh, and the work that we're primarily doing is ensuring that people who are eligible for a vaccine and would benefit from a vaccine uh, know about the vaccine, understand why it's important, and can access it. And that's really the work that we're doing. That's right. our, our current focus. Right. So under the categories, I, I didn't hear, but um, uh, for example, those who are sexually active or sex workers in our community, uh, would they be able to uh, qualify under these uh, current guidelines? Yes. Um, sex workers and people who have survival sex or exchange sex have been eligible, I think, if not since the beginning, pretty close to the beginning. I can't, I can't quite recall, to be honest. And they are, of course, still eligible um, and encouraged uh, to be vaccinated. Okay, very good. Um, now, um, so yeah, great, great news on the MPOX uh, side, where the case numbers are certainly coming down. That's great. So, I guess the not so good news actually, I think, is the issue of complacency when it comes to COVID, uh, as we. Uh, currently experience. I think people are extremely tired uh, of wearing the mask uh, in, in public. I, I'm seeing fewer and fewer people wearing masks even indoor at this point. Uh, and that, um, you know, based on the uh, wastewater uh, sewage, uh, we clearly have a, 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 a relatively elevated number uh, right now. And of course, with, with people not wearing masks uh, and the higher virulence of the current uh, variants uh, out there, um, what would you say would be a strategy for us to continue this effort um, in addition to telling people to get a bivalent boosters? Yeah, I, I am concerned about the, the mismatch between what I see in the data and what you see in the data, that the levels of circulating virus are still pretty high, and therefore the risk of exposure is still pretty high. There's a mismatch between what we see and I think what the public understands about what their risk is. Um, and I, when I think about risk, I think about two parts. One is, what's the risk that you're gonna be exposed to the virus? And I think as we see, the risk is a bit higher than most people assume. And the second is, what's the bad thing that's going to happen to me if I am exposed? You know, why should I care? That's part two. Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely true. And I am, you know, incredibly thankful that we have the vaccines that we do 
and that we have as many people vaccinated and up to date as we do. And that absolutely um, reduces the worst of the bad things, right? Hospitalizations and deaths. However, there is still so much that we don't understand about long COVID. Um, and, and it's something that we are learning over time and rolling out over time. And, and we know uh, some of the risks, probably not all of the risks. There's still quite a bit unknown there. Uh, but what we do know is you're not going to get long COVID if you're not infected in the first place. So it still makes sense to reduce your risk of getting infected. Um, and, and so my strategy is one, make sure that we all understand what the risk is. Mm -hmm. And two, I still continue to strongly recommend masking indoors. And I do understand how tired people of, are of masking indoors. And I do understand how difficult it is to mask when no one around you is masking. Those are challenges that we have. Right, and, and as we know, um, unfortunately, I think the masking itself uh, at times has become a bit of a political statement to some people. And, and certainly there really has no reason to think that way. Uh, I always look at it as a way of looking at people being considerate because as we know in the Asian culture, when you visit places like Japan, even you know, 20 years ago, uh, folks just wear a mask when they realize that they're coming down with a cold or something, they're not feeling well. So that that is the reason why they wear it in order to not spread it to people on the train, on the bus, right? Where they have like a lot of people, uh, very crowded uh, type of environment. So I think, I think to me, it's really a sign of being considerate but I really hope that people uh, appreciate that and, and not take it uh, uh, as if that was some type of a political statement being made and people should should respect others' wish, whether they want to wear a mask or they don't want to wear a mask and not become a a, 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 a dispute being being raised in supermarkets or things like that because uh, so we need more uh, <laughs> uh, vitriol uh, these days in our community. Um, last thing I want to check in is regarding the... Uh, uh, type of variants. Um, and the LA Times uh, uh, came up article talking about uh, different uh, uh, variants that is uh, being studied right now uh, in different areas. Um, is there any one that you would like to discuss? Because obviously BA4, BA5 um, has been around, but with the, some of the decreasing numbers, some of the other variants might be uh, popping up of concern that you would like to let us know about. Yeah. First, I, I would say, as you know, um, or, or may not know, um, another benefit of our wastewater surveillance is frequently they can develop an assay to detect a variant. And that's a nice early warning signal to know whether we have one of these newer variants circulating in, in, in our community. I know that there are, uh, you know, because the virus is is continually mutating. There are a group of new variants that have similar mutations that make them both able to uh, grow and prosper a little bit better than the variants currently circulating, and also make them a little bit better equipped to evade the immunity that we might have developed from um, either infection or vaccination. Um, so there's a cluster of them that are behaving in the same way and they, um, I, I don't think we're seeing any significant levels here yet, uh, which is good. But as you know, um, often you can see little or nothing, and then they can grow rather quickly. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't have any, you know, any, any detail to offer at this meeting, other than to say that we've seen this before, and I wouldn't be surprised if we, if we see it, uh, see it again. Okay, great. Um, my last question is regarding the other vaccines. Is uh, flu seasons again, and so the new flu vaccines already out. Uh, so far, people have been getting that as well. Uh, you have not heard of any issues with people getting the flu vaccines along with the uh, bivalent uh, vaccine, correct? No, uh, and and in fact, I think the most important message is when you have the opportunity to be vaccinated, get vaccinated. So if you have the opportunity to be vaccinated. Um, to get your bivalent booster, if they're offering it, it certainly makes sense to get your flu vaccine as well, and vice versa. Um, we, we, of course, recommend both vaccines this winter um, because these two viruses are, are just 
among um, many viruses that, that tend to circulate in the winter. These two are vaccine, um, we have vaccines for, so we, we do encourage that. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Cody. Thank you. Mike, you're on mute. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cody, thank you so much for the responses to Supervisor Lee's uh, questions. Really helpful. I'm wondering, could you talk just a little bit about um, how we are getting prepared for both flu season and your point about us not dropping quite so low relative to people continuing to get COVID, how you see those two playing out and and then a little bit about timing on when people should get their flu shots relative to the bivalent shots. So with, with flu, we do have campaigns uh, where we encourage uh, our residents to get vaccinated for both flu and uh, for COVID to get their bivalent booster. We have some indication that the flu season may be coming a bit early and that it may be more severe. And that's really based on what we see happening in the Southern hemisphere and what their experience has been. Um, and so this, you know, the strategy of course is to have, um, I think flu vaccine is um, you know, quite available. Pharmacies offer it, physicians office, um, offices offer it uh, and many employers offer it. So, that I'm not, I'm not really concerned about access. And I think that we have plenty of bivalent booster. It's, it's really perhaps more having people understand the importance of getting their booster. So for flu vaccine, I would say now's a great time to get your flu vaccine. Um, for bivalent booster, it's a little bit more nuanced. Uh, and that's because it has to be two months since you had your last booster. So there are people who might not be eligible yet. Um, the other is that um, so many people became infected uh, during the Omicron, you know, what I call our wave six. And the recommendation is if you had an infection, you can be vaccinated two months since your last booster, but you're going to get the most immune benefit um, if you wait, uh, you know, three plus months since your infection. So there's going to be folks that are waiting. And um, and which is okay. And, and, and that may also, you know, sort of have to evaluate the time since you had your infection and any kind of activity you might be doing over the holidays that would put you at increased risk of exposure and, and balance those two to decide on the timing. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, Dr. Cody, when you say early for the, for the flu season, what, what's that look like? Well, the flu season, um, is always unpredictable. So we can see flu start to emerge uh, anywhere between late September, early October, and uh, you know, all the way through the spring. Um, generally, most flu activity happens late December, early January, but it can peak any time. And since we have not had that much flu over the last two flu seasons, um, I don't really know what to predict about this season, except to say that I think we'll have more flu this year than prior, um, in part because of behavior, less people uh, probably masking, um, and because of the way flu is behaving in the Southern Hemisphere. Thank you. I um, That's very helpful. And I, I, I wonder if, um, if you think that the reason people are, and I, I don't know if we track this, but do we track, or I'm sure you do, um, how many people are, when they're getting their bivalent shot, are also getting their flu shot? Uh, we do not have those data as far as I, as far as I know. Um, in fact, we don't, yeah, so we, and we have um, the, you know, influenza, both uh, cases and vaccinations is also, we don't have uh, clean data on that the way that we do on COVID either. So I'm not sure that, that I can explore whether there's a way to get that, but I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm more curious about this because given just the deadliness of flus too, I'm, I'm just wondering if based on what we've learned during COVID, if 
if it makes sense for us to start at least tracking the percentage of people that are getting um, vaccinated so that we better understand that, that impact relative to our hospitals and our health system. And I, I mentioned this more because as I think about the future and I worry about us being in kind of a, a constant COVID environment, I think that the, the other risks become riskier. Um, and one thing that I, I was intrigued with is during COVID, us not having quite so many people get so sick with the flu because of all the protections that were being taken. And your point about less protections and then the implications of that longer term on our health system. So yeah, we do we do track um, has, uh, severe illness from influenza uh, that that uh, those are reports that we get. So we do have a surveillance system or a tracking system to understand the impact of influenza in terms of severe illness, but not in terms of just sort of general burden of disease in the community. So so that is something that we'll be able to see. And traditionally, um, for many years, way before COVID, during the winter, we have um, frequent calls with colleagues at hospitals to understand how flu is impacting their, um, their operations. Got it, that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. There we go. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. I've got a few questions. I don't see any other hands up from the other supervisors. Um, Dr. Cody, could you please go back to slide page five? Slide five. The one uh, with the COVID deaths, is that the one you're interested in? Put it up on our screen. If sure. Please. I was looking specifically at the mounds that occurred December, January. December, January, this past December, January? Yeah, I'm just looking at, I don't know if you can make that larger or not. That's page we'll go back, hold on one sec. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. And maybe I missed it by a page, but it still shows. Uh, to me, this looks a lot like flu season as well. The November, December, January period, as you were describing the flu season a few minutes ago to Supervisor Chavez. So are you expecting the same rise to occur this winter as occurred the last two winters? Well, so we, we um you know, I, I guess I have two answers. The most honest answer is, of course, I don't know what, what okay. will happen. Uh, but but um, I would be surprised if we didn't see an increase in uh, COVID infections and hospitalizations and deaths this winter, because that's what we've seen the previous winters. But yes. I, I also really want to underscore that um, we've seen a far more impact uh, even over the last winter from COVID than we ever do from flu. So far more severe illnesses and deaths from COVID than we see even in a very severe flu season. Okay, you just went right into my next question. We're having, it looks like 12 to 14 people actually die from COVID currently. What do we have during flu season? Typically, people die from flu. Um, I don't have, I would have to get back to you on those numbers. And the reason yeah. why is because um, with COVID, we're looking at all ages that die. And with influenza, we generally hear about and count unusual flu deaths, so people who are young and die. Okay. Um, yeah, so that it's it's knowable, but I don't I I I I wouldn't I would I wouldn't I wouldn't tell you without uh, doing a little more looking. Thank you. I like I look forward to that information. Um, sure. I've got my COVID shots. I've got my booster. I got my flu shot. I've got my shingle shot. I got my second shingle shot. Um, it it seems like we're entering a new normal. Do you do you foresee a COVID shot? each year as a doctor's recommendation along with the flu shot each year? 
I, I do foresee that we will uh, be needing updated COVID shots as far as the frequency, I don't know. Um, I would be surprised if it was only annually. I would think they may be um, needed um, more more frequently. More frequently um, than annually for, for a couple. Well, I, I, I know that there was a comment made from the White House about annual shots, but I think it really depends on um, how the virus evolves and what's circulating and how well matched it is to the current um, the current shots that people have. Uh, that that would be a the best way to determine whether additional shots uh, would be would be needed. Um, okay. I also I, I believe that a few months ago we did present on flu data, so we may be able to look back on board presentations um, uh, for any any refresher on flu. And I also um, I can't tell you how many of our residents die of flu in a flu season. Um, but we do have nationwide estimates. They're they're pretty wide range, um, but well, that's... You know, somewhere between thirty and fifty thousand um, deaths across the country in a year. But I, I just wondered how the yeah. COVID-related deaths compare to an average flu season deaths. Yeah, and yeah. it seems to me we're entering a new normal. My wife and I get a flu shot every year. We've done that for twenty years. And it sounds like we'll be adding a, a COVID shot every year. I hope it's not semi-annual. What I do feel, and I'll just express for myself, although I think my fellow supervisors um, may share the feelings or, or be pretty darn close. I'm really, really, really trying to get away from this having to wear a mask forever mentality. Um, it, it, you know, we, we've done the, the COVID shots, we've done the booster. I just wrote down that now I need a bivalent. Bivalent? How do you say that? Bivalent. Bivalent. All right. Bivalent. Sounds like a, a warrior in Game of Thrones. All right. A bivalent <laughs> booster. And I want to make sure it's at least two months since my last COVID booster. And I don't mind getting the annual shots. What I mind is this having to wear the mask. And I just wondered what your thoughts are. If, if the public is getting a shot every year, like we do for the flu, we don't wear a, a mask every year. Your suggestion for the mask it is because COVID is more deadly than the flu? My, uh, the reason why I, I continue to strongly recommend masks indoors is that we have a level, our risk of exposure is such that we have to have several layers of protection. We've talked about layers of protection throughout the pandemic. And in addition to the layer of protection that you have from being up to date, um, vaccinated and then boosted. And I may add the only booster available now is the bivalent Omicron booster. The other boosters are, are gone. So that if you get boosted, that's the one you get. Um, but but the, the, this virus, um, like many coronaviruses, it it changes so it changes very frequently, and so the vaccine is not what's called a sterilizing vaccine, in that it's not going to prevent you. It's not going to prevent you from getting infected when you first get it. It significantly reduces your risk of getting infected. Many people never get infected, but it doesn't squash it. Um, it. It, it's extremely good at keeping you out of the hospital and um, and keeping you from dying. But then over time, it's less and less in, uh, effective at keeping you from becoming infected in the first place. So okay. it's sort of like a lowers but doesn't eliminate it. And that's why you have to add in another layer of protection um, like masking, especially when there's a lot of uh, virus circulating. Um, Okay, so, uh, I appreciate yeah, that, and I'll, I'm going to. I appreciate that, and I'm going to stay up to date on my boosters, and I am up to date on my boosters, and wash my hands, and and do all that stuff. I I just, I just can't accept the concept of having to wear having to wear a mask forever. Well, it won't last forever, but it's still here now. Okay. Yeah. Thank it won't you. Won't last forever. 
Okay, that's my questions. Any other supervisors with any other questions? Otherwise, we're gonna let the good doctor go. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Cody. And thank you. All right, and board members, as I mentioned before, let's see, that was item 11, just so I keep up to date on my agenda here. And I know Dave's gonna keep me up to date. What I suggested was that we do item 16 next, um, one that uh, our district attorney is a co-author of, Supervisor Chavez. I, I was um, going to ask exactly that, that we just hear the presentation from the DA and County Council, then hear from the public, and then I'd like it to come back to me. Thank you. Okay. We're now going to open 16. I apologize to the public for our jumping around. And uh, after 16, we're gonna go back to 10. So anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item, please register electronically at this time. And we'll start out with our DA. Thank you, good afternoon, supervisors. Uh, thank you for taking us uh, out of order. I, I appreciate it. I have with me uh, Assistant District Attorney James Gibbon Shapiro, uh, who uh, heads up among other things, our, our crime strategies unit and uh, gun related intelligence program and supervisor Marissa McKeown who directly supervises both those units and I'm going to turn it over to James and Marissa and they'll uh, walk us through the presentation. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Hopefully you can see my shared screen. Yes, we can. Um, thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what the issues are with gun violence in our community. But uh, before I get to that, uh, I want to note for all of you um, that uh, a large number of letters and emails in support of this have come in, especially in the last 24 hours. Um, last week, you got a letter from the Police Chiefs Association, and uh, recently you've now gotten letters and emails from a group of medical professionals, scrubs addressing the firearms epidemic, SAFE, uh, the local Brady United Against Gun Violence chapter, Moms Demand Action, the Silicon Valley Alliance for Gun Safety, uh, clergy members, uh, members of the public, and importantly, uh, two of our community-based organizations that work with victims of crime, especially victims of domestic violence, Community Solutions, and Asian Americans for Community Involvement have all written letters in, in support of creating a gun task force and, and the proposals um, that we're gonna talk about here today. So I'm gonna start with some data. Here in Santa Clara County, reported violent crime to the police, aggravated assaults uh, reported to the police and aggravated assaults with a firearm. Those are primarily an aggravated assault with a firearm is when somebody shoots someone else um, or shoots at somebody else, but it's not a murder because the person didn't die. All have been on the rise in the last 10 years. And this is part of not just a trend here in our county, in California, but also a national trend. And I'm sure you've all read things about the increase in uh, gun usage in crimes in big cities uh, and small cities all over America. One thing that I think is not talked about enough is the fact that here in our community, um, in California, in the United States, that uh, victimization for gun violence is racially disproportionate. And what I mean by that is that here in our community, that um, 12% of the victims of uh, gun violence are African-American, which is dramatically more than their representation in census data. And 63% of the victims of gun violence are Hispanic or Latino, which is dramatically more than their representation in census data. These uh, numbers about reported gun violence and victimizations are consistent also with what we see at our crime lab. So when police officers are making arrests for a crime and they're submitting guns to the lab for analysis, the number of guns seized on the streets and being submitted to our lab has really dramatically increased, not just in the last 10 years, but especially in the last three years. Um, the rise in privately made firearms or unregistered firearms or ghost guns 
has also been dramatically on the re rise in our community. And who's buying these ghost guns? Who's using these ghost guns? It's people who are um, have a hard time buying it from a regular gun dealer because they're prohibited from buying guns because they are a domestic violence abuser who's been ordered not to have guns or a felon who's been ordered not to have guns. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Marissa and Marissa, I'll advance your slides to talk a little bit about the progress we've made over the last few years. Thank you, James, and thank you so much to the board for hearing about the really important work that we're doing in this regard. Part of the reason that we know the data that we've just presented to you is because of the creation of a gun related intelligence program and it is our task to study gun violence to know not just what the numbers look like in terms of submitted firearms recovered firearms linked shootings which you can see have hugely increased thanks to the efforts of our program and the efforts of the board in staffing additional um, crime lab employees to do more firearms work but there is a direct correlation by the amount of human investment that we're making and the amount of progress that we're making. So as um, it is no accident that we have more linked shootings in Nibin after we staffed the crime lab to have a larger firearms unit. It is no accident that there have been increased submissions of firearms um, in increased numbers of cases. It's a deliberate effort that we have spearheaded at the DA's office and I'm really proud of that. And I, um, I think that, uh, there are things that can be done to leverage existing gun laws, such as utilizing technology. So we're going to continue to use technology, NIBIN, which is the network of shell casing images that allow us to link shootings and solve shootings and hold shooters accountable. Next slide, James. And this is one that we're particularly proud of. So in collaboration with our county council, as you read in the, uh, the proposal, and also the city attorneys in our county, and through ongoing education of not only the community, but specifically of our law enforcement partners, we have dramatically increased the number of issued gun violence restraining orders in our county. Again, this is not an accident. We in fact lead Northern California in our county in the number of gun violence restraining orders that we've obtained, but we can do better. Our colleagues in San Diego, for example, who have a dedicated gun team to work on red flag laws, have hundreds of issued gun violence restraining orders um, each year, and they're on track to have thousands this year. So um, this is a resource allocation issue and we can do better and we will do better if we have additional resources. Next slide, please. But these are really compelling examples. And my favorite thing to do is to highlight an example that just happened. I mean, we this happened to be one that we were, had uh, last a couple weeks ago, but we had another one today. So I'll talk about this one. Um, this was a call for service to a domestic violence incident and astute officers who had been properly trained on their options. Um, they um, asked about firearms at the scene of this domestic violence. Um, and thanks to the questions that they asked, they were able to get a domestic violence restraining order, a gun violence restraining order, and a search warrant. They were able to do that in collaboration with our office. And we were able, at the Gun Related Intelligence Program, to deploy ATF agents out to the scene to assist with this investigation. Um, but this was really a success of education and training. And it was also, um, again, not an accident. This was officers who had been trained to ask questions about firearms to take the extra step to disarm an individual where they easily could have just driven him to the jail and left it at that. So this is um, a um, manufacturing operation in a residence in San Jose that was only discovered because of the relentless follow-up and education and the focus on firearms and disarmament. And this is really what we are about, is about leveraging existing California gun laws to do better, to disarm individuals at the moment of contact and to hold them accountable by leveraging California gun laws moving forward. So in this example, we were able to seize over 50 firearms, dismantle a manufacturing operation and ultimately protect not just the victim of this particular or domestic violence, but also the community writ large from the guns that would have wound up in the hands of um, individuals who shouldn't have had them. Next slide, please. But we need to do more. So we're very proud of some of the success that we've had and some of the education that we've done. Um, but here's what we know, and here's the wall that I keep running my head into. All of the work that we've done so far has been the side assistance of very, um, very overworked police departments who are facing an increase in violent crime. You saw um, not only are aggravated assaults 
um, nearly tripled in the last three years, but it is nothing but uh, double digit increases year after year. We need a dedicated gun task force of police officers. I am humbled and delighted that the Police Chiefs Association agree. And what we're asking the board to do is to provide a forum to convene officers through a reimbursement program led by our Bureau of Investigations. And I am joined um, by Chief Reyes from our Bureau of Investigations. We're asking as part of this proposal that the lieutenant position and the commander of that unit be from our bureau so that we can help be a central hub to direct um, some of the unique investigations that we want to do. We want to support that task force, though. Back to the slide one. one uh, we want to support that task force, though, not just with cops. We need prosecutors, data analysts, and individuals who will help support enforcement, prosecution, search warrants, and consistently charging these cases. So um, the reason that GRIP has, I think, been uniquely successful, and why we are doing this through the, um, a leadership role at the DA's office, is because we are focused on every part of the gun violence law enforcement, not only from understanding and training on laws, but from specifically helping our law enforcement partners be smarter and more tactical about the investigations that they're leading, but also always focused on, and if you've ever been to one of my meetings, you'll hear me say a million times, it doesn't count if we don't have a successful prosecution. So all the intelligence in the world doesn't matter if I don't have a fileable case, if I don't have witnesses, if I don't have evidence, and if we can't ultimately hold shooters, trigger pullers, gun traffickers, and, um, and domestic abusers accountable. So it's really crucial that we have that kind of support in order to ultimately um, have accountability and legitimacy in law enforcement when we're investigating these really serious crimes. Next slide, James. How do you feel, <laughs> I, I have very, very not strong feelings about this. You should no. come to my meeting, supervisor. You would, you would know this is like what I do. It's like a rally every Wednesday morning, um, which is why, and I don't mean to shoot my own horn, but I will for a second, which is why we have so much support from law enforcement. Police officers, they don't, they, they really just, um, when you give them the tools to help do some smarter, more tactical investigations, they're finding things like this. Like this slide came from a search warrant follow-up on a case we were investigating. To be honest with you, this slide came from the guy who sold the machine gun that was used in the Oak Ridge Mall Christmas Day shooting. Do you remember when the Oak Ridge Mall was locked down at Christmas time and thousands of shoppers were held hostage in the mall because somebody brought a handgun that was fully automatic to that mall? We did relentless follow-up to identify the shooter with San Jose PD and also who, who gave him that gun? And we were able to discover a massive gun trafficking um, operation throughout the Bay Area. And that wasn't done by me personally. That was done by officers, investigators, patrol, and our team, all in collaboration. We reviewed search warrants and we filed cases, but we also um, empowered and educated our law enforcement partners to be able to follow up and follow the thread. So um, this is really important work that's not being done by any individual patrol team or um, task force currently, but there's a desperate need to interrupt the supply side of firearms in our uh, county and figure out where these guns are coming from and hold those individuals accountable. This particular suspect remains in custody and has from the day that he was arrested. Next slide. Gun violence restraining orders. You know how I feel about these already. I think they're an incredibly powerful tool this is a resource issue. The more we train on them, the more we get. County Council has been an invaluable partner in this. I'm sure you saw County Council's um, words about this in their proposal. Um, but um, the, every single time that we follow the thread of a threatened shooter, we're able to appropriately um, hold people accountable and disarm them at the moment that they make threats of violence and before they've actually committed an, an act of mass violence. The photo in this was from a workplace violence incident and, and a thwarted shooting. Uh, we're incredibly proud of that particular example. That was a crime strategies um, grip investigation. Next slide. All right, so this uh, is a um, sanitized link chart, um, but this is the kind of work that's done by analysts. So you may wonder why every time that we're talking about GRIP, why is it so important to highlight the work of our analysts? They are able to um, help support large complex investigations. And at a time where it's difficult to have strapped uh, police resources, we have to be smarter in supporting those through civilian staff, analysts. Um, you'll ask any cop out there, an analyst is worth their weight in gold. 
what they do is they review every knife and link shooting. They um, look into cell phones. They analyze um, call record analysis for our shooters and large shooting investigations. We're currently involved in multiple large scale investigations of shooting networks and organized criminal um, enterprises that are dealing guns and shooting guns in our county. And that is all supported by analyst work. Next slide. Um, but there, here's where we are underperforming. We need to get our hands on more guns. We need to be able to obtain search and arrest warrants for armed people, but we need to be able to disarm our prohibited persons. Every single week, the GRIP program in our tiny but mighty <laughs> program meets uh, with our law enforcement partners, state and federal, to identify the people who are driving gun violence and to always ask the question, how do we get handcuffs on them and how do we get their guns? Because these are people who are shooting at our residents in our most, um, in our most plagued neighborhoods where um, honestly, it is an issue of fairness and equity at this stage that we take these cases seriously and we hold individuals accountable. Um, but it is very difficult to get in uh, to these houses and it requires a dedicated team of officers who are doing this not as a side job, but as a full-time job, especially when we are enforcing probation relinquishment orders, orders from our court saying, hey, I had a guy in here on a domestic violence restraining order and the victim is telling me he still has a nine millimeter in his nightstand. Is somebody gonna go get that? Yes, we will. If we can have a team, we will go get that gun. So um, these are things that require a team of dedicated officers to follow up and to listen to victim voices and to have a, a ready and steady and specially trained unit to be able to go um, hold, um, the, it, it give life to the piece of paper that says um, you are not allowed to have a firearm. So uh, next slide. And then finally, this might be um, one of the things I am the most passionate about is education. I know that we're getting more GVROs because of the education my team has done. I know it. I know that um, our community partners wrote in support because we work with them and we're on committees with them. I'm humbled by Moms Demand Action, by Scrubs, Aki, uh, by all the various groups who wrote in support. These are people I know and work with in this community <coughs> because I think I said yesterday at, the, uh, at a press conference, um, this is not solely a law enforcement effort. We cannot do this alone, nor should we. Um, I've had the great opportunity to travel the country and meet uh, some of the experts in this field. And we know that law enforcement is a crucial component of a solution, but they cannot be the only solution, nor should we. Um, I'm here with a proposal that is law enforcement heavy. However, we have to work with our community groups. We have to lean into prevention efforts. Um, all of the existing patchwork of services that um, are there supporting and treating trauma and um, that are ultimately um, addressing the root causes, we have to hold their hand as well. So the fact that these groups have come and supported this proposal is an acknowledgement of the trust of the legitimacy of the type of law enforcement we do here in this county. And I am humbled by that. And we need to continue to educate and engage our community and our stakeholders. We continue to write reports on gun crimes and we continue to report out to you all. I'm happy to write any reports on gun crimes that you're interested in and come back. But the words um, that of one of our supporters, um, I just wanted to read into the record, which was Silicon Valley Alliance for Gun Safety. They said, educating the public about existing gun laws and firearm safety are crucial aspects of prevention. They improve the safety of all Santa Clara County residents if your efforts save only one life, you will have made all the difference. So thank you. <laughs> Next slide. I was just going to say, all right, Marissa. <laughs> I, I, do, um, I do think that you can probably feel my passion, but I know what we do works. And it's urgent. So thank you for your support. James, take it over. Or I'm going to cry my way to the end. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, I'll say that um, we're really excited that in the legislative file, we referred to an application for federal funds, and we heard last week that we were awarded that grant. So the uh, grant for just shy of $700,000 has been awarded, and that's an offset to the uh, funds that we're uh, seeking from the county. We're also really honored that our superior court has chosen to partner with us, the DA's office, uh, to seek a state grant that's due later this month. Um, that's going to augment and also offset some of these costs. And we're working with the Superior Court on that grant application. They're the lead on that. Um, uh, I know that Marissa has mentioned about ATF's involvement. 
Uh, one of the things that is uh, great about uh, ATF being involved in a gun task force is that uh, they have, where they've done this work in other jurisdictions, have uh, paid for the overtime costs of officers from the local agencies. So where we have um, the proposal that the county uh, pay the first $100,000 for police officers from agencies like Sunnyvale Department of Public Safety or San Jose PD to be part of the task force, the overtime costs um, were in negotiations with ATF. If the board creates this task force, would pay the overtime. And so the cities would be paying the difference between that first 100,000 and the overtime. And we are on the lookout for more grants and partnerships. I know you all know how aggressively the DA's office um, pursues grants. It, on your agenda today, actually, are three grants that uh, the DA's office is uh, pursuing. I think it's items 51 through 53 or something like that. Um, we are um, going to be able to pursue more grants when this task force is created. So just like when the Children's Advocacy Center was created, the fact of its creation allowed us to apply for more grants, which we received that then fund the ongoing work of that, of that center. Um, the, the last thing I'll say on this um, is that we have incredibly strong laws in California to protect our community from gun violence. But those laws are only as strong as our willingness to enforce them. And so I'm hoping that we have your support today to extend the work that we've been doing and to partner with our local law enforcement agencies and to make real and effective the strong laws that we have here in California. Thanks. Thank you. Supervisors, if it's all right with you, I wanna hear from the three members of the public and then come to the two of you, unless either of you wishes to speak before. No, thank you. All right, David. One moment, please, while we get the timer up. Thank you. Next speaker is Sharon Genkin. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Sharon Jenkin. I'm a volunteer community outreach lead for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, a member of the Silicon Valley Alliance for Gun Safety, and I also attend the Supervising Deputy DA Chris Ariola's Gun Violence Prevention Group. I'm speaking in support of Agenda Item 16, the Office of the District Attorney and the Office of Count Council's report on strategies to further combat gun violence. I want to applaud the county for its proactive efforts in considering this report. We support the report's focus on implementing gun violence prevention laws to save lives in our community, disarming prohibited persons, and expanding the GVRO awareness uh, help ensure our common sense safety laws are effective. In particular, gun violence restraining orders are essential and often underutilized tool in preventing tragedy before it occurs. And we appreciate that this report outlines proposed efforts to expand education, training, and awareness about this tool. Gun violence prevention requires comprehensive solutions. We're grateful that this report details ways that the Office of the District Attorney and the Office of County Council can work to meet the challenges posed by the gun violence epidemic. We encourage the county to support this proposal while also looking for ways to continue increasing resources for local community violence intervention and prevention efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Pat Nikolai. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Pat Nikolai. I am the chief of the Santa Clara Police Department. I am also the president of the Santa Clara County Police Chiefs Association. And in that role, I am speaking in favor of the creation of a countywide gun task force. I submitted a letter in support, so I won't rehash those arguments. But as the presentations have shown, this is a critical issue in the county and the benefits to the community from this investment would be substantial. All of the police agencies in the county have similar challenges, mainly staffing and budgets. Reimbursing agencies for some of their officers' costs will go a long way to ensuring that this task force is staffed so that it can be effective from its onset. And to close, if collectively we can work as hard and as passionately as Marissa on this issue, we will have this problem solved in no time. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Next speaker is Catherine Hedges. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. 
Um, good afternoon. I am a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice, and I'm not officially speaking on their behalf, but I would just like to say that being able to get this kind of cooperation from the community that you need for these investigations um, is definitely enhanced in a lot of areas by immigrant communities knowing that local law enforcement is not going to turn them into ice if they talk to them. So this is a direct benefit of the sanctuary policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Angela Torado. You have two minutes. Oh, it looks like Angela is using an old version of Zoom. Angela, if you can hear me, you'll need to upgrade your version of Zoom or try calling us with uh, either your phone or your smartphone. Um, I'm gonna lower Angela's hand. Next speaker is Cynthia Longs. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. My name is Cynthia Long. I am a system impacted family member and I heard the presentation and I was concerned that the numbers were inflated about thousands of people being at Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge Mall in a hostage situation. I would like, we, we definitely want to implement the plans in place, but please do not exaggerate the numbers or lie. Please keep the information, information truthful. Um, there was no hostage situation. And uh, I think there were only a couple of hundred people. So please, I don't know if there's a different situation that I'm not aware of, but I live near there and those were the facts. And I just want to make sure that we keep all of the information that we get from you guys, not exaggerated, but therefore truth, because we do know we need the situation that you guys have, but does not have to be exaggerated. So I really appreciate the truth. That would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Very good report. Next speaker is Leslie Zeiger. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Leslie Zeiger. I'm a District 5 voter. Um, and as I listened to this presentation, I really wondered where is the passion in addressing gun violence uh, from police toward um, residents of our county? Um, that there has been no accountability for police officers who have shot uh, residents of our county. Um, and uh, and that's really missing. Thanks. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. And thank you, David. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, colleagues, <clears throat> I wanted to speak to this because this is really a, um, you know, comes after a series of other requests that I've made of all of you. And this was from a referral that I brought forward in August of this year on the heels of getting the report back on what we spend on gun violence annually. And I want to just rem remind my colleagues that the Public Health Department's report on the cost of gun violence in Santa Clara County estimates that it exceeds $1.4 billion a year and the public costs are $7.2 million annually. And I just wanted to raise those numbers because it, it it really pales in comparison in terms of what we're being asked to invest in this really important program. The other thing I wanted to say is that I know that myself and other members of this board have brought forward all kinds of initiatives to try to slow down um, gun violence in our community. And what's really striking to me is that it appears to me that we have a lot of the rules that we need in place, not all of them, but certainly, but a lot of rules we need in place and that some of this is just properly funding the system that we have uh, before us. And the motion I wanna make is to adopt the framework that the staff has brought forward and ask that the, um, the task force and the, um, and the supporting resources that are necessary come back with fully funded as part of our mid-year budget and in the interim that we ask the staff to give us a, um, an off-agenda report that just explains how this will be implemented and what departments have signed on to be partners so that this will be fully funded at mid-year and then be part of our base budget um, ongoing. And that would be my motion and then I'd like to speak to the motion. I'll second it. Thank you. Motion by Chavez, second by Lee. Back to Sue Rose Chavez. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I just wanted to share this reflection. One is that, um, you know, actually, um, I think um, DA Rosen um, 
and then uh, James and Marissa, let me first by say by thanking, uh, thank, start by thanking all of you for all the amazing work that you've been doing. And I wanted to just say to my colleagues that part of what caught my attention about the fact that we have so many guns in our community and not a really strong process to collect them is that um, while we were expanding our work via domestic violence, I had a group of women victims come to see me and explain that in almost all of their households with their ex-partners, while they had restraining orders, had firearms that were not collected. And that was both terrifying to me, and we know already that when we have restraining orders, there is some reason to worry about the risk to the person that the restraining order is being put forward for. And what was striking to me is that we did not have a, a really concrete system in our county to take firearms from prohibited persons. That is really the issue that we are trying to deal with today. I want to thank the DA because at that time, um, you know, really some of the responsibility belongs to local agencies, some belong to the district attorney, and and a lot of it belonged to the state. And I just wanna say how important it is to lean in when we can see that there's a way we can solve this, this issue ourselves. And, um, and I wanna thank them because this, we wouldn't be where we are today without that. And then the other thing I just wanted to mention um, that I think is really critical is this. We don't have the resources we need in our county for either the county or the cities to act as islands. We are only going to be able to address this if we can combine our resources, our very, very limited resources. What I appreciate about this approach is that it is taking the resources that we have, adding a little more to them in order to make sure that we can leverage every resource that we have in all of our cities. And colleagues, the reason I think this is important is I think we're going to have to address many, many more issues this way. And I think this is a very good beginning. So I would um, ask for your support so that we can make sure that people who shouldn't have firearms don't in our community anymore. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, additional comments? Yes, thank you, Ms. Uh, President Wasserman. So first of all, thank you for the presentation from our district attorney's office. And I'm frankly surprised that the Legal Gun Task Force has not existed yet in our county. Uh, illegal guns are a clear and present danger in our community every day. And that's also the reason why I have proposed recurring gun buyback programs to try to uh, get these out of our community throughout the county. I, of course, want to thank our district attorney, Jeff Rosen, and his team, along with our public safety partners for making this happen. Most recently in Milpitas, where we collected 14 automatic assault weapons, seven ghost guns, and even one sawed-off shotgun. I also want to extend my continuing thanks to the DA and Sheriff's Office for partnering another gun buyback program uh, to be expected in December in the South County of the Gilroy and Morgan Hill Police Departments. Uh, and, and this also being led by our esteemed President Wasserman working with us as well. Thank you. Um, the question I have regarding, first of all, is the tracking the recipient of these piece of paper of folks who've been told that you're no longer allowed to own guns. The voluntary gun turn-in temporary storage program for them to bring into the Sheriff's Office should be made as easy as possible. After all, it is really hard to find someone reliable to store a gun for you, right, for safekeeping. And so I just want to confirm with uh, either a sheriff or our uh, district attorney, uh, we do offer this uh, for free, right, at the sheriff's office, correct? I believe that's correct. Yes. yes. So, I, I, so as addition to the motion here, I just want to ask maybe as a, as a practice, uh, to, to add that to something that we could produce as a piece of document to explain to individuals who receive this piece of paper to give them a uh, gun turn-in instruction so that they know that this is certainly available for them and that's what they need to do uh, uh, when, when they receive that note. So I think that would be certainly one way to uh, lessen the load for your staff to having to go over to the house to, to receive the weapon, right? Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a good suggestion, Supervisor Lee, and uh, we'll certainly make sure individuals know that they can voluntarily relinquish their guns and how they can do it. And if they relinquish the gun that way, then it saves us the resources of going and getting it from them. Yes. Sure. And and of course, if that's being provided to them, an attorney, I certainly think the attorney might be a good uh, <laughs> reminder for them to to do that too. So 
Uh, so I think that would be one way to uh, to help get rid of uh, a lot of those uh, uh, guns that's not safe in the community. I guess a follow-up question I have. Uh, yes, I will be supporting motion, of course, uh, uh, and I would like to see uh, when do you think you'll be able to come back to the board with the recommended uh, budget action so that we know how much we'll be spending on this? I think that uh, we'll be able to come back in about a month. Uh, we we want to go back internally, and we got a grant from the federal government. How how will how that'll be spent? We expect to hear in a few weeks about a grant that we applied for with the Superior Court, and then we'll have an idea of what we have in terms of state and federal grants, and then what we would need from the county. And so I think about a month would give us time to to know that and then sit down with uh, the county executive's office and um, come up with a more specific proposal. Thank you. I think it's a little bit into the weed, but uh, having a breakdown of the costs and reimbursements we're getting from whether through the grants or from the participating police departments will certainly be very helpful just to know that what our budget impact would be. Uh, and of course, my um, uh, goal, and I think we all share this, is hoping that we could get more funds and grant from the both the federal and state government to uh, continue the funding of the gun task force uh, in the future. Uh, assuming this will pass uh, in the long run, that would be our hope. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you very much. Um, this is a really important conversation around the, the scary increase in, in gun-related violence in our community. Uh, I heard the public speaker uh, express concern as well about um, uh, uh, gun related harm uh, from the from the law enforcement officers and while I, I see why that's not part of this discussion and piece today that's certainly something that that we need to address as well um, I, I appreciate the district attorney's office uh, seeking grants for the proposal and of course supervisor Chavez for championing uh, the item I definitely support us moving forward uh, with analysis of the proposal. Uh, I'm really pleased that the work is being done in tandem with the public health department's implementation of their recommendations following the public costs of gun violence safety. And when we look at the funding, uh, pro uh, when, we, when we look at funding this proposal for mid-year, I would like us to consider the proposal as part of the same body of gun violence prevention strategies. I think that this holistic uh, approach to gun violence is really essential so that we're focusing resources where we see the most impact and growth. Uh, with, with that in mind, I would like plans to move forward with expansion of the GRIP team um, to focus on funding the expansion of the unique analytical and preventative functions of the team and for any requests related to prosecutorial work include analysis of how we might reallocate or how the district attorney might reallocate existing attorney prosecutor positions to focus on this priority. I'd also like to explore where the proposed trainings to raise awareness of gun laws may be best, be may be best housed. Uh, the Behavioral Health Department and the Sheriff's Office currently collaborate on ongoing crisis intervention team trainings for law enforcement agencies in which the majority of the SJPD police force uh, has been engaged. And I understand that the public costs of gun violence study included recommendations from the public health department to carry out information uh, campaigns that, that, may be, that they may be best suited to coordinate. Um, so Supervisor Chavez, this is my, my question to you. I'd like to offer um, a... a, a Friendly amendment. Sorry, I guess I know it's a friendly amendment, a two-part friendly amendment, <laughs> please. Um, first, um, that the, um, the, the the request to focus on funding the preventative and analytical functions of the team and the request to consider um, how the pro, you know, I'm so sorry. You know, give me one minute because I am having a freeze on my screen here and I want to make sure that I'm wording the friendly amendment properly. So if somebody else has something to say, just give me a minute, please, to refresh here. Sure, I'll give my thoughts in in 60 seconds. I just want to say during my 12 years on the board, I've seen numerous gun buybacks, and I appreciate those that Supervisor Lee is championing, the uh, one he did in Mountain View, and the one he's now leading in South County. really appreciate that. 
I also know over the years that law enforcement, um, when people are convicted of domestic violence, law enforcement has gone out and got the guns when they could. I also know a few years ago, we subsidized that effort to increase going out and collecting the guns that were supposed to be collected, but we didn't have the person power to do so. Um, I'm gonna be supporting the motion. Uh, one, I think it's the right thing to do. Um, two, I wanna commend the DA's office and uh, James Williams for creating a team that I understand includes ATF, HSI, San Jose PD, the sheriff, DA investigators. It is a, a, a team and all of those team members are paying their own way. They're not asking the county to pay their salaries. In addition, the DA's office has gone out and uh, received some grants already and is pursuing more. I think uh, DA Rosen that you have an excellent grant writing staff as far as obtaining grants. I know you're also instrumental, uh, Mr. Gibbon Shapiro in getting grants that have supported the South County Youth Task Force. And I really appreciate your efforts and your expertise there. I think what this is doing is this is turbocharging what we've attempted and tried to do over the years to do it in a magnificent way. Um, I will say at the gun buybacks, you've got generally good behaving people bringing, bringing guns to get rid of them. And what this will do is go after the people, um, I'll just say bad behavior, that aren't uh, voluntarily giving up their firearms. So I, I applaud what you're doing and the way you're doing it. Vice President Ellenberg, do you have it all back together? I do. <laughs> <laughs> the two pieces, I love the, the reliance now on my equipment and was waiting for somebody to tell me that if I had printed the page out, I wouldn't have had this issue. Uh, but my my requests for a friendly amendment are first um, that the request to focus on funding uh, the preventative and analytical functions of the team and the request to consider how uh, prosecutorial functions may be covered by existing positions be included in the report back. And second, to receive an analysis from administration of where we might best house that gun law training work to reach the community and our law enforcement officers. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. What I what I would just note is that um, I'm I would also ask that if if there is a decision made to um, to use current resources, just to understand the impacts of those resources on on this action, and I I think that's the way to be holistic. And then the other thing I just wanted to acknowledge um, is that the public health department should be coming back with not just their prioritization, but also with, with what their funding needs are gonna be based on the report they gave us a couple of months ago. And so I think the point that Supervisor Ellenberg raised that I just wanted to acknowledge is that uh, as that report comes back, I wanna make sure that um, Dr. Cody's team is really uh, working with the whole team, including the county council and the DA's office and vice versa as this all comes back. Cause I think Supervisor Ellenberg, you raise a good point about just keeping it uh, keeping it all together, and that includes an emphasis that the public health department had on looking at community-based strategies that are in fact community-based relative to um, you know the, to um, addressing gun violence. Thank you, and right. Supervisor Lee. You're okay with this as well. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Any further comments? No, thank you. No, nope, thank you, Supervisor Smidian. Thank you. I just wanted to ask the DA how he felt about the friendly amendment. Make sure that it worked for his organization since they're taking the lead here. So in, in terms of the friendly amendment, I, I think that what we will know more in a month is here's the federal grants. Here's how we're going to spend that. Hope, I, I'm cautiously optimistic we're going to receive the state grants with the court. Here's how we can spend that. Or here's, how, here's what that will fund. And um, I think that the uh, proposal that we have is going to be a little heavier on investigators uh, to do this and the analysts um, and a little bit lighter on prosecutors. So I'll have a better idea about that. If, um, you know, if, if I thought that we could just uh, take our existing resources in the DA's office and do all of this by just moving some things around. I would, but you know, we have a, a backlog of something like 800 uh, cases to be tried and a lot of 
kind of stressed out prosecutors, not me. They're stressed out. Um, so uh, I'm I'm okay with the amendment. I think that uh, we'll be able to come up with something that uh, will satisfy uh, everyone's concerns. Well, thank you. And through the chair, I, I will stipulate for the record that the district attorney is always very chill. Uh, he's not stressed <laughs> out. Uh, but uh, the um, I, I think the point I wanted to underscore is on the one hand, on the other hand, just so you know, it's me again. Um, on the one hand, I, I absolutely agree that the kind of analysis that Supervisor Ellenberg is asking for will be important. But the bottom line here is somebody's got to go do this. Uh, and if they don't go do it, um, nobody is made safer. And uh, the, the slide in the PowerPoint that resonated the most for me personally was the one that said, we can have great laws on the books, but if we don't actually enforce them, yeah. so what? That's my paraphrase. And you know, I, the thing that I think is really heartening about this effort is uh, that um, we're, uh, if I had to put a headline on the referral, I'd call it, and we really mean it. Uh, that would be my headline uh, for the referral. And um, I guess the only other thing I'll add, Mr. Uh, Chair, before we uh, move on to a vote is, uh, yeah, it costs money to do this. This is money well spent. And, um, you know, I know this isn't a, a budget hearing, but when the time comes to have those budget conversations, uh, I, I want to be among those who has already given an indication that this is and should be a high priority for funding. And uh, that's what I got. I'm an I vote. Thank you, Santa Clara County Public Health and Public Safety. All right, let's take a vote. Oops, Supervisor Smitty, did I cut you off? Your hand is still raised? No, sir, it is down. David, hit it. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Smidian. Supervisor yes. Smitty. Yes. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go get them. All right. We now move on to item number 10, which our county budget director, Greg Uturia, will be presenting the 10 year capital improvement program priorities. Gregory, well, I'm looking for you. Actually, I'm going to do this. Dr. Smith, take it away. <clears throat> um, and if you're going to go with that, you should make that, that page larger. There you go. Hopefully you can see that now. That's great. Okay, um, the board asked for us to come back. Um, we were hoping for September, but yeah, as you know, we got delayed through um, other reasons. And so we're back in October to talk about the capital improvement process. So I'm going to go through it and uh, then we'll take questions. I want to start with the agenda for today. As we see it, obviously the board can ch change their interest, but we wanted to give you and the public an introduction to what this process is all about. Um, we never used to have a uh, capital improvement process uh, because in the past, all capital expenditures were done with uh, leftover fund balance. However, that's not the standard of service in the community. Um, this process is a process designed to establish uh, priorities. It's a living document. It changes moment to moment. It changes basically from um, board meeting to board meeting, but at least it gives us an idea of what the 10 year priorities might be. This is not a funding or allocation document. None of the information you'll see here um, allocates any money to a particular project or not. What you'll see is um, estimates, which are gross estimates of the cost of a project and then what the board has already allocated during a previous budget action. Budget actions happen, you know, year on a yearly basis, and obviously we can update them in mid-year, but I just want to reemphasize to everybody that the, 
this is a process to try to have a general understanding of where projects stand in priority lists. It's not an allocation process and it's not part of the budget. <clears throat> so today we will uh, review the capital improvement program and we'll seek input, um, which will be appropriate for the next budget cycle. Um, it's a multi, what the CIP is, is a multi-year planning process, as I mentioned. And the concept behind the 10-year plan is to give us some idea of the horizon in the future. Um, realistically, we know that with capital plans, particularly construction plans, um, things change rapidly. So you can know from the very beginning that nothing that's on the capital improvement plan is set in stone, um, no pun intended. And a lot of um, projects will either fall off or be deprioritized or changed within uh, various time periods. And a good example of this is the um, um, children and, and adult uh, mental health facility that we're in the midst of building um, 10 years ago, well, 20 years ago it was never envisioned. 10 years ago it was never envisioned. It got envisioned seven years ago. Um, and that obviously changed the capital improvement plan significantly with a uh, significant new cost. And you can say that about lots of different projects. Um, <clears throat> what you'll see here is that we have 71 projects that have currently been identified as either in the construction or design phase, 31 projects which are in planning or pre-planning phase. And I wanna add that as part of a reasonable way of dealing with capital investments, uh, we've the board's made the decision in the past to contribute $12 million a year to a deferred maintenance plan, which we also never had before. This is intended to enable us to uh, accumulate funding to replace and maintain uh, our buildings so that they stay usable. Speaking of uh, <clears throat> facility conditions, uh, our facilities in general are not in great condition. Um, our average um, five-year facility condition index is about 20%, uh, 30%, which means it's only fair, which means basically that it can, the facility can be utilized, but we'd expect that it would be um, out of service within five years. If we did everything needed for just our eight main campuses to get um, all of our facilities back up into a good or excellent fact, uh, facility condition index, we're talking about well over half a billion dollars and probably more. So we acknowledge that we're never, we're not never, we acknowledge that it's unlikely that we're going to um, do as much deferred uh, maintenance as we would like to do. Uh, we've had outside consultants making recommendations of significant new investments in deferred maintenance. Uh, those things have been prioritized also and they're in the prioritization process. <clears throat> I'd like to go through current projects. Um, these are projects which have had some allocation of funding by the board already. Um, education, housing, the hub, Tasman campus, 911 dispatch, the adolescent and psych facility, um, the service center, um, burn center at BMC, the child and adolescent center at O'Connor, seismic safety projects at BMC and the other two hospitals. TV clinic and pharmacy, DePaul improvements, and a various other small projects. 
excuse me, sorry. Um, on your, <clears throat> excuse me, in your packet, the uh, PowerPoint that you had there was a uh, previous PowerPoint. It's been updated. Sorry for the confusion. This is the new one. Uh, so plan projects, which have um, been funded basically to do planning to some extent, include the emergency room department expansion at VMC. Um, obviously, the board knows about the uh, concern about uh, jail replacement and or a site facility for inmates. Um, <clears throat> This is a issue that has been um, discussed in quite some detail. And because the project included demolishing uh, Main Jail South, there's been money expended in the project, but obviously none of the complete project will be able to be done without additional funding. Um, and a decision needs to be made about what and how to do that. Silver Creek Campus, Voters Warehouse, Mascom Station for replacement of our clinics in Central uh, County, VHP moving to Silver Creek, uh, new skilled nursing facilities to be owned and operated, purchased by the county, diagnostic imaging at O'Connor, hybrid operating room at VMC, New cath lab at BMC, demolishing of senior, uh, former city hall and patient access at Silver Creek. Now, as I mentioned, some of these have been funded partially, some have been funded completely. Um, the funding needs estimated were well over uh, 300 million. Um, and the minimum of projects that we can plan on doing is nothing more than about 200 million. So we have a deficit and that will be addressed during budget. Um, now to talk a little bit about funding sources. So I wanna start by first saying again, the CIP is not an allocation process, but obviously it's connected to the budget in the sense that the board needs to make decisions about what they will fund. And as I mentioned, the board has created an accumulated capital outlay fund that was designed for uh, depreciation and replacement. So that is some of the funding that is available for capital projects. Um, the other uh, funding that's available for capital projects is general fund, but there's very little of that available. And then as we talked about earlier in the day, um, the issue of debt service uh, for very large projects, usually uh, recommending um, um, lease revenue bonds. And since I, have an opportunity here, I just point out that most of the projects that are on the CIP, unless we did lease revenue bonds would not happen. Um, so this just goes through some of the funding that we're talking about because um, like I said, uh, our general fund is restricted in terms of growth. Our Cap, our general fund mostly is generated from property tax. Our property tax um, assess, assessments are at this point about 3% growth, uh, predicted 3% growth. Uh, we hope that it'll go higher, but um, for this fiscal year coming up, so from 22, 23, we expect that our general fund will be probably pretty stable, but after that it'll uh, be challenged. So this is the board policy about um, capital improvement projects and the pros uh, process. I won't read it. You'll see um, that 
that these are the priorities that um, have been established for evaluation. This is not in numeric order. You know, all of these priorities need to be considered. They're not, none outweighs the other, um, but it gives us an idea of what things are important. And this is how we look at it from our recommendation to the board every year about how to do funding for capital projects. If you'll pause just one minute, Jeff, anybody wishing to speak about this item in the public, please register electronically. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, this goes through um, things that are in works. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, um, <clears throat> we have here the jail and or the forensic unit, which is the psychiatric unit. Um, we have the master plan at BMC. We have many replacement buildings um, and many um, seismic upgrades that need to be done by 2030. So that will improve our functionality. <clears throat> On the amendments or um, addendums that you have in your packet, I haven't included them here, but there's two sheets of paper that have spreadsheets. One is so-called in-flight projects. One is future projects. The in-flight projects are the ones where there's been action by the board during budget to at least allocate some funding to those proposals. Uh, you'll notice that in most situations, um, there's uh, only partial funding that's been allocated. There's three columns at the end of the um, <clears throat> spreadsheet. One is uh, our anticipated costs, one is actual allocations, and one is unspent revenue from the actual allocations. Again, the anticipated costs are very rough. They change consistently. Uh, obviously, the allocations have already been made, so those are real and the unspent money from the allocation is also real. So there's in-flight projects and future projects, and most of the future projects will need funding allocations during budget. Um, so with that, um, we're looking for the board to receive this report, uh, give us any input that you think would be appropriate. Obviously, we'll be going through the recommended budget process this year and the capital budget recommendations will come along with that. Um, some things that are currently on the uh, proposals will be dropped off um, and we'll move in a typical standard manner of taking board input, getting the board to approve the CIP and the budget. So with that, we'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Smith. We've got a couple of supervisors that have their hands raised. We also have members of the public. Is it okay, Supervisors Lee and Ellenberg, if we hear from the public first, as is our practice? Supervisor Wasserman. Vice as President I, Ellenberg. As I let you know earlier, I may need to leave this meeting uh, early because it, it's running into the beginning of Yom Kippur. Uh, so if you don't mind, I see that there are a lot of speakers. If you don't mind, I would prefer to ask my comments now. And sure. then if I have to switch in transit to listen to the rest of the meeting on my phone, I won't need to be fumbling around with making comments from the phone. So okay. thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Smith, during the uh, special budget topic um, on the behavioral health system on uh, May 17th, and then again during the June budget hearings, the possibility of a capital uh, project prioritization discussion came up to consider um, the capital and operational impacts of behavioral health facilities, including subacute beds, and, and from Supervisor Lee in particular, a discussion about a deflection center beyond the 
current uh, reentry resource center. And in those meetings, you indicated an intent to bring back scopings for those projects in September to align with this mm -hmm. meeting. Can you share what the status is of those project plans? Yeah, because we um, had not been able to present this uh, presentation, those the reports back will be in um, probably the beginning of November, and we'll have a scoping um, that'll give you an idea of what we think might be able to be done and what uh, the costs might be. So that will be a uh, all right. My, in November. My understanding from the previous conversations was that it was going to come back at this meeting so that we would have that information, but I hear you and I will look forward to seeing that in November. Um, I, thank you for sharing the, the rating criteria. You referenced board policy 4.11, uh, the criteria by which administration re rates capital projects. With, with the attached file and information that we have, I'm concerned that the board and the public really don't have visibility into how those criteria were applied to each of the projects uh, on the list. And it's hard, and I don't think there's enough information here for the board to make really any thoughtful consideration of prioritization. Uh, how, how can you get us the information to explain how the list of projects reflects the criteria from, from policy 4.11? I'm looking at that tiny slide on the screen. I'm trying to get it bigger. <laughs> well, I, I have it in my packet. Is, is that yeah. showing a, um, a, a... I'm trying to show this actually okay. for the public, not... Right, thank you. ...for the board, but... Um, <clears throat> this is the in-flight project. So these are the projects which have already been partially or completely funded by the board. Um, and the we can go through them individually and um, give you an idea of what the uh, prioritization process was if uh, you want us to um, prevent present that in writing we can give you either an off agenda or a uh, return to the board with uh, more details but for the most part you can see that most of them are things that we pretty much have to do um, because of regulations or uh, imminent failure of the facility. So we have joint commission requirements, we've got backlog in uh, maintenance, we've got uh, seismic requirements, crime lab servers, um, alcove, uh, office improvements, sure. chillers, so we can go through that and give you that in detail if you'd like. And then um, let me see if I can pull up the uh, in-flight, I mean the uh, quote new projects. These are not uh, listed in any particular order in terms of you know most important to least important. These are projects that we're aware of that the board has either told us are important or we're suggesting are important and so they're not put in a specific order and um, some of the actions that have been taken by the board recently um, let us know that there are other things that they'd like to put higher on the list so um, I can't really uh, give you a prioritization process for these because they're listed just as things that we know we need to do. I, I hear that and I know I'm asking for something that's difficult, but it's so important to have transparency around this. And if the decisions are made by just a very few people, sort of the way we talked about debt this morning, and there's no um, sun shining on, on how the decisions are reached, I think that that's problematic. So um, for now, I think an off agenda report uh, would be fine, but I'd like us also to think about how we do more of this uh, publicly. 
I have just two more uh, items. I want to Can I interrupt one oh, thing. Sure, please. Um, you know, we're happy to bring this to FGOC to discuss it. Um, what we're trying to do from an administrative perspective is take input from the board at various meetings and try to um, prioritize based on what we're hearing. But certainly more input from the board would be certainly welcome. And, you know, the committee at FGOC would be happy to do that. For example, you know, the VMC master plan is listed here as 660 million projected cost. Um, I think there's a good question that the board might ask about whether that's a high priority or whether there's other things that are priorities. So we're happy to come to FGOC if you'd like. Indeed, thank you very much. Um, I, I think that would be helpful. Uh, the other just two items that I wanted to mention, uh, again, I'm going to request that we stop referring to the jail as a secure treatment facility. It's very confusing. Um, does that require a motion uh, to make it formal direction, uh, James? No, it doesn't require doesn't. a motion. We'll we'll change it to jail. Thank you very much. We're we're going to potentially be doing actual secure treatment facilities and, and we need to stop that. So thank you. Uh, and just, I have one other question, Dr. Smith, you mentioned that this input is for next year's budget cycle. Can you clarify if you meant 23-24 or 24-25? I mean, 22-23. Uh, so our current cycle. I'm sorry. What did they say? 23, 24. Okay. So it's 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 the next one. But what does that mean in terms of making changes that the board wants to prioritize prior to the next fiscal year? Well, um, <clears throat> the board, you know, certainly can prioritize anytime they want. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're asking for a formal process, which I would suggest probably should happen in FGOC. Um, we make recommendations during the budget cycle in May about what we're hearing from the board as priorities and basically what we um, feel is required, such as uh, maintenance that's critical and those kinds of things. So. Um, so let me be a little bit more specific then. We're, we've been talking about the urgency around mental and behavioral health facilities. Uh, and, and other than the children and adolescent psych um, hospital, which I do see on the list, there's nothing for behavioral health. We've got the, you've got this memo of, of, um, uh, of work that needs to be started regarding new facilities. How, how do those two fit together? Is that clear? Am I asking a clear question? Are you talking about IMDs, which we do have on the list? Um, we also have the forensic unit on the list. In terms of funding, <clears throat> what we'll recommend um, in mid-year, um, you'll notice that there was a allocation made for the new jail for last or for this current fiscal year. In the mid-year, we'll recommend removing that partially because some of that has already been spent, but some of it is unspent and put that recommendation into the forensic unit and IMDs and um, step down units and we're also looking at um behavioral i mean uh board and cares okay. so you'll see those change based on our input based on the input that the board gave us Got about it. the projects that they think are important so that'll all change in mid-year got it thank you so much dr smith i appreciate all the answers Thank you, and uh, thank you, Vice President Ellenbrook. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. 
Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, look at one uh, chart regarding the numbers on the estimated uh, forecast of general funds. Uh, I just want to make sure it's not a typo. Um, it's regarding a five-year forecast of funding sources on slide 13. Um, we've been estimating somewhere around 2 to 3% per year additional um, general fund money due to the property tax. So we, I see that 23, 24, we have 147. What's really strange to me is how that's only dropped to 112 for 24, 25. Is that a typo or is there a reason why you think there's a significant drop of close to what, 30% drop, which doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Dr. Smith. You're talking about um, slide number 11, is that correct? Uh, I, I, yeah, it could be 11 on mine is 13, but mine was printed uh, a couple of days ago, so it could have been old. But that's the one that has the fiscal year 23, 24, 24, 25, all the way to 27, 28. And on general fund estimate, it was 147 for 23, 24, but then dropped to 112 on 24, 25, with a very significant drop. I just want to see if there was a typo or there's a yeah. reason behind that. And through the board president and, and, and Dr. Smith, if I may uh, uh, help with this one. This is Greg Utoria, County Budget Director. Hi, Greg. Yes. Thank you. Hi there. Yes, uh, the numbers here are tied to the five-year fiscal forecast that we uh, prepared to present it in the recommended budget last spring. So for consistency for our five-year uh, planning, there is that relationship between what's being anticipated for the capital improvement program as well as what's anticipated in, in the five-year fiscal forecast for the general fund that was published in the recommended budget. So it's not a typo, it is the projected amount. In the out years past 2024, there is an anticipated growth in cost of operations uh, that is growing at a faster rate than our anticipated revenue. That's why you see less anticipated available in 2025, but again, this is, there's so many variables that come into the financial forecasting. Things are going to change radically over the next several years, but we do try to come up with the best estimate at the time of putting together the recommended budget and the capital improvement program to show that the overall plan is structurally balanced. I hope that helps explain the, the changes in the numbers. Yeah, I think uh, just repeating what Greg said, um, in a more uh, detailed manner. The um, every year we give the board during the budget a uh, projection from an outside um, specialist, UCLA. Um, their projection this year is that will be our income from property tax will be fairly good this particular fiscal year and next fiscal year, but then it drops off. Now, obviously, that's a projection it's based on the cost of housing and the turnover of housing and the economy and a presumption of inflation could easily be different, <clears throat> but <clears throat> we have to have something to project. And we know that um, our cost of operations is going up on a regular basis. We can project that pretty well because we most of our cost of operations is personnel and we know what the contract personnel contracts have said. So um, this is foreshadowing um, problems in 26, 27, and probably thereafter, um, which will not only affect the capital improvement process and construction, but which also will affect operations. Okay, thank you. So this is not just, uh, this is general fund of not just what the receipt of the, the property tax, but also subtracting the uh, operation costs. And in this case, you're expecting that the operation costs will go up significantly more. So therefore, this general fund remainder will be less. Yeah, this is not all of the general fund. This is just the general fund that we think will be available, you, mean, um, okay. you know, okay. for the public's interest. Even though our total budget is about eleven point five billion, only a little bit uh, under two billion is available as discretion for discretionary, but discretionary includes the 
DA's budget, the sheriff's budget, custody budget, probation budget, things that aren't really discretionary. So that leaves um, this amount as what we think would be available. Now, of course, the board could change that in the future. These are just projections. So I don't want anybody to think this is written in stone. Um, you know, board could change the priorities and put more money into construction than into operations. Although we think that's unlikely and unwise. Okay, uh, now I'll save my uh, remaining comments after the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeff, just a quick question for you and then we'll go, go to the public. Um, as far as the Civic Center master plan, the new public safety area across the street from us, redoing our building, the DA's building, et cetera. Um, where is that in all this? Well, um, it's in the future plans, but it's also something that I think the board um, probably should reconsider. Okay. Um, you know, as we talked about, I guess you were the only one who was there during this discussion of the Civic Center master plan. Yep. The entire plan is what, as it was developed is well over $2 billion of costs. We obviously can't do that. Um, yeah. So we had, the board had recommended at that point that we do it in pieces. Um, the first piece was um, dealing with the old city hall. Uh, the second piece was dealing with the new uh, public safety and justice center. EA over. But okay. Okay. we're not going to obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, we don't have the money to embark upon the entire plan. I understand that. I just thought overall, when you did that shopping list and you, you spoke about the supervisors, obviously future, obviously future supervisors prioritizing the list, I think the phase one, two, three, four from the Civic Center Master Plan should be on the list for whatever supervisors are on the board in order to prioritize the time. So when dollars do become available, they go towards whatever is the priority at the time by the majority of that board. So that, that's my suggestion. Because a lot of work went into that. All right, let's turn to the public. David, one minute each, please. All right, one moment, please, while we get the timer up. First speaker is Matthew Tinsley. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, President Wasserman, supervisors and staff. My name is Matthew Tinsley, and I am the director of the Strong Start Initiative at the Santa Clara County Office of Education. On behalf of the County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Mary Ann Dewan, I want to express our thanks for considering adding childcare facilities to the Capital Improvement Program Building childcare space is a smart investment in your own staff and benefits the whole community. Planning, licensing, and operating childcare facilities requires expert knowledge. At the SCCOE, we have substantial experience building, renovating, and licensing childcare space across the county. Over the past few years, the SCCOE has been happy to help as the administration has considered various approaches to childcare. We look forward to learning more about the county's plans for childcare facilities and to working in partnership towards our shared goal of ensuring that every child has access to high quality early learning and care. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Next speaker is Jen Meyer. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Jen Meyer. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart, a taxpayer and an SEIU 521 worker. I live downtown. Every single day I see someone in active mental health or substance abuse crisis. There's no same day detox in the county. As someone with addicts in my family, I know that immediate help when they seek it is how addicts become sober. Instead of prioritizing a new jail that will suck up 70% of the fiscally acceptable debt burden for our county, the county could prioritize providing housing and immediate expansion of current mental health facilities and new mental health facilities. The gaps between our need and our capacity needs to be met now. 
We have a county process to strengthen alternatives to incarceration that should be given a chance to work before assessing the urgency of a new jail. Our behavioral health crisis has crowded our jails. We need to treat it like the emergency it is. We need to treat it holistically. We need to prioritize capital projects in behavioral health and housing. And in the meantime, it's actually safer if folks await trial at home. There's tons of research that shows people who are kept in jail pretrial are more likely to commit crimes than those who aren't. Please address care for. Next speaker is Julia Mangione. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Julia, are you there? Hello. My name is Julia Mangione, and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice, Surge at Sacred Heart, Community Service, and a member of the Care First Coalition. As a student of urban development and the built environment, I've learned how widely and deeply felt the impacts of investments in capital projects can be. This is an incredible opportunity to demonstrate our priorities at the regional government level that will have a literal physical impact on our society for decades to come, or more simply put, to put our money where our mouth is. In January 2022, you voted unanimously to declare mental illness and substance abuse a public health crisis in our county. Prioritize projects that center behavioral health services, early childhood education as well, and that demonstrate our commitment to wellness as a county rather than investing in dehumanizing and punitive projects. I urge the board to put care first by prioritizing capital projects that address community needs in behavioral health and housing and by removing the jail or any locked facility from this list. Thank you. Next speaker is Victor Sin. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Victor Sin. I live in District 3 and I'm a volunteer chapter leader with the Santa Clara Valley Chapter of the ACLU of Northern California. On behalf of our chapter, I'm speaking today to urge you to remove the jail from this list and instead prioritize projects that address our community's behavioral health and housing needs. In January 2022, you voted unanimously to declare mental illness and substance abuse a public health crisis in our county. We should be focusing on these real needs in our community by prioritizing the social services and resources to address them. Put care first and prioritize behavioral health and housing. Thank you. Next speaker is Catherine Hedges. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Catherine Hedges. I'm a registered voter in District 2 and a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice. And um, I can't talk what the other speakers have said, uh, but I'll definitely reiterate that if we can only afford one billion in new debt for capital projects, using three quarters of that for the jail while leaving out behavioral health that we know is a crisis and housing that we know is a crisis and we don't have measure A funding to fall back on anymore, um, that is an absolute tragedy. Uh, we must prioritize behavioral health and other, you know, child education, adolescent psych, all of these things that can help keep people from getting into the carceral system in the first place. Um, so please drop the jail from the priorities and from the other projects. Thank you. Next speaker is Giovanna Ibarra. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Giovanna Ibarra, and I'm a student at San Jose State and a member of Stu Students Against Mass Incarceration, which is part of the Care First Jail Never Coalition. I'm speaking on um, item number 10 relating to the 10-year capital improvement program priorities, and I strongly urge the board to reject the capital improvement to build a new jail that's um, $747 million, which is actually $50 million um, more than the original jail that was proposed months ago. Um, I don't really understand why the cost of the new jail continues to rise, yet there's little to no information available to the public regarding this item. This issue is extremely important to me and many other members of the community because we have witnessed the effects of not prioritizing mental health and not giving individuals the help that they need. We need to prioritize projects that provide support for individuals that suffer, suffer from these illnesses and substance abuse instead of incarcerating them. Um, depopulation and non carceral treatment of mental health is a priority and not a building. Thing. Next speaker is Sandra Asher. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Sandra, are you there? Sandra? Uh, yes. Go Sorry. Ahead. <laughs> um, I am a voter in District 1, 
a member of the Safety for All Disability Justice Coalition and a member of SURGE. As a parent with, of a child with suicidal ideation and self-harm, I have felt firsthand the impact of the mental health crisis in our county. During this Suicide Awareness Month, I urge you to listen to the stories of those impacted directly by this crisis. After an hour and a half you just spent earlier today discussing item nine, I don't see how you could possibly prioritize anything other than all of the behavioral health projects in this county that you just mentioned. You need to finance fully these projects like the adolescent psychiatric facility, the additional standalone behavioral health facilities, et cetera. Please deprioritize the costly jail and invest in the real needs of the community that you were just discussing this morning. Put care first. Thank you. Next speaker is Sarah Tapia. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Sarah Tapia. I live in District 3 and I am a member of Students Against Mass Incarceration at SJSU, which is a part of the Care First Jail Never Coalition. Uh, I'd like to echo the fellow speakers and urge the board to reject item number 55, Secure Treatment Center. Um, this is budgeted at over 740, or $747 million um, it, to plan, design, and construct a new treatment jail. Um, as Supervising Ellenberg stated, the information available to the public about this new jail is unclear and inaccessible, and it does not inspire community confidence in the handling of the matter. Uh, this facility would take up a massive amount of, of the debt burden of our county, and by removing this unnecessary and expensive project, you'd free up a large portion of the budget that could be used towards non carceral treatment of mental health, substance abuse, and to provide much needed reentry services to those that have been incarcerated. The standalone mental health facility was previously proposed would be much more useful to the community than, than a new jail. Um, I would like the, to urge the board to remove this new jail facility from the list and instead put care first by prioritizing the mental health issues. Of Next speaker is Leslie Zeger. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Leslie, are you there? Hi, yeah, this is Leslie Zeger. I'm a D5 voter, member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart and the Care First Coalition. During item nine today, I heard Supervisor Lee ask the behavioral health staff to treat behavioral health as the emergency that it is. And then during item eight, we heard Jeff Smith's reluctance to even consider seeking voter approval for debt issuance. These two points show that the capital projects priorities as presented by county exec are all wrong. You need to treat the behavioral health emergency by prioritizing facilities at all points on the continuum of care and prioritizing quality and abundant housing and remove the 750, the now $750 million jail from this list while focusing on alternatives to incarceration and reducing the jail population. Thank you. Thank Next you, speaker is- David, yes. before you proceed, Dr. Smith, your hand is raised. Did you want to speak? I don't know if you want me to speak now or after the- which public whichever. comment is done. I just wanted to, I was told by my staff that I was unclear about possible revenue sources. So whatever. Okay, let's do it done. after the speakers then. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, David. Thank you. Next speaker is Tina Brown. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. This is Tina Brown and I am a system impacted family member with Debug and the Care First Jail Never Coalition. On item number 10, I urge the board to reject item number 55, the new jail as a priority. The county has already spent approximately 43 million on reno renovations in the jails since the findings of the Blue Ribbon Commission, the grand jury and the consent decree. The inhumane conditions still exist today because of the culture, continued mistreatment, lack of programming and medical care. These conditions will still exist in a new jail as it's the culture that is the issue, not the concrete. Renovating the jail is 6% of the listed cost to build a new shiny one. It is 94% cheaper to renovate. The county can continue to renovate and prioritize other items with what the community needs now, which is housing and mental health care. It can also apply more valuable time and resources in the efforts to continue- Thank you, Tina. Next speaker is Raj Jayadev. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Raj, are you there? Go ahead, Raj. 
This is Raj with Debug Care First. The budget prioritization criteria should be based on what addresses the pressing urgent needs of the community, housing, mental health, hospitals, not a jail. The CEO presentation of as, as to why they want this jail is based on a false premise that what is inhumane in our jails is somehow resolved by the architecture of the building rather than the actual abuse of culture and treatment of that occurs in those buildings. The jail has seen a 40% increase in use of force in the last two years. The county continues to be sued for their abuse, which also should be accounted for in the financial liability projections of the jail. Most recently, last month, this county settled with a civil suit amounting to over $2 million for illegally detaining hundreds of people during the height of COVID. The personal agenda of the CEO to build a jail, regardless of at what cost, human and financial, needs to be addressed by this board. You are legally mandated to renovate this jail, not to obligate and uh, not under no obligation to build a new one. I urge the county to prioritize and invest public dollars in projects that respond to the community instead of incarceration and generational debt. Next speaker is Catherine Ono. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Catherine Ono. I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart. I live in District 4. I don't have a great deal to add to what has already been said, but I do urge the board to put care first by prioritizing capital projects that meaningfully address community needs in behavioral health and housing and to remove the jail from the list. Next speaker is Sharice Domingo. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. My name is Sharice Domingo with Debug. First, um, what makes the jails inhumane is not the concrete, it's the culture of the jails. That's inhumane and no capital project can solve that. Secondly, it costs $50 million to renovate the jails to ADA standards and $747 million to build a new one. My sixth grader who is learning fractions reads that in two ways. One is that renovation costs 6% of the price to build a new jail and two, that the county can renovate the jails 15 times over and it'll equal to building one new jail. Thirdly, in light of agenda item eight, we ask you to pause the jail again before you saddle our future generations with a jail that is funded by lease revenue bonds, a process that is opaque and lacks oversight. Lastly, the needs of the community are urgent. We already have three jails that can be renovated to ADA standards and meet the consent decree obligations. What we need is more housing, mental health facilities, and community centers. What we build should fill the gaps of what our community needs. Thank you. Next speaker is Andrew Bigelow. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right, um, my name is Andrew Bigelow, uh, organized with SoCon Valley Debug. Um, just want to echo uh, what's already been said to take off the jail uh, from the prioritization of the budget. Um, you know, I remember it was like what feels like a year or two ago, um, first seeing the number that was proposed to, to build the new jail um, and thinking how close to a billion dollars that was. And uh, seeing it today and seeing it as, it, as this has progressed, this has gotten closer and closer to that. Um, to that billion dollar threshold. And I, I just, I uh, trying to just plead, uh, plead the folks that, uh, my dad is also very upset about this as well. Um, but I'm trying to plead with folks to, to, there's so many different ways that we can spend that money that's actually gonna help the folks that are inside and the families that are impacted by incarceration. I please beg with you to, uh, to, to please take it down and to reprioritize that money. Thank you. Next speaker is Lanny Ballard. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Lanny Ballard. I live in District 1. I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice. For months now, we've talked about the need for more mental health services and that jail is not where these services should be administered. On August 30th, Supervisor Lee stated that behavior health projects should have top priority. Then again, today he said, we should have a mindset that expedites these projects. I agree. And I urge the board to put care first. Please prioritize funding for a much needed behavior health facility over consideration for a new jail. Thanks. Next speaker is Rocio Molina. You have one minute to speak, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Rocio. I'm with Child Lines SV. I'm the Community Engagement Manager. Um, first, I'd like to commend Supervisor Ellenberg for her call for transparency 
that is one of our community values and we definitely want to encourage the board to consider um, to consider investing in community engagement resources around the planning for this capital investment. As many community members have expressed, there is not clear clarity on what the plans are for potential development at the jail or supportive mental health facilities. And so we'd love to encourage the board to consider engaging with the nonprofit community and community-based organizations in general to connect with the community and to begin a discourse to plan collaboratively for this major investment in community resources and mental health facilities for our community. Thank you. Next speaker is Cynthia Longs. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Cynthia Longs. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. I'm a district one registered voter, a system impacted family member, debug organizer, and a care first jail never coalition member. I urge the board to reject the building of a new jail. Months ago, the proposed amount was 689 million. Now it has increased more than $50 million. Why has this cost increased and it keeps increasing? And how are these projections made? There is minimum information available to the public on this item. A lot of question, questions need to be answered. Is this really the best way to spend our county dollars when renovation costs would only be five to six to 15 percent, which means that it would only cost 85 to 94 percent cheaper. It would be cheaper to renovate a new jail, renovate than to build a new jail. Excuse me. The priority of our county should be depopulation of our county jail and non health treatment, not building a new jail. Next speaker is Rita Giles. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, I'm Rita Giles, a resident of the County of Santa Clara and a member of Ben the Ark Jewish Action. We are members of the Care First Coalition and stand in support of Debug. This time of year during the Jewish High Holidays, we seek to make amends for our past wrongs and set priorities going forward. It's fitting that today on the eve of Yom Kippur, this board is holding its priority setting meeting. You've declared that mental illness and substance abuse disorders are a public health crisis in our county. I couldn't agree more as we struggle to find services to treat a member of my own family. The costliest of the administration's proposed capital improvement projects is <clears throat> almost $750 million for a new jail. This would preclude other needed community investments in housing, healthcare, and behavioral health and addiction recovery services. Please put- Next speaker is Melissa. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Melissa and I am a Santa Clara County resident, part of the Care First Jail Never coalition. I urge the board to reject item 55, um, which is the secure treatment center, which is a jail replacement of main jail north. Um, in the in flights document, which is budgeted at over 747 million to plan, design, and construct a new secure treatment jail. That's 50 million more than the original 689 million jail that was proposed months before. In addition, there is little to no information available to the public regarding this item. If details pertaining to this item cannot be prioritized, then why should it be prior prioritized as a capital improvement? What does replacement of main jail north mean? What are the demolition costs of main jail north? Where is the plan of housing everyone while it's being constructed? Where is a standalone mental health facility that supervisor Lee asked for? Why does this jail seem to rise? In Next speaker is Andrew Seigler. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Andrew Seigler, and I'm speaking in conjunction with Surge's Sacred Heart and the Care First Coalition. And speaking as somebody with a mental health disability and somebody who was once homeless for five years, the two crises that we really have in this county are a mental health crisis and a housing crisis. We don't have an out of control crime crisis where we need to have people put in jail. And to prioritize a $727 million jail is, is irresponsible, entirely irresponsible. 
We need to prioritize a mental health facility. We need to prioritize housing. And that's it. Thank you for your time. Have a great day. Next speaker is B'nai Vahar. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is B'nai Vahar. I'm a community organizer with Silicon Valley Debug. And I'm also part of the jail, Care First, Jail Never Coalition. Um, I'm here today to ask you not to prioritize the um, jail on this prioritization list. I don't know how many times the community has to say it to you guys. We said it through the blue ribbon. We said it through numerous emails. We keep saying it for over 10 years. Uh, we said it through so, so many ways through different organizations in the Bay Area, through Silicon Valley. Um, so I'm, I'm here today to ask you again, <laughs> and again, to um, not prioritize this, but depopulate instead. Um, there's ATIs that are available to depopulate and um, yeah, this is crazy, but yeah, no to this item. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much, David. Dr. Smith. So um, I was told by my staff that I was a little unclear about funding issues, so let me try to <clears throat> say it again. Um, as I said before, um, the CIP is not a budgetary document. It's planning document. The numbers that you see in there as yep. estimated costs are just gross estimations. They're not uh, fixed numbers. And <clears throat> there's no, you notice there's no revenue allocation mentioned in CIP. So revenues that can possibly be used for CIP include the general fund, which we generally recommend against unless it's a small amount for a small project. Um, the county currently has two general obligation bonds, which are used for construction which can only be used for the specific construction that was approved by the uh, ballot. And those are the uh, $950 million um, housing bond and the seismic improvements at BMC. <clears throat> Some other additional funding is typically available through grants and applications for pro special projects. So we're using some grant money from the state, for example, BCIP uh, for some of the cost of the inpatient facility, site facility on BMC campus. And intermittently, we do get other funding for affordable housing and other capital projects that come through grant programs. In terms of um, lease revenue bonds, um, the money as revenue does not exist until there's a decision to sell the bonds. And in order to sell the bonds, you have to have a specific project. So uh, for example, with what we talked about, before the board went in a different direction regarding the new jail. There is not $790 million of revenue anywhere to pay for that. Um, the revenue would only exist if we sold lease revenue bonds. And in that case, it would only be able to be used for facility construction. So as we, I mentioned to Supervisor Ellenberg, when we get to mid-year, we'll remove some of that um, suggested allocation and <clears throat> we'll also remove uh, projected revenue in order to deal with that because we won't have the projected revenue because we're not going to sell bonds. So I don't want people to get the impression that there are multiple pockets of money sitting around waiting to be spent. 
Um, there's not. Thank you. All right, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start uh, with some very specific questions relative to where you just left off, Dr. Smith, and then go back to the prioritization issues. Um, as it relates to the slide on the at the five-year forecast for funding sources, I just want to make sure I understand that the ACO, is that revenue that is part of our ending fund balance that gets rolled over so that you can handle the, um, the flight list? It's um, money that was contributed during the budget process with approval from the board to a specific fund for um, capital improvements and can be used for maintenance or new projects. It's not a huge amount of money. So typically we suggest it be used for maintenance, but um, it has to do with the fact that from a planning perspective, we were in previous years deficient in the sense that we didn't uh, appreciate um, the fact that our properties uh, become less and less useful and need more and more deferred maintenance. So that was a fund created in order to deal with that. And the board is that, typically is recommended, we typically recommend the board put $15 million a year into it, but it is discretionary money. It comes from the general fund. So there's no legal obligation to have it. We just think it's a good process. Is the primary source of that funding the ending fund balance, or is it is it some other source of funds as we vote on projects? It's just the general fund accumulation, so it includes the ending fund balance, yes. Thank you. And then I see Greg has his hand up. Yeah, I was just going to add to, uh, to that. I think we discussed it in the report as well. Each year we calculate from an accounting perspective, what's the value of the depreciation of all of our buildings as we use them up, so to speak. And that's what equals the roughly 90 million a year that gets set aside in the accumulated capital outlay. The concept is as you use up buildings, there should be some kind of ongoing funding that we can rely on for, for, for maintenance and major repairs to make up for that. So, but it is a part of our ongoing discretionary county general fund money that gets set aside equal to as we're using up buildings so there's a funding source for some replacement i see so is the is the ending fund balance an additional source that's correct got it okay that makes sense and then um the, the and then just to go back to the general fund line item here that money is that money money that we anticipate being able to be used for debt service well, the general fund discretionary dollars could be used for either debt service or could be used for pay as you go. And for the most part, we've historically done pay as you go for smaller projects, you know, things that it cost less than a hundred million, uh, for example. And and we look at debt financing, things that cost in the hundreds of millions just because of the the share magnitude and difficulty to pay cash for something that costs hundreds of millions. And so um, this money would be money in addition to money that is already being anticipated to be used for debt service. Is that accurate? That's correct. And is is the is what's inclusive in here? Um, if I'm looking at the list you included in the packet, um, and I'm using there are two lists. I know one was an anticipated list, and the other. Uh, one was future projects and the other is in-flight projects. So I'm presuming that the, the line item that you have here is in addition to the in-flight projects and would be referring to attachment B in terms of what was available for attachment B. Yeah, I'm not sure if I follow that. What I mean is that um, if I'm looking at this general fund line, and maybe this is yeah, this general fund line, is that general fund line available for the items on attachment B? Or is it inclusive? Are you, is that money something that would need to be shared with attachment A? Got it. Yeah, the, 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 the connection is for attachment B. 
and attachment A. So attachment A includes the things that are in flight that need some additional funding. And then attachment B are things that are, are, are not current projects, but are anticipated. So this is a funding source for both. So it's it's very, very constrained. Sure. Yeah, there's there's a limitation of how much county general fund or accumulated capital outlay that can be put towards projects. Yes, I view that as constrained. Very constrained. I mean, the reason I'm using the term very constrained is that if we were looking at a project uh, that is, I guess when I, I would be looking at some um, opportunities that I see that are really perhaps very important. And let's say we wanted to use 500 million for an additional mental health facility. And I, my guess is that we would be using um, a lease revenue bond for that process that, you know, because of its cost overall, that the debt service for a project like that would be how much annually approximately? It'd be in the tens of millions, uh, probably at the lower end of that tens of millions, uh, uh, depending on scale. 30. Yeah, uh, potentially like uh, that somewhere magnitude. Somewhere around 20 million. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, this illustrates my concern about um, geo bonds. We could certainly go out for a geo bond for a new forensic psych unit, but, um, you know, the likelihood that it would pass, I think, is slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, just so I can say this out loud to everybody, I, I think I've worked on almost all of our campaigns since 2008. So I I'm, I'm appreciate that. The reason I'm asking the question is that if, if, the, if the general fund is as constrained as it appears here, then 20 or 30 million, even for one facility, plus taking the, the, the other facility, the adult and child psychiatric facility, item 71, that you start to bring down the available resources pretty quickly um, as you start to build and look at at, um, at debt service for those, those two mental health projects, that that would already put you in the $50 million range. Maybe, 20, maybe, maybe 40, but I, my guess is it's closer to 50. Well, there is a limitation in what we were trying to explain in the document, which uh, obviously didn't get across too well, is that um, we don't even have uh, sufficient projected funding to do all of our deferred maintenance. And therefore, we certainly have risk with regard to capital projects and um, that will mean challenging decisions during budget for the board about which projects they want to um, fund and which ones they don't want to fund. That's, I guess I'm saying the same thing that you're saying. Yeah, you are, Jeff. I, but I understand the point you're raising, which is just that I think um, you know my my request and my recommendation would be that the board have an opportunity. Um, to both see the prioritization of the in-flight projects and the emerging projects, because I, what I, my belief is that that there are some of these projects that the board may be more interested in moving up than others. I mean, that's actually one issue. And then the other issue is relative to um, the opportunity for source of funds, depending on the kind of project it is, is part of what I'm looking at as well. And then, um, and then one other issue I just want to add is that if we looked at the um, the adult and child psychiatric facility and just one additional facility, and I think you know, if I'm looking at this right, that's a yeah, that's a a six hundred million dollar project, and just based on its size, I'm assuming that. And the number of people it serves that we would be looking at something similar for um, a mental health, you know, more dedicated behavioral health facility. And so to me, that that really gobbles up quite a lot. And I'm looking just at the hospital needs. And I know, Dr. Smith, we haven't yet seen the master plan for the hospital, but 
from my perspective, I, I would, for one, would like to see the board um, in the December timeframe being able to rank the projects in an open session so we can say, here's where we think we're going to be. Af after Dr. Smith, I was very interested in getting the, um, the healthcare master plan because I thought that might be instructive in terms of what, um, what we would want to prioritize. And then I just want to add one other thing for my colleagues is that um, in addition to what we would be paying in debt service and what we would be prioritizing, we have some projects that, um, you know, that, that, you know, like I think seismic retrofitting is one example. I, I know Dr. Smith that the purchase of the other two hospitals both had an opportunity for us, an opportunity to, um, you know, use resources in, a, in what I thought was a very smart way from the staff, but also recognizing that with more accumulation of these buildings, much more responsibility relative to maintenance. And when we look specifically at the hospital, there are some projects there that are incredibly expensive and very, very necessary that are gonna have to be prioritized. And then the last thing I just wanna add, because it's been on my mind is, you're right that as we're owning more buildings, the maintenance strategy for those buildings is, is I, from my perspective, and I would say this um, to our chair, Supervisor Wasserman, that the discussion about um, leasing versus owning and then responsibility, like in terms of full cost, is something that we, we really not had a robust discussion about. And, I've, and I'll just say my preference is always that we own instead of lease, but as we're making those transitions from what we're leasing now into buildings that we own, you know, better understanding the opportunities of resources we're gonna save and then what that will cost us in the short run and then the long run, I think are also just very important for the board to understand so that as we move forward, we can really uh, prioritize. I, I will just say openly that, you know, my, my, my priorities are already really focused on the completion of the adolescent psychiatric facility and then us being able to expand um, the resources we need for mental health, as we discussed earlier today, uh, to me, those are kind of job one and job two. And then we had been, um, and then I'm, I'm mindful that we have these hospitals that we have to fully resource in order to be able to um, serve folks and to be able to draw down the revenue we're going to need to keep those the, that healthcare system very healthy. Um, so I'd be interested in a discussion in December around what are we prioritizing and then what are the opportunity costs for each of those decisions? Thank you. Yes. Um, can I respond a little bit? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're certainly happy to do that. And that's why I was suggesting possibly an ongoing um, communication with FGOC. Um, <laughs> in terms of the future projects, as I mentioned, we didn't prioritize them as one through 20. We just said those are future projects. So the numbering probably is misleading. It's just, it's not intended to mean those are the highest priority issues. Um, what we try to do administratively is take direction from the majority of the board in terms of what they think is highest need and also based on what we legally have to do. Um, so if certainly if the board thinks that we're not getting the message correctly, I'm happy to have more discussion in December or at every FGOC or wherever you think it would be best to have because we do have limitations. And since some of this um, affects the general fund, it also affects operations. So happy to have more discussion about it. I think that's actually the point um, through the chair that I, I'm most mindful of is that, um, you know, and again, I, I, I would really like us to wean ourselves off of leases and then be able to prioritize, um, you know, the development of certain projects. And one thing, um, Supervisor Wasserman, that I'll just mention, because I, I think you have more experience than any of us relative to property management and all that, um, that when, you know, with some of the ways that we're funded at a, a state and federal level, we're only allowed to use um, subventions for rent instead of mortgage, which yeah. I think is just bananas. But that, um, you know, knowing where we have flexibility in terms of even that issue and whether or not there are different um, 
economic um, um, tools or structures we can use is something I'd really like us to explore because I have to believe that somebody across the country figured that out because it's such a silly use of public money, truly. Um, so in any case, I, I just, again, will close up by saying, you know, my priorities are finishing the, the children, um, children and adult psychiatric ward and then being able to invest in the expansion we talked about earlier today because what I don't want is someone to come back and say, we'd like to expand the following services, but we can't because we've already invested all that money in something else. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sir Brad Chavez. And I think the whole discussion about leasing versus buying is a very interesting one for several reasons. One, to your point, where there are dollars available to pay rent and not necessarily dollars available to rent. That's number one. Number two, in the private sector, you buy a building because the biggest write-off, for two reasons, the biggest write-off is depreciation. It's an expense that doesn't actually cost money. And we at the county do not get to deduct depreciation from our income because there is no taxes involved at all. That's number one. That's a reason for the county to lease, not to buy. The other reason is that I can't even name the first place that I can think of that the county sold a property. In the private sector, you buy a piece of property, you deduct your expenses, you report your income, and you depreciate your building. And when you sell it, you get to take advantage of capital gains tax, which is a lower tax rate, and you buy something else and you can even defer your gain. With the county, we have money available for renting, number one. Number two, we don't depreciate. And number three, we hardly ever sell. So even if the building we buy quadruples in value, we don't take advantage of that unless we sell. So it's a very, very, very interesting discussion and there is no absolute answer. Right, and if I could just follow up on the point you're raising, I think the other thing that we have to remember is that by owning our own property, it gives us some freedom and flexibility that we wouldn't have and some protection against you know, rising uh, rents. But the other is that it's an opportunity for us to borrow against something that we own in order to be able to um, leverage what we need to build out. And so I, I think you're right, um, Supervisor Wasserman, that it's really worth having a more robust discussion. I've always been very opposed to a selling property because what, I, what annoys me is then when we have to buy it later at triple the cost because we gave up a piece of property. Yep. So- And I'm, I, I agree with you, I'm not proposing selling anything and this is a different discussion, but with the private sector, and no tax deduction benefit like depreciation. Yeah. It's yeah. all together different. And often rent and whatever mortgage payment we're making can be similar. And we often buy buildings as a shell and do improvements to our design. So there's, there's also the flexibility of if you're a tenant after 20 years and the building's old and the roof needs to be replaced and the HVAC, you say, no, thank you. And you move across the street to a new, a new building. And we so rarely do that. Correct. That's been part of the challenge. But I hear what you're saying. I and I think it's great, a great discussion for for but there is no, and there is no perfect answer. Right. And, and Greg could confirm that because there, there's way too many variables. Um, anyway, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, so looking at the chart, I just wanted to clarify, uh, as Dr. Smith has mentioned, those numbers under the attachment A on in-flight project, there is no specific priority. Basically, all of them are, are at this point, is not yet prioritized. Uh, and and this will be based on how soon they could get it done. So I, I don't know if we're going to come back and have some type of a discussion on priority in the future uh, on these, because obviously not everything can be done at the same time. But as much as this has been voted on, I just wanted to clarify uh, what that means um, in terms of prioritization. What what we tried to do is put on the list the projects that we understand the board has great interest in. We um, did not um, and put them in priority order because um, we'll rely upon the board to tell us that. And the way that that typically happens is during the budget where we make a suggestion um, and the board has the opportunity to change that rec uh, recommendation or not. 
our recommendations tend to be based on what we're hearing from the board and what we think we can financially do. Um, so more input from the board would be certainly welcome. Um, and I guess I'm, that's about it. <laughs> sure. Okay, so um, I'll just give a couple of comments regarding different issues. Uh, first of all, I just want to start with the, the seismic upgrade, in this case uh, specifically, the BMC seismic upgrade. That's something that I certainly am, am very concerned about with the health and hospital being our number one priority of our mission as a county. Uh, we certainly want to make sure that our facility is safe. Uh, and of course, we don't know it's a matter of if, a matter of, uh, it's a matter of when, not a matter of if that the next big one would come. So certainly, I think that is uh, clearly one of the highest priority. Um, and as I've uh, discussed uh, with you, have heard today uh, many times along with Supervisor Ellenberg, uh, that mental illness and substance use disorders are a public health crisis, and that really needs to be done without delay. And therefore, under no item 90 on the standalone mental health facility, to me, is of utmost importance, should be of the, one of the highest priorities. Um, this was voted upon in January, something new and reimagined. I really do want to have us focus on the locations with like vast open spaces that allow residents to have some open space to walk around, spend time outside uh, alone or with families, uh, and be given the space to really focus on themselves and the mental health. We need to make sure that our plans for various programs and treatments and, that, and methodologies that really provide a holistic approach to care and approach to support the treatment. And I want the board to also imagine how impactful this could be if we really work together on projects and plans to combat the mental health crisis in our county this way. The community has been asking us for this, uh, this behavior and mental health services and projects to be prioritized, and certainly I agree. In regards to some of the items on the, um, uh, the jail improvement that is uh, currently happening in order to meet some of the criteria of the consent decree, I would actually like to ask for an off agenda report regarding these improvements um, and updates uh, in order to get answers on what we have done to date uh, to meet what's needed and what is still not going to be done uh, due to the fact that we're not uh, yet haven't built the replacement facility. And so, so what are the things that we are, we understand that we are not in compliance until the replacement jail would be re, be done. Um, certainly some type of breakdown of how the money is spent would be very helpful. And do you think this is something that could come back to us in about three months, Dr. Smith? Dr. Smith. Sure, we can do that. I can give you a heads up about it right now, but we'll okay. give you more detail. Great. Um, there was a misunderstanding that expressed during the public comment that the uh, renovations that we had on the on the project list were sufficient or it could be multiplied in and replay and substitute for replacing the jail that's not true we've only basically done the bare minimum of physical changes in the jail that were required by the consent decree and that essentially is just uh, ada compliance and um, some uh, suicide prevention but as part of the one of the consent decrees we committed to build a new jail uh, with a number of other improvements that are required to be constitutional and in order to do the other comply with the other consent decree which is dealing with operations we cannot comply with those unless we have a new facility. Um, so we'll be happy to give you all of those details and go through it. But um, it's not true that um, it's cheaper to renovate a jail than rebuild another one. It's much more expensive. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the fact that we don't have any revenue to pay for it because you can't use lease revenue bonds to pay for renovation. And on item number um, uh, 6162, uh, we've discussed this at the latest uh, Health and Hospital Committee meeting uh, relating to the BASCOM diagnostic imaging equipment. I just want to uh, remind our administration to meet with the SEIU to discuss the diagnostic imaging equipment needs at the VMC. 
and also report back to us at the November HXC meeting. And that will be uh, all my comments. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. We've heard from the public. We've heard from supervisors. I don't believe there's anything more on this item. And without objection, we will move to item number 12, which is to approve the referral to administration to report to the board with options for consideration relating to support for emergency relief efforts in Puerto Rico. Supervisor um, Lee. Mike, may I just ask, I'm sorry to go back on this issue. Do we need to get take any action based on the request we made for this to come back in December and the request that Otto made or no? I'm happy to. No, I'm just asking. I just want to make sure. out with a vote. Do you, do you need, do we need that, James? You don't need to take any action. This was okay. receive report and yep. uh, hear input from the board. So our input is we're coming back in December and um, I think we're coming back every month to FGOC to make sure that the committee is aware of projects that are pending. Got it. Yeah. And we'll do the prioritization in December. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Let me see here. I got a text message from Supervisor Ellenberg saying, what button do I hit to raise my hand? I want to vote on Otto's motion. Dave, any idea? Supervisor Ellenberg's on her phone. Uh, if she is in the room, we can ask her to, if we can ask her to raise her hand, we can try promoting her if she's on the attendee list. Raise your hand and David will promote you. And this is, she, is gonna... She's calling in on her phone, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Supervisor, I've been watching for her and yep. I don't have her name, nor do I have the last three of her phone number, which I was able to get from um, Tiffany. Um, I am, I will continue to watch for her. Okay. You can relay her vote just verbally. You're in contact with her. Then I will, I will do that. It's to add on, to go on to um, Supervisor Lee's motion. I'm sure on this so. item. Anywhere. All right, Supervisor Lee, please start talking. Sure. Thank you, President Wasserman. Um, item 12 is asking the administration to report to the board for options considering relating to supporting emergency relief efforts in Puerto Rico. And as you're all aware, Hurricane Fiona has caused a lot of damage to those living in Puerto Rico, similar to what we have seen in Hurricane Ian wrecking havoc in Florida, South Carolina. The entire island lost power for many hours. And even now, many people are still without access to power and clean water. And what this effectively means is that many businesses, including grocery stores, gas stations are temporarily closed and hundreds of schools are prevented from being open. Furthermore, medical clinics and dialysis centers are still operating on generators. Puerto Rico can really use a lot of help right now. Back in 2017, when Hurricane Maria struck and devastated the living conditions in Puerto Rico, this board took action led by Remember Supervisor Ken Yeager by donating funds to assist with disaster relief efforts. Fiona has brought even more damages caused by Maria and the need is still very urgent. So the ask we have today is simple. I'm asking for your support so that um, we'll mirror what we've done in 2017 and have Dr. Smith identify a government entity or qualified 501c3 nonprofit organization that can assist in aiding those devastated by Hurricane Fiona. All right, so that is our motion. Do I have a second? I think that's what Susan was seconding. Uh, if not, I will. She just said she wanted to vote for it. Okay, then I'll second it. Um, Supervisor, okay. can you please um, verify if she currently has her hand raised with a phone number? I just told her that since I'm in contact with her via text, we can register her I vote. And she said, thank you, I'm an I. Okay. So we're, we're good on that. James Williams, please. Yeah, and unfortunately, um, we you can't. can't vote by proxy. So uh, regrettably. Okay, I'll tell her that. Have, yeah, unfortunately, says, we do need to have her understood. in the meeting. Understood. So Rhonda, she says she doesn't know how to raise her hand. Hmm. She, she's hearing everything. Um, tell, um, ask her if her... If her phone number ends in 073. Does your, 
I'll, I'll see if she hears everything. Does your phone number end in zero? She says yes. I, okay, so that was not the number that I got. Um, okay, do you, you see. R9. Um, yes. Okay, hold on, I'm working on this. We are gonna find you right now, Susan, Vice President Ellenberg. All right, any additional comments on this while we're waiting to connect? I just I just have a couple. I'm, I'm going to be supporting it. Um, I did note that many of the of the reasons, you know, like they're in, they don't they don't have electricity, they don't have food, they don't have water, they don't have shelter, right. clothing, that so, kind of stuff. Those are all things that our homeless people in Santa Clara County don't have either. And I know the Puerto Rican people affected are all U.S. citizens, and I am supporting the motion. I just want to uh, put out there that. Many of what they're much of what they're experiencing, our homeless people in Santa Clara County experience every day and night. Rhonda, did you get her? Um, yes, I unfortunately can't get her into the room, but I was able to unmute her and I've changed her name. So um, yes, she should be able to speak to you now. Okay, Vice President Thank Ellenberg. You. Go ahead. I am and very say hi. I, hi. All right. Hi. We've got a motion and a second. And oh, wait, wait one second, uh, Vice President Ellenberg. David, roll call vote, please. Uh, pardon me, Mr. President. We do have members of the public with their hands raised. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Hang on if you can. Uh, let's hear from the members of the public, please. All right. One moment, please, while we get the timer up. The next speaker is Catherine Ramos. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Catherine Ramos. I am the Vice President of the Puerto Rican Civic Club of San Jose, California. I would like to share why the Puerto Rican Civic Club should represent Santa Clara County's donation to the Puerto Rican people. During Hurricane Maria, we assisted approximately 200,000 families with the collaboration of the Ricky, Mountain, Ricky Martin Foundation and other reputable nonprofit organizations in Puerto Rico. We have worked diligently for the last five years preparing and connecting with key nonprofit organizations on the island so that should another hurricane devastate the island like Hurricane Fiona did this last few weeks, we would be prepared to spring into action. The Puerto Rican Civic Club can be trusted to carry out this mission of love for Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, city officials, and the residents of Santa Clara County. I would like to thank the Board of Supervisors for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is a phone caller ending in 496. I'm unmuting you. You have two minutes to speak. Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Angela Torado. I'm the voice of San Jose, the community liaison for the Puerto Rican Civic Club of San Jose, and an active registered voter of District 3. I'd like to recommend the Puerto Rican Civic Club of San Jose to be considered for the funding. The Puerto Rican Civic Club can provide immediate and direct relief aid to Puerto Rico and has a proven track record and establish relationships with both Puerto Rico and Santa Clara County. Every single penny received from the county will be used to purchase goods needed, especially generators and solar products. The Puerto Rican Civic Club members are personally involved in purchasing and distribution. The Puerto Rican Club is already a county vendor, which expedites the funding process. Thank you for your time and consideration today as we continue to serve the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you, Angela. Next speaker is Tita Acevedo. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead.
Tina, are you there? You're I'm here. Unable, so, but we are unable to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Maria Acevedo. I'm the president of the Puerto Rican Civic Club of San Jose, California, and a voter of District 4. I would like to share your, uh, with you our plan of action in hope that we consider our nonprofit organization for this funding. We now work with nonprofit organizations forming a coalition that has been proven to be effective in aiding and assisting during these weather disasters. Our connections are endless and our determination even stronger today. Our work already started since day one and your funding will help us continue our good work. We have mastered the logistics and effectively mapped our areas in need of, uh, in need of immediate help. There has been no power for 17 days now. Problem, solution, and execute. That's our motto. We love our country, the Puerto Rican people, American citizens. They serve the opportunity to rebuild their homes and get back on their feet. Choose us because we know the needs of our island. We can get the help directly to the hands of the Puerto Rican people. We are Puerto Rico. Gracias, especially to the Supervisor Otto Lee for introducing this referral for relief disaster fund and the support of the Cindy Chavez office. Thank you all for your consideration. Y que viva Puerto Rico. And that concludes our speakers. All righty, and we have Vice President Ellenberg on the phone. So let's, oh, Dr. Smith, your hand is, oh, Supervisor Smithian first, then Dr. Smith. I just wanted, uh, forgive me, there was a little con confusion with the uh, phone challenges there when the motion was actually being made. I wonder if, Supervisor Lee could repeat uh, verbatim his very brief motion. I want to um, make sure that it. Uh, I understand that it either is or isn't identical to the recommended action in uh, our published agenda. Yes, uh, it's the the as as as, as uh, shown in the published agenda, approving referral to administration to report to the board of options for consideration relating to support for emergency relief in Puerto Rico. Uh, and, and we are looking at uh, potentially a something like a hundred thousand dollar one-time cost from the general fund contingency reserve. Thank you very much. I have the clarity I need. Thank you. All right, Dr. Smith. I think I need a little bit more clarity. Let's do um, this. Is the hundred thousand to go to the Puerto Rican Club? Yeah. The the. Motion I have actually basically is a fund to be first for the purpose of disaster relief to a qualified 51c3 nonprofit organization or government entity as determined by the county exec. So I'm throwing it back at you to uh, decide uh, what makes the most sense. Thank you. Dr. Smith. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's we just spent about 20 minutes on this to give direction. And now it is for Dr. Smith to determine the organization, Supervisor Lee. That's that's your referral. Yep, that's referral. Yes. Okay. Call the question, please. Yes, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Smidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right, and we got you, Vice President. Okay, that was item 12, County Executive Report, item 13. I think I've talked enough today, I'll pass. Thank you. James, County Council Report. There were no reportable actions at the County Council meeting of October 3rd, 2022, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Item 15 is to receive a special study of the County of Santa Clara management of COVID-19 relief funds from the Management Audit Division and provide direction regarding recommendations. Cheryl, I'm looking, you're there, you, there you are. Ms. Solov, take it away. Thank you. Um, for the record, I'm Cheryl Solov with the Board's Management Audit Division. And I have with me today, Amanda Guma, who's a senior manager um, in, in our office um, and she is going to present on this study. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm going to try to share my screen now. Okay. 
Uh, good afternoon, supervisors. Uh, my name is Amanda Guma. I'm with the Management Audit Division here to present now on our special study of the county's management of COVID related relief funds. The study was completed in May 2022. Its purpose was to examine how effectively pandemic related funds were being managed and maximized by the county in an effort to identify opportunities to improve disaster cost recovery practices. Um, to provide some context on the financial impact of COVID-19, and I will note that um, these figures are dated at this point, um, but as of January 3rd, 2022, the county's costs for the COVID response were over $825 million. Around that time, the county's revenues received for COVID-related expenses were uh, roughly $625 million. And the county executive estimated in February of 2022 that by the end of the fiscal year, um, the total cost would be um, about $1.3 billion. The study resulted in six finding areas with 20 recommendations, um, 10 of which were directed to the controller treasurer, two directed to the county executive, and three to the director of the Office of Emergency Management. The first section of our um, report focused on strategic management. Um, we found that while the appropriate roles and functions had been activated, given the magnitude and duration of this particular disaster, the existing response structure was stressed. The county had not adapted its organizational structure adequately, and there were no um, full-time senior disaster cost recovery subject matter experts on staff. As a result, result, the county was relying heavily on advisory services provided by a consultant. Our key recommendation in this section was to the county executive to request authorization for a full-time cost recovery grants manager. Our, the second section of our study um, looked at the use of advisors as noted on the prior slide, um, the county contracts out for disaster cost recovery advisory services. Um, this co consulting agreement has um, a very expansive scope of work, but really in practice, the services um, provided by the consultant have primarily focused on the FEMA public assistance claims process. Um, we found that while the contract's scope of work was highly detailed. Um, there was really a lack of meaningful corresponding performance metrics. And instead, in the contract, there were set forth very general milestones for the consultant to meet. Given the magnitude of COVID-19 costs and the potential eligibility for reimbursement of those costs, we think it is critical that the county establish clear measures to hold the contractor accountable and to assess its performance. Um, our key recommendation in this section was to work with the consultant to establish an aggressive timeline for future, future FEMA claims submissions. The third section of our study looked at um, the need to expedite the claims process. We found that the county lagged behind its peers with regard to FEMA claims in both the timeliness of submissions and in the successful recovery of costs. For example, as of December 31st, 2021, Santa Clara had received $49 million um, in FEMA awards, whereas six other counties had received at least twice that amount by that time, with Los Angeles receiving um, over 200 million. And we also noted that Santa Clara received its first FEMA award in March of 2021, um, which obviously is a year after the pandemic had begun. We found that seven counties in California began receiving um, their awards as early as April, 2022. Given the uncertainty of the FEMA reimbursement process, um, which is noted often by county officials, um, and the reliance on additional discretionary general fund revenues to cover expenses. Um, 
we believe that it is critical for the county to establish a timeline for future FEMA claim submissions and to monitor the contractor's ability to meet these deadlines. Section four of our study looked at the county's communications and training related to disaster cost recovery. We generally found that the county had missed opportunities in its COVID response to better communicate and train staff. The county relied primarily on email uh, for communications with fiscal staff across departments on how to record and track COVID costs. Um, and these included timekeeping and payroll. Our analysis showed that months into the pandemic, departments were still struggling to properly record their time and the county hadn't created a, or established a central repository um, to maintain records of all of these communications um, and policies. Our recommendations in this section were to designate specific staff to manage communications and training and to develop a training program for all uh, fiscal staff across departments related to disaster cost recovery practices. Section five of our report um, looked at documentation inconsistencies. Um, in order to receive reimbursement from federal relief programs and in particular FEMA's public assistance program, the county must document and demonstrate how the funds were spent. Guidelines for these documentation requirements are generally set forth in the county's disaster cost recovery annex, which is part of the county's um, emergency operations plan. And this had last been updated in 2017. As we noted in the prior slide and in the prior section, we found the need in general for better communications and training of staff. We reviewed um, 109 um, sample transactions as part of our study and found various inconsistencies in documentation um, in how expenses were justified and how expenses were approved and in the maintenance of invoices. We recommended in this section that the county establish written policies um, detailing the documentation that departments must provide for disaster related expenses. A final section of our study uh, looked at information systems. Because the county relies on multiple data systems to track expenses, employee time, and vendor information, the compilation of COVID-19 cost information has been cumbersome and inefficient for county staff. We think that the county could look to other jurisdictions to see how their financial systems have been adapted to better track and compile disaster related costs. And we recommend that the controller treasurer work with TSS to assess current system capabilities and identify ways to streamline the tracking of disaster related costs. Um, that is a very brief summary of, of the report and our findings, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Amanda, for your uh, summary and for your 100 page report. Martha Wapensky, Deputy County Executive, I see your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, I was going to propose that, um, propose to the board that we go through this matrix style like we did earlier with item 10, if that would sure. help the discussion. Take my hand down. And you're reporting on behalf of administration? That's correct. It's a coordinated okay. response between uh, Office of Emergency Management and the Controller Treasurer's Office. Let me go ahead and do a screen share. And are you able to see something that looks like a matrix? Yes. Okay. Cheryl, does this work for you as well? Um, this style, we just did it in order. Sure. So if we go, 1.1 is where we partially agree um, I have both the assistant controller, Maria Oberg, on the line, as well as um, Office of Emergency Management Director, Dana Reed. For 1.1, you can see that we um, partially agree. We think a, a recovery manager 
would be a beneficial position. The re recommendation calls for you filling the position within six months because it's, there's no existing job classification for this. We would need to work with OBA and ESA to develop something. So what we're saying is uh, we agree and it might just take longer than six months. Got it. And Martha, if I may, what I don't see this in my my paperwork. What package page is this? My apologies, Supervisor. Uh, following the discussion under item 10, this was um, something we quickly pulled together to help the discussion along. I can certainly add it to the packet. Um, okay, okay. So we don't, we don't have a written copy of this in advance. Yeah, my apologies for that. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Please continue. So 1.2, you agree. So we can move on to 1.3 if you'd like. Sure. Sure. So as you can see there, um, the controller treasury department has existing cost recovery performance measures and looking at what well, I'm sorry, let me go back. What I want to emphasize here are the areas we, where we agree and partially agree with the departments, the involved departments have done a lot of work since the audit was published. And so in addition to the information you see here, um, you know, this is going back to that timeline that Amanda um, mentioned. And, you know, we agree a timeline is important and we can strive to set up one for the future. But in this case, given the length and complexity, um, it is difficult. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Okay. All right, I will turn to supervisors for any comments. This is to receive a report. I see Supervisor Lee. Go ahead, sir. You're muted. Yes, thank you. There um, you I, maybe I should uh, ask maybe if there's anybody in public would like to speak first and then if there's staff the public. No, comment. we don't have anyone in the public. Okay, great. Um, most of, first of all, I want to thank um, um, Ms. Wapinski for um, answering a lot of the questions that we posed through our staff earlier, uh, and many of the questions regarding how best we could get the money um, back, and then and one of which, of course, is that uh, even though it looks like we got a lot less than the other counties and much lower, but sounded like the reason is they use some expedited method that we are not willing to do because we would rather do it right and take the right time to do it. So therefore, the chances that some of the money that they receive might be fallback while the way we approach would be a little slower, but the chances that we will be able to keep uh, all the money that we were supposed to get back. Is that correct? You're exactly correct, Supervisor. Okay, all right. Now, uh, on item number 4.2, those are recommendations. So uh, I, I would like to first thank uh, Eric Gigantis uh, of uh, SBCN's uh, CEO for sending us uh, a detailed letter uh, to the board and, and, and regarding that recommendation. Uh, and I would like to ask the administration to implement the recommendation 4.2 as suggested by the Management Audit Division. As noted by Cadre in the letter to the board, might the county also develop a process for receiving volunteer hours, uh, work, uh, volunteer work hours work by those supporting community-based organizations um, as the value of those hours can significantly reduce the county's out-of-pocket obligation for FEMA public assistance project cost recovery so that they will be able to get more funds back. Is that, would that work? Yes, Supervisor, it's it's a process we use now, but we can certainly work with Cadre to, to shore that process up. Okay, great. Yeah, I think it's important to make sure that we are able to provide these type of information and make it easier for our nonprofits and and community-based organizations to to help get those costs of recovery, uh, and I think we, we we that's a service that our county really should be able to offer. So thank you, and that's all the questions I have. Thank you. I'm going to turn back to our management audit management audit manager Cheryl Sola. Just a mouthful. <laughs> I, I just wanted to to clarify uh, the. The county is using an expedited process, so it's not it's not different. 
Say that again. The county is using an expedited the process. The county is using an expedited process according to the finance agency director. Okay. Right. If, if I may, I go, I'm going to go ahead and direct that question to the assistant controller, Maria Oberg, um, in terms of the timing of the expedited projects, as well as our thinking around uh, the regular process. It is correct that there have been a couple of instances where we have used the expedited process, um, especially on the vaccination um, okay. projects. We did submit those. We got two of those turned around very quickly. Those were the two first ones we received. Um, but for most of them where it doesn't make sense to use the expedited process for whatever reason, um, contracts aren't readily available. It requires a bit more analysis from FEMA and calories. Then we go through the regular process. Understood. Thank you. All right. Do we have any other hands raised? Otherwise, Supervisor Lee, you made a motion, correct? Supervisor yes. Chavez. Yeah, actually, I, uh, I did not uh, lay out what my motion is. I'm sorry. Um, I was trying to make a motion to receive the report. And I would like to make the motion to request administration provide updates on progress of implementing recommendations from this special study during the regularly scheduled quarterly updates on COVID-19 spending and FEMA reimbursement. Okay, add this update during our regular COVID updates. Great. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. I'll second that, but my request would be that we receive Martha's materials because I, I would actually like to look at them um, and, and recommend that perhaps before this come back to the board um, for the next quarterly update that with Martha's recommendations that this go to FGOC so that we have a chance to review it before the next update. If I may clarify that direction, Supervisor, we do have quarterly reports going to FGOC now with everything related to COVID reimbursement, FEMA reimbursements and COVID spending. I would recommend attaching or adding, including the information there and so that it can go in a more comprehensive package from FGOC back to the board. I think that's a great idea. So it would, so really we would be forwarding this report with your, your um, framework and then we can decide if we want to make any um, recommendations to our colleagues after that it yeah. comes to the committee. Thank you. Yes. Good recommendation, Martha. Thank you. All right, we have a motion. We have a second. We've heard, uh, don't have any members of the public on this item. No other hands raised. David, roll call, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. I'm not sure if Vice President Ellenberg is still on the line. I don't believe she is. Okay. Yep, go right Thompson ahead. And President Wasserman. I as well, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, that was item 15. We handled 16, we came back from lunch. 17 was done on consent. David, that brings us to 18, do you agree? That is correct, sir. Thank you. The subject here is the Home Key Palo Alto and Home Key Branham Lane Challenge Grant Awards, which I believe came from Supervisor Simidian and Supervisor Lee previously. And I'm gonna to turn to Supervisor Simidian because he got his hand up first. Thank you. Uh, in light of the hour, I will uh, limit the celebratory remarks and just <laughs> say uh, move approval uh, as contained in our published agenda. If I can get a second from Supervisor Lee, thank I will thank you. I will say thank you again to him. I will also uh, ask as part of the motion with the consent of the seconder that we refer the um, the issue of this process to our uh, Housing Land Use Environment and Transportation Committee to talk about any potential criteria changes that might be helpful in, in bringing forward more projects. Uh, I'm, I'm Sounds really good to the chair. Delighted with what we got today, Mr. Chair, but um, I, I think, as I have said before, we need to do more and we need to do it faster. So that's my motion. Thank you. Got it. We have a motion, we have a second. Supervisor Lee, did you want to say anything more? Yeah, first I want to thank uh, Supervisor Simidian for uh, offering this important work. Uh, and also want to thank Consuelo and the team over the Office of Supportive Housing for the hard work on this matter and going through the definitely time consuming and complicated process of Home Key to finally get the funding after the second try. Ending homelessness, of course, is a paramount issue for us. And we have to continue to make this a major focus as people are dying in the streets and more people are becoming in house and we're able to keep them from getting help. Um, and you know, no one can solve this issue alone. 
and we certainly need collaborations across the board to bring housing solutions to our community. And we're very fortunate that these caring community partners step up and work together to open these facilities and provide the spaces that our neighbors can call home. And we hope this will serve as a model for many other cities to use this as a way to solve their um, uh, unhoused needs as well. Um, the, the, this is the first time our county, well, this this round of funding for Home Key Palo Alto and Home Key Brandon Lane would hope to inspire others. Uh, and then one thing I do want to mention is I, I do believe Brandon Lane is trying to do it so that it will be stackable, so it'll be more than one story. And now I'm hoping to also uh, look into whether or not encourage Palo Alto to also consider there's any way to increase the size because that right now looks like this uh, fair, uh, quite a bit smaller than Brandon Lane. So if they are willing to consider uh, potentially stacking up some of the units, I think we might be able to increase some of that. So I just wanted to add that as a potential um, recommendation for them to look into and you know, think big. And that's Thank all. You. Thank you. And before we vote, David, would you please allow our uh, speaker that's registered to speak? Certainly. One moment while we get the timer up. Thank you. Next speaker is Chantal Gaines. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you so much, President Wasserman and uh, Board of Supervisors. My name is Chantel Cotton Gaines. I'm the Deputy City Manager with the City of Palo Alto. On behalf of our Mayor and City Council, we just want to say thank you for the work that you're doing and your leadership and advocacy related to unhoused services in the county. Particularly for our Palo Alto Home Key site, we're so appreciative of this um, grant towards our operating expenses. And we provide a lot of appreciation and thank you to Consuelo and the Office of Supportive Housing for all the ways they're showing up to help us with our project. We do have a two story stacked project, just the numbers are still smaller, Supervisor Lee, but we will, we hear your recommendation and we will share that with our city council and our project team as well. And again, we just would like to emphasize that this project of Palo Alto Home Key really helps us to hold our end of um, our endorsement of the county's plan to end homelessness and really letting the city of Palo Alto show up in a way that we haven't been able to do before. So we are appreciative to both the county and the state for all of the grant funding. Thank you. Thank you, Chantal. That concludes our speakers. Thank you, David. Great job. And that's it, folks. David, roll call vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Smidian. You're muted, sir. Aye. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg is absent. President Wasserman. Yes, as well. And no items were pulled from consent. This meeting is adjourned at 4.56. Yes, yeah. Supervisor Wasserman. Yes, Mr. Williams. I am. Go ahead. I'll let James go first. Oh, I, I, I was going to just raise this. I think the same issue Supervisor Lee's raising, so I'll let him go ahead. Please. Okay. So first, I need to apologize, uh, President Wasserman. I forgot to defer item number 31, which is a $500 sponsorship for uh, back no cal and respectfully yes. move to reconsider item number seven, approval of consent calendar and changes uh, to the Board of Supervisors agenda uh, in order to uh, move to hold item number 31 uh, to approve the county sponsorship of the back no cal in amount of $500 from our supervisor district reallocation of the board um, to a date uncertain so they can reconcile their status with the California Secretary of State. And that's my motion. Thank you. And thank you, James. And thank you, Supervisor Lee. I have that on there. And I was a horse coming back to the barn. Second. All right, we've got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. No members of the public. David, roll call vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Simidian, you're muted, sir. Aye. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg is absent. President Wasterman. Aye. Thank you. And with that, I will adjourn this meeting at 4.58, which happens to be my birthday. All right. Let's <laughs> have a good evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Recording stopped. And with that, this meeting room will be closed. Thank you all for attending and have a great day. Good job, Brenda. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.